Empire of Serpents, Dragons of Isenthal, Book 3. Written by Richard Fierce and P. D. Mac. Chapter 1. The city of Haddens was a flurry of activity. Gwen watched merchants pitch their wares, from brightly colored silks to food that permeated the air with their scents. Small children ran along the streets playing a game and shouting at each other light-heartedly. It was almost enough to make her think that the impending darkness of Torian's madness was just a dream. Almost. Venia had landed outside the city, and Gwen had walked from there. Despite traveling by air, which had been a living nightmare for Gwen, it had still taken two days to reach the city. Venia had a voracious appetite, and continuously stopped to eat. She promised to be at the rebellion meeting, but Gwen wasn't sure how that would happen. Venia was massive, so unless the rebellion was meeting outside in a large, open field, it didn't seem possible. The more pressing issue was that Gwen didn't know where the meeting location was, and it wasn't like she could ask someone, could she? Good day, madam. Wear the finest clothing this side of the border. A merchant produced an armful of elegantly sewn dresses. I sew them myself. The man offered a grin that stretched his pockmarked face and revealed a mouthful of yellowed teeth. He was bald and slightly overweight, but his clothing was of high quality. Gwen smiled and politely shook her head. No thank you. You haven't seen a group of people that seem out of place, have you? I'm afraid not. The merchant winked. He tapped his waist where a bag hung from his belt. It clinked with coins. The man's intent was obvious and Gwen retrieved a coin from her purse and offered it to the merchant. He swept his hand over hers and the coin vanished, but Gwen hadn't felt his touch at all. Was he truly a merchant, or some sort of vagrant pickpocket? Go to the end of this street, and you'll see the butcher shop on the right. Beside it, there's an alley that'll take you to a door. Knock twice. Thank you. Gwen continued along the cobblestone street, but she could feel eyes watching her. A glance over her shoulder revealed the bald man was gone, replaced by an elderly woman. Gwen thought it was odd, but she followed the man's directions anyway. At the end of the street was the butcher's building, and Gwen found the alley. She stepped into the darkened space and walked twenty feet to reach the door. Gwen raised her hand to knock and heard shuffling behind her. Don't move. Gwen froze. Her heart skipped a beat. Who are you and what do you want? I'm here to see my friends. I need names, girl. Gwen considered lying, but decided not to. If this person was connected to the rebellion, and she used a fake name, it could keep her from getting into the meeting. His name is Eridor. Never heard of him. Perhaps I'm in the wrong place. I'm sorry, I'll just be on my way. You aren't going anywhere. Something sharp jabbed into Gwen's lower back, and she sucked in a breath. Please, shut your mouth. He applied pressure on the blade and Gwen flinched. Who sent you here? Torian. Grimar? I'll gut you like a fish you blasted spy. Gwen barely heard his words. She was focused on the pulse of magic flowing through the fire rune. Her right hand grew warm as the flames started to form. The door in front of her opened and a robed figure stepped into view. What's this? A spy. I was just about to show her what we do to spies. Gwen? At the sound of her name, Gwen cut off the magic and looked up to see Eridor. The elf was a welcome sight, and she rushed forward and wrapped him in a tight hug. Eridor's surprise quickly faded, and he patted her on the back, then pushed her at arm's length. Is everything all right? What are you doing here? He looked down the alley, then back at her. Where's Amel? It's a long story. Amel's a traitor. Come inside. Tell me everything. As for you, Eridor turned his eyes on the guard. You almost got burned to a crisp and didn't even know it. Next time check for runes. Yes sir. Gwen turned to look at the man and saw it was the merchant who'd given her directions. He tucked his dagger away and offered a bow to her. My apologies. Just doing my duty. Don't worry about it. Gwen stepped inside the building, and Eridor closed and latched the door. Speak as we walk. The leaders of the rebellion are about to convene. 
Gwen related the events at Alaval and Steepcross, leaving out nothing. She even showed Eridor her eyes and the dark rune lines that started at her collarbone. His expression was unreadable, but Gwen had the feeling that he wasn't happy about the dark magic. The two reached a small room guarded by a handful of warriors and a mage. When she finished talking, Eridor was silent for a long while. Where's the vial? Marjorie destroyed it. She said it was too dangerous to give it back to me. Eridor frowned. If what you say is true, Amal poses a great threat. She's been privy to many things within the rebellion. She also knows about me. What do you mean? She was in the room when Marjorie told me my true name. Amal knows I'm Cameron's daughter. I doubt she'll keep that information to herself. I think you're right. She's probably already reported to Torian. I wouldn't be surprised if Grimar himself comes looking for you. Come with me. The others need to know. The guards stepped aside to let allow them through. There were many people Gwen didn't recognize. A few familiar faces stood out, and she was relieved when she spotted Lyra. Roland was also present. He'd been there when Tobias had fallen during the fight at the outpost. Seeing him brought back a rush of memories. Emil had been there too. The feeling of betrayal stung Gwen's heart again, and she forced herself to swallow her anger. Emil would pay. Dearly. Eridor said, raising his voice to be heard over the scattered conversations. We've come together to devise our plans against Torian. The noise died down, and Eridor motioned to Gwen. These plans will be greatly affected by the news that we have a queen to lead us. This is Quinley, the daughter of King Cameron. All eyes went to Gwen. She wasn't used to being the center of attention, and she could feel her face flushing. Hold on. It was a dwarf. Gwen looked at him, glad for the distraction. It diverted everyone's attention from her. The dwarf had thick curly brown hair and a long beard. He folded his arms across his chest and glared at Eridor. We don't need a queen to lead us when we've got a king. He thumbed toward a man behind him. Gwen was drawn to the man for reasons she couldn't understand. He was handsome and fit, with thick auburn hair and intense brown eyes. Who are you? Name's Torgrith. And his name is Conor. He's the son of King Cameron and the heir to the throne. What proof do you have? We have proof from the Great Library that this is Quinley. Drustin spoke up. And we have proof of the naming runes that this is Darby, Cameron's only son. The others in the room began trying to talk over one another, until it was a mass shouting match. Gwen rubbed her temples. All the noise was going to give her a headache. Stop. Everyone just stop. The room went silent and Gwen sighed in relief. I don't want to lead us to war against Torian. I'm not a warrior, and I know nothing of battle. I will defer to Connell. And if Connell is Cameron's son, that means he's my brother. There is no need for division among family. Gwen looked at Connell and waited to see what he would say. She hoped he would agree to take the lead. If she were forced into it, she was afraid many people would die due to the mistakes she would make. Connell gazed at his sister. She was very pretty. Part of him wondered, had they met in different circumstances as strangers, whether anything would have happened between them. He shuddered at the thought and refocused. Yet here she was, both a stranger and a sister. He thought he should feel something, some sort of elation at the reuniting with family. But his family had been murdered, and what he felt now had nothing to do with family. I accept battle leadership. Though his words were full of confidence, his expression hinted that he had some doubts. Thank you. Brother. Gwen felt weird saying that. She'd been an only child her entire life. Yet now her long-lost brother was here, in the same room with her. It was difficult for her to fathom. What's the plan? Eridor looked at Connell. Torian has many prestiges at his command, but the Great Library's emissary has informed us that they will join our forces. With their prestiges on our side, we just might stand a chance against Torian. We also have a dragon on our side. A dragon? You didn't mention a dragon. Sorry. 
I wasn't sure how I should bring it up, but the dragon that brought me here promised her aid. Her name is Venia. We also have a dragon. We had two, but one was killed by dragon hunters. Do these dragons know each other? I'll have to ask her. She said she would be here for the meeting, but obviously she isn't here. Don't be so sure. Dragons can do many things, and that includes shapeshifting. Gwen looked at Lyra curiously. It's true. I've seen it myself. Are you? Venia. Gwen was being surprised at every turn. I am. Lyra was really Venia. Though you should use my elven name. My dragon name is personal and only given to those I trust. Gwen remembered asking the dragon for her name in Alaval, and Venia had given it to her. She was humbled by the trust that such a mighty creature had in her, and felt indebted somehow. With dragons on our side, we should easily be able to take Isentil back. Don't place too much hope in dragons. Yes, they are powerful, but very few remain, less than a dozen. And Torian has dragon hunters tracking them down. We've killed those hunters we found, but there's no telling how many more are on the prowl. Then it's probably a good idea to keep them split up, in case these hunters make it into our camp somehow. Do you have a plan? Connell slowly nodded. We need to keep Torian off balance. It seems to me that Gwen has the weight of magic on her side. I know nothing about magic. Therefore, I propose that we divide our efforts. Gwen and her forces attack from the east with all the magic you can employ. Force Torian to concentrate his efforts and attention to the east. My forces will wait until Torian is occupied with battling in the east, then we will attack from the west. I'll take Gwen to Alaval to meet up with Kirith and his forces. They're ready to march with us, he just needs to receive word before we arrive. That's easily done through magical means. I'll have a message sent to Kirith. That begs the question, of how do we coordinate our efforts once we are in position? We can't afford to wait for a messenger to get to us days after the fact. Eridor smiled. I have an answer for that as well. We have two mages that are connected magically by runes, but their bond is deeper than that. They're twins. Their sibling connection seems to have strengthened the power of the runes, and they can communicate with one another over longer distances than usual. One of them will travel with Gwen, and the other will travel with you. Connell smiled. Amazing things, these runes. That will work. What about the cities and towns along the way? The people there are innocent and shouldn't suffer because we're marching through. I've thought about that. Anyone willing to join us is more than welcome. We can use all the extra bodies we can get. Everyone else can stay put and stay safe and out of the way. Most importantly, we buy everything we need along the way, food, supplies, even the ale. We are reclaiming a kingdom, not punishing it. We want this to be as painless as possible. Gwen was beginning to like Connell even more. He seemed to be a man of good intentions, and she believed he would be a great leader in the aftermath of Torian's defeat. We can work out the minor details along the way. I think we should get moving. The quicker we are in position, the less time Torian has to prepare. Gwen could feel excitement stirring within her. She wasn't a warrior, but was ready to do what her people needed of her. Chapter 2 Ignoring the usual after-meeting conversations, Connell focused on Gwen. Crossing over to stand before her, the difference in height became glaring. He towered over her by at least two handspans, causing him to wonder how one set of parents could produce two children of such different sizes. Yet she was very pretty, her green eyes inquisitive as she returned his stare. So you're my sister? It would seem so. Where have you been? I grew up in Dosbury, right under Torian's nose. It's on the edge of Eisenthal. What did you do? My father owned an inn. She caught herself, remembering the man she had called her father. A lump formed in her throat, but she didn't cry. The tears didn't come as often as they did before. I served tables for him. An inn. Connell chuckled, slowly nodding. An interesting place to raise a king's daughter. 
Gwen smiled in return. What about you? Where did you grow up? Hervé, a coastal town in Tiermanic. My father was a jewelry merchant. Was? Connell's casual demeanor vanished. He's dead. My entire family is dead. Torian had them killed. Torian's men killed my father. And my friend. His name was Tobias. Eridor walked up, a man and a woman tagging along. I know you two have a lot to talk about, but unfortunately, we're running out of time. These are the mage twins I mentioned, Kaelin and Kaula. Connell suppressed a grin for the twins couldn't be more different. Kaelin was a handspan taller with dirty blonde hair and brown eyes. He wasn't handsome as far as eye-catching, but he wasn't unattractive either. Yet there was something about him that immediately put Connell off. The man exuded a not-so-subtle arrogance. His twin on the other hand was a very attractive buxom strawberry blonde with an hourglass figure, a little taller than Gwen. In contrast to Kaylin's smugness, Corla looked like she felt out of place, her emerald green eyes darting around the room, taking everything in. Connell silently prayed that Corla was his twin. One of them will, I'll go with her. He thrust a finger at Gwen, then nudged Corla towards Connell. You can have my sister. That's fine. Connell replied a little too quickly, hoping Gwen and Eridor thought he was covering Kaelin's crass behavior. You'd better get moving then. Eridor gave the oblivious Kaelin a look of irritation. Connell turned to Gwen. See you in Havenguard. Take care of yourself. You too. Her eyes locked onto his and she smiled at him. For an awkward moment, Connell felt he should do something demonstrable, like a hug or something, to show he recognized he had family again. But it would be like hugging a distant cousin he had met once growing up. He was about to give her the noncommittal hand wave, when she closed the gap between them and hesitantly hugged him. Watch yourself. Our uncle knows we're alive. She didn't need to say anything else, for Connell understood. Let me know where you're in position. I will. She released him. See you soon. You too. Connell was ready to move on. All the questions he wanted to ask would have to wait. He turned to Corla. Are you ready? Yes. He searched the room and found Torgrith and Galadir in conversation with Voldar and Lorcan, the elf with a bemused smile as he listened to Voldar relate some tale. Connell caught Torgrith's attention, and soon the group was out in the streets and headed to the city gates. Where's Drustin? Connell suddenly remembered the half-druid dragon. Galadir answered. Last I saw him he was talking to Lyra. Lyra. Connell remembered Drustin's words, two of our females have reached that age. It won't be long for the other four. He wondered if Lyra was one of the female dragons who could still bear young. Speaking of which, Torgrith cast a sly look at Connell. What's this we had two dragons but one was killed stuff. I've been with you for who knows how long and I've never even seen one dragon, let alone two, if they even exist. They exist, my friend. Torgrith frowned at the elf. You've seen one? Yes. A dragon? Voldar interrupted, cocking an eyebrow in disbelief. You've actually seen a dragon? Simply saying I'm a dragon doesn't mean you are one. If he says he has, then he has. Okay, okay. What's with you? He's an elf and elves don't lie. And even if they did, I still trust him. Thank you, Torgrith. Galadir dipped his head in appreciation. I pray that I always have your trust. Yeah, yeah. Boulder's tone held a little twinge of jealousy. What about the dragons? How about we have this conversation in private, once we're outside the city? He's right. There are too many prying ears here. Connell noted that she walked behind them, doing her best to keep up. Slowing the pace, he motioned her to walk beside him. So, you and your brother can communicate even though separated by great distances. It was a statement rather than a question. Yes? She gazed up at him, smiling pleasantly. It's a trait we discovered when we were very young. Connell returned the gaze and smile as they walked. And you're really twins? 
She giggled with girlish charm. Yes. Who's the oldest? I am. Were your parents surprised that they were having twins? No. A mage midwife had predicted my mother would have twins a year before she was pregnant. She predict anything else? Connell pondered how he could spend more time with her without it looking too obvious. Just that we would be mages. You'll forgive me if I say that I have a hard time picturing your brother as a mage. This caused her to giggle again, and Connell was smitten. He never did want to be a mage. Wanted to be a warrior, a soldier. Pa wouldn't hear it, especially after the midwife said he was going to be a mage. Connell thought about it a moment. Is he a mage because that is what he's really supposed to be, or because your father made him become one, and therefore the midwife's prediction is true regardless of his desires? Corla stared at him, as though he had plumped the depths of a divine mystery. You are the first person ever to understand that. I've thought that all along, but never wanted to say anything because it would just make father angry. Besides, now it's too late for him to be anything other than a mage. I understand. I think we're far enough away from the city now. Voldar gave a knowing grin to Connell, who glanced around, realizing they had passed through the main gates and he hadn't even noticed. You can tell us about dragons now. Hold that thought. Lorcan saw a runner headed his way, a young man moving at a good clip. Commander. The young man had to catch his breath. Sorchers intercepted a large force and is falling back towards us. She asks for immediate help. I thought she was at least two days north of us. We'll never reach her in time. We need to try, my lord. She's a resourceful commander, but she can't hold out against Thorian and what remains of Calder's army. Connell's lips pursed. This is not how we intended to begin. We need Thorian's attention in the east. Narrowing his attention on the messenger, he asked, How did you get this information? Message Hawk. My lord? Lorcan corrected the man. The young man's eyes popped wide. My lord. How long did it take for a hawk to get here? A couple of hours, my lord. A couple of hours? He was about to say that was impossible, when he recalculated that a hawk could average 30 miles an hour. That would put Sorka around 60 miles away. With a forced march, they could be there in two days. Your orders, my lord. Connell thought quickly. This could still work. If Gwen can move her forces by the time we connect with Sorka, it might still work. Turning his head to look at Voldar, he said, Why wasn't the dwarf commander with us in the meeting? He's a prickly one. Gets his felling hurt at the drop of a hat. Near as I can see, he was waiting for a royal invitation from you. Connell growled. We don't have time for games. Lorcan, get ready to move. We go to help Sorka. You too. He motioned to the two dwarves. Let's go have a heart-to-heart -heart with Story. Not forgetting Galadir, he said. Would you mind finding out where our druid is? Galadir replied with a respectful nod. As you wish. What about me? You go with no change that. You come with me. Connell increased his pace, the dwarves and Korla quick marching to keep up. As they made their way to the dwarven camp, Voldar leaned in to Korla. The commander's name is Story Broken Nose. You'll understand when you see him. One thing you gotta watch out though is not to slip up and call him Snorri. As you can imagine, he doesn't like being reminded of his nose. It can't be that bad. It was that bad when they stepped into Story's tent, and he looked up from behind the small field table he is using as a desk. Story's nose looked like it had been hit with a smithy's hammer across the bridge for it was nearly flat, the nostrils like two eruptions on both sides. We missed you at the meeting, Commander. Connell did his best to stare into the dwarf's eyes. I wasn't invited. You don't need an invitation. You are an army commander. How am I supposed to plan and organize when the battle captain of half my force thinks he needs to be invited? When I asked King Rorkin for support, he promised me he would send his best soldiers with his best commander. So you see, I need input from Rorkin Orfell's best commander. Assuaged story cleared his throat. 
Yes, well, all a misunderstanding, I'm sure. Good. We need to move out immediately. Sorka is under attack and needs our support. If you will ride with me, I'd like to go over what we discussed in the meeting and get you input. Flattered, Story stood up and barked out orders to get ready to move, then cast a look of authority at Torgrith and Voldar. What are you two lollygagging around here for? Go find your regiment. The two exchanged a worried glance, as neither knew to which regiment they belonged. Besides, they had no clue what it meant to be a dwarf soldier. They liked where they were, hanging out with Connell. With your permission, General, I'd like to keep these two with me as liaison officers representing you. They know the operation and would be beneficial to me as the campaign proceeds, acting as messengers between you and me. Story harumped again, and furrowed a thick brow at them. All right, my lord. If you can put up with those two, that works for me. Saves me the trouble of finding suitable liaison folks. Thank you. Well then, I'll leave you to get your army ready. I'll send one of the liaison officers to find you, to let you know where I am. Once outside, Torgrith sidled up to Connell, sighing a big, Thank you. That was very diplomatically played, my lord. We don't need personalities interfering with our battle plans. I meant what I said in there. I need him. As Connell led the way to where Lorcan's army was lining up, he turned his head to look at Corla. Can you contact your brother and tell him what's happening? What specifically, my lord? That we've been forced into attacking earlier than we had planned. She needs to get her forces in place and engaged as quickly as possible. He turned his head to see where he was going. And my name is Connell. I know, my lord. I am flattered with your familiarity, but you are still a king's son, a prince, and I am just a mage. Connell slid his eyes to the right to catch a glimpse of the beautiful woman striding next to him. You are far more than just a mage. Are you playing hard to get? Is there a man in your life? He was about to ask when she bent her head, staring at the ground as they walked. She abruptly stopped, causing the others to stop. She frowned in puzzlement, and tilted her head to look up at Connell. I don't understand. He's not responding. The only reason for that is that his mind is focused, concentrating on something else so much that he's not listening. Connell's jaw tightened and he resumed walking, shaking his head. What's the point of you being here, other than as a distraction, if you can't communicate with that idiot brother of yours? This is not good. If it doesn't work now, what makes you think it will when I really need it? I'm... I'm sorry, my lord. Corla had to take three steps to his two to keep up. Connell replied, though his irritation was evident. Forget it. You can try again later. Yes, my lord. She lowered her eyes. Connell was about to fuss at her to stop calling him my lord, when a runner from Lorcan raced up. My lord. Commander Lorcan says Sorcha's forces are a day out. She is surrendering ground faster than she can retreat. Commander Lorcan says that it is imperative that you give the order to march. Tell him to do so. Tell him we force march until we get there. Connell broke into a run. Chapter 3 I've never seen a dragon before. If we don't defeat Torian, you won't see one again. Venia's words sounded like a reprimand, but Kaelin didn't seem bothered. Do we need to get supplies before we leave? Food and water? No need until we reach Alaval. We'll make several stops along the way, and I'll make sure it's near civilized places so you two can get what you need. I'll fly high enough that no one on the ground should see us, but that requires a lot of energy and strength, which in turn requires a lot of food. They walked along the main street, headed toward the gates where Gwen had entered. The rebellion spy was at his vendor stall, calling out to passerby, and holding his dresses out for visibility. Gwen locked eyes with him as they passed, and he offered a nod. When he'd cornered her and pressed a dagger to her back, her first instinct had been to kill with fire. As she considered that, it disturbed her. That wasn't her. She'd never wish harm on anyone except Torian and his lackeys. And yet she had almost taken the man's life without a second thought. 
Was she being swayed by the dark magic that coursed through her? Or had she changed more than she realized, becoming more like Amel? She hoped that was not the case. Venia led them out of the city, and along a road that went northeast, until they were far enough away that it was unlikely anyone in the city would see them. Stand back. Gwen and Kaelin backpedaled until they were several feet away. Venia closed her eyes and for a moment, nothing happened. Gwen held her breath and watched intently. The change began slowly. Venia's skin lightened until it took on a sickly pale color. She dropped to the ground on all fours, her body racked with spasms so strong that her arms and legs trembled visibly. Venia hacked loudly. Her shoulder blades protruded from her back and Gwen flinched at how odd it looked. A loud popping noise filled the air, then her shoulder blades elongated and morphed into wings. Her body lengthened and grew in size until she was easily twenty feet long. Her face extended into a long snout and her skin color changed again, from pale white to silver, and scales took shape all along her form. When it was over, Venia was breathing heavily. Does it hurt? When you change, I mean? Yes, but the more I shift, the less I feel it. The first time I changed, I thought I was going to die. Absolutely fascinating. A real dragon. In the flesh. Come. Climb onto my back. Gwen had ridden on her once before, so she had little trouble getting onto Venia's back and settling herself into place. Kaelin followed the same path up Venia's shoulder and stood over Gwen. Move back. Why? So I can sit in the front. Gwen snorted. No, you can sit behind me. There's plenty of room. She patted Venia's scales. I want the front. Gwen glared at him and was tempted to pull rank since she was technically the queen, but instead she shrugged and scooted back, giving him enough room to sit down. Once he was settled, she nudged up behind him. You'll want to get a good grip. Or when she climbs into the air, you'll fall off. Kalen felt along Venia's neck scales until he found spots that he could grab, then he clenched his hands tightly onto them. Gwen didn't have anything to hold except Kalen. She hesitantly wrapped her arms around his chest and hugged him close. He smelled of lilac, a heady sweet scent with a touch of vanilla. She thought it odd he smelled so good. It made clinging to him less disagreeable. Venia dug her claws into the ground and crouched low, poised much like a cat about to pounce. Unlike a cat, however, she sprang into the air and flapped her powerful wings. The air rushed around Gwen like the sound of a raging river, and she watched the landscape quickly fade below them. Her stomach churned and her eyes teared from the whipping wind, but she exulted in it all. It wasn't every day she experienced something as miraculous as flying on the back of a dragon. They flew for a long while, and Gwen kept herself occupied by watching the countryside gradually change. The tracks of land were various colors and sizes, and all of them looked small enough that when Gwen held her fingers out, she imagined she could pinch them. We're heading down. Even though her voice carried, it was still hard for Gwen to hear her clearly over the wind. She leaned forward against Kaelin. Venia began her descent, and Gwen's stomach lurched again. She doubted she could ever get used to the feeling. They flew low over a wooded area, and Venia landed softly in a clearing. I must feast. There is a town within walking distance if you are hungry. I don't think anyone spotted me, but we should be quick regardless. Venia lowered herself closer to the ground, and Gwen and Kaelin slid off her shoulder onto the ground. Gwen felt odd walking on her own legs again, but the feeling was brief. I'm famished. You coming? The sight of a dragon eating a deer or some other such animal wasn't an image Gwen wanted in her head. She nodded, and they left Venier alone to hunt. The two exited the woods and walked through a wheat field until they reached the road that led to the town. As they drew closer to the boundary of the town, an older man was cutting the wheat down with a scythe, while three younger men, whom Gwen assumed were his sons, collected the stalks and tied them into sheaves. Sweat glistened on their tanned skin and one of the sons paused to offer an admiring stare at Gwen. She waved politely, and hoped he wouldn't try to speak to her. He went back to work when one of the others shouted at him for taking a break. Kaelin and Gwen entered the town and found a single tavern. It was a small wooden building with a thatched roof. 
Scrawled beside the door in red paint was the word Foamies. A hot meal is calling my name. And a cold ale. Ale sounds good. The two went inside and were greeted with curious stares by the handful of patrons that were scattered across the room. One table in particular caught Gwen's attention. Four men in armor bearing Torian's crest were laughing and clinking their tankards together. Gwen's heart skipped a beat, but when the men didn't even look their way, her nerves calmed. They don't know who I am, she told herself. Kaelin took a seat at a random table, and Gwen followed him. Despite the presence of Torian's soldiers, the atmosphere of Fomis was high-spirited. As Gwen listened to the scattered conversations, she assumed the people were all locals. Except for the soldiers. They were minding their own business, and the patrons seemed content to ignore their company. A serving girl sauntered over, her skirt short enough that if she bent down, everything would be revealed. Her top was a loose-fitting piece of white material that barely clung to her ample bosom. Kaylin eyed her lustfully, and Gwen rolled her eyes at him. I'm Poppy. What's your fancy? A night with you, Poppy. Kaylin offered a not-so-innocent grin. Is that so? Poppy placed her hands onto the table and leaned forward. Gwen watched Kaylin's eyes lower to her cleavage. Yes, indeed. Stick around long enough and you just might earn it. Poppy straightened. For now, how does soup sound? That sounds perfect. I want an ale, too. I'll take an ale, also. And some bread if you have any that's fresh. Coming right up. Poppy strolled away to the kitchen, and Gwen waited for Kaylin to turn his attention back to her. You think we can spend the night? I hope you're kidding. We don't have time for that. Try and keep your mind on what's important, will you? You're no fun. Unless you're up for some strenuous activities. Have you ever been struck by lightning? No. Talk to me like that again, and you will be. Kalen kept his wolfish grin, but Gwen could see the disappointment in his eyes. He shrugged and looked around the room, then set his gaze on the table of soldiers. What do you think they're doing here? Nothing good, I'm sure. Poppy returned, skillfully holding a bowl of steaming soup in her left hand and two large tankards and a plate of bread with the other. She set them down on the table and accidentally dropped a cloth napkin on the floor. Poppy knelt in front of Kalen seductively and peered up at him with a pouty face. Kalen hissed through his teeth. Woman, I'm about to. Whatever he said was lost to Gwen's ears as the table of soldiers erupted into raucous laughter and one of them knocked over their tankard, spilling ale onto the table. A stream of golden liquid ran off the edge, splattering onto the floor. Poppy, I need your hands. That's not all you need, another soldier said lewdly. Poppy rose to her feet and set the napkin in Kalen's lap, pausing with her hand on him for a moment before meandering over to the soldiers. She worked just as seductively with them, crawling on all fours to clean the ale off the floor. Kalen watched jealously. You know it's all for show. What? Kalen looked at her, his face flushed. The way she's flirting. It's all an act. You do know that? Of course I do. Gwen knew he was lying. He ate his meal in silence, but he continuously looked around for Poppy. Gwen sipped her ale, enjoying the familiar atmosphere while holding back the dreaded memory of the night at the seven stars where everything had begun. Kalen finished his meal and downed what remained in his tankard, then walked over to a table of farmers. Gwen watched him curiously, but couldn't hear what he was saying. A few of them nodded and looked at Gwen, raising their drinks in salute. Gwen's curiosity turned into suspicion. Was Kalen spreading rumors about her? He left that table and went to another. Again, the people he spoke with looked at her and offered nods or raised their drinks. Kalen made his way to every table until only the soldiers remained. As he walked past Poppy, he grabbed a handful of her buttocks and winked at her. He reached the soldiers and leaned down, speaking to the one who'd spilled his drink earlier. The soldiers laughed at first and Gwen assumed he must have told them a joke. As Kalen continued talking to them, she noticed that their expressions were changing from amusement to glares of anger. Gwen rose from her chair and started walking toward them, intent on grabbing Kalen and heading back to Venia. 
One of the soldiers said something, his tone getting louder as he spoke, but all Gwen heard was the word, treason. What are you doing? Gwen grabbed Kaelin by the arm. And here she is, Kaelin waved grandly. The rightful queen of Isentil's throne. The soldiers all stood up at once, and Gwen's heart sunk into her stomach. Kaelin had betrayed her, just like Emil had. That's enough of your nonsense. The soldier across the table growled and drew his sword, pointing it toward Kaelin. Kaelin looked at Gwen, a brazen look etched on his face. He pulled his arm free of her grasp, grabbed the edge of the table, and flung it into the soldier with the drawn sword. And then all hell broke loose. Chapter 4 There was little grumbling during the night, as the combined forces of Connell's army moved silently north, hoping to blunt Torian's incursion in time to save what remained of Sorka's regiment. He was surprised at the determination and speed of the dwarven soldiers, keeping pace with the taller human soldiers of Lorcan's army. In the early hours just before dawn the forward scouts sent word back that they made contact with Sorka's rear elements, and that Torian's forces had paused their pursuit to lay waste to the city of Blazingdon, allowing her to regroup and break contact with the enemy. Less than an hour later Sorka strode up to Connell. Her small army carrying their wounded, flopped down on the side of the road, receiving a welcomed rest. Sorka was a handsome tall blonde with the strong and fit body of an athlete. She began to drop to her knee when Connell stopped her. Are you okay? Yes, my lord. She completed the obeisance. Don't do that. Connell bent down to grab her arm and pulled her up. We can all be socially proper at some other time, but not here or now. We have more important things to worry about. What's your status? Sorka brushed the grime from her cheeks, impressed with this prince who seemed unaffected by his position. We've managed to delay them, but we couldn't do anything to stop them. We were able to break contact when they decided plundering Blassingdon was more important than pursuing us. How many? Lorcan walked up, nodding respectfully to Connell, before addressing Sorka. I count seventeen walking wounded, six more gravely injured. I have physicians attending them. Thank you, my friend. She breathed a sigh of relief. Connell turned to Torgreth. Tell story I need him now. Right you are. He grinned and sped off. How many able body do you have? I started with 757. I'm down to 702 with 32 dead and left behind. I'm facing an army three times my size. I've managed to inflict twice my losses on them, but we were in no position to offer combat. We've managed to draw them south, hoping Lorcan would have sufficient forces to counterattack. Kilmaren chose to retain his forces to block any southern probes. Though I didn't like it for it reduces our western attack into Isantal, it makes sense. I pray that he has the good sense to join the battle when it all begins. That said, we number over 7,000. Sorka flashed a fierce grin. More than twice the enemy. It's time for payback. Do you know who commands Torian's forces? No, my lord. Never got close enough to find out, though I did receive reports of a man of great size who appeared to be commanding. Though interesting, it does not tell me enough to know who it is. Do you still have scouts out? Yes, my lord, but like all my soldiers, they need rest. I've already sent out some scouts to relieve yours. I want to know where they are before we attack. Hands jammed on his hips, Connell scowled and glanced around. Where's Drustin? No one has seen him, my lord. One of Lorcan's captains strode up with another man who was still catching his breath. My lord, this man has information about the enemy. At that moment Story walked up. Good. Glad you're here. This scout has just arrived. Connell nodded at the scout. Go ahead. The man inhaled a deep breath. My lord, the enemy remains in Blassingdon, continuing to pillage the city. Connell replied with a fist pump. Good. How long will it take to get to the city? It took me an hour to get here, my lord but I pretty much ran the entire time. Connell dropped to his knees in the middle of the road. Smoothing out a spot with his hand, he motioned for the others to kneel with him. Drawing a small square in the dirt, he explained, Here's Blazingdon. 
Where are the city gates? Here and here. Sorka pointed to a front and rear gate. Have you been in the city? No, my lord. We used it as blocking to help us get away. No matter. We approach from the south. He drew a line as he talked. If we assume he's a good commander, he will have patrols even while the city is being ravaged. We need to eliminate any security he has, so we can penetrate the city. We do this by dividing our forces to block both gates, dwarves to the main gate, the rest at the back gate. We need to get someone inside the city. He looked up at them. We find someone who can handle himself and put him in the uniform of the enemy. We'll probably need more than one, my lord. Story was pleased that his army had the main attack through the central gate. I agree, general, but it will have to be someone other than a dwarf for obvious reasons. Story nodded. I know. We assume that his army is expending their strength in drinking and chasing women. All men. Sorka pointed out self-consciously adding. We like a good time too. Point taken. Connell smiled. The point is that we want them to be wasted by the time we attack. If he's a good commander, he won't allow that. You are right, but he did stop to allow his soldiers to pillage. That caused him to lose contact with his opponent. Not very smart. The spies we send in will alert us to the right time. When they give the signal, we attack from both sides. Challenge and password. Connell thought for only a moment. Challenge is dragon and password is blood. Make sure everyone knows it. Dwarves will be easy to recognize as friends. Let's not make any mistakes with the rest of us. Any questions? Where is the assembly area after the attack? And what about operations, security? Good points. Connell stood. We need 360 security. I leave it to you two to coordinate. Suggestions for assembly area? North of the city. Sounds good. Let's get ready to move out. We need volunteers for spy duty. What about me, my lord? You're in reserve. Seeing her disappointment, he said, Don't worry. You'll get your turn. Your soldiers are tired and need rest. He looked up at the sky that was beginning to lighten. We've got to go. Turning to the others, he said, Oh, one more thing. I'm going with the spies into Blazingdon. What? Are you crazy? That's are you crazy, my lord. Connell gave a half smile. But, but this is madness. You are the overall commander, the king's son. How can we protect you if you go in there? I have stealth skills beyond what anyone else has. It's not a question of skills, my young lord. We all have no doubt that you can handle yourself. Yet all it takes is one misplaced word, one look of doubt, one misdirected arrow. We can't afford anything happening to you. It would destroy the rebellion. Surely you can see that. Connell pursed his lips and looked at Voldar. Well. Voldar cocked an eyebrow. Really? You're going to possibly take the wind out of this rebellion because you want to show how stealthy you can be? Do you even have to ask? He slowly twisted his head to look at Sorka, who said nothing, merely shaking her head, no. Fine. You win. I'll be good. But when it comes time to fight, I want a piece of the action. If it becomes necessary, my lord. Connell let out an exasperated breath. Fine. It was mid-morning, by the time they were in position. Lorcan's army had to work its way around the city, through the forest. They had dispatched several enemy patrols before they had time to warn of Lorcan's army. There had been no shortage of volunteers to sneak into the city. Connell settled on ten who donned uniforms from the dead enemy patrols. And there had been plenty of intel provided by fleeing citizens. Tales of rape and murder were the common themes. Blazingdon itself wasn't a large city perhaps some three to four thousand residents. Open fields about two furlongs wide separated the city walls from the surrounding forest. But Blazingdon was a fortified city with tall stone walls of grey granite and wide stout oak city gates which were wide open. 
Dead bodies, some decapitated others with deep gashes sliced through various parts of their bodies, lay scattered in bloody lumps around the gate and archway across the moat. Several bodies lay where they fell, blocking the doors from being closed. Wisps of smoke near the center of the city curled and dissipated in the morning wind. It was eerily quiet, and Connell impatiently waited for his spies to give the signal, wondering if they had been spotted. Suddenly a man emerged from the rear gates and ran towards them. Lorcan recognized him as did Connell. My oh lord. It's, it's unreal. They're dead, almost all of them. What? Connell startled. How was it possible ten of his spies could accomplish such results in so short a time? We think it's the ale. The spy stopped in front of Connell and Lorcan. We think it's been poisoned. There's still a few alive who are holding out in the center of the city, but for the most part, everyone else is dead. So is their commander. Show me. Connell started back with the spy. Lorcan quickly issued orders, telling everyone to not drink anything in the city, as he randomly picked a bodyguard of twenty soldiers to protect Connell. Do the dwarves know yet? Yes, Commander. Hewlin went to tell them. Connell's bodyguard preceded him through the city gates, stepping over bodies and fanning out and keeping watch. Connell's mouth gaped open as he saw the multitude of soldiers curled up on the streets, their eyes glazed over in death. He closed his mouth and scrunched his nose at the stench of puke and feces. Stepping over body after body, Connell gaped as he saw their struggle. Some left claw marks on wooden posts or scrapes across the flaking stone walls. The last of them are this way, my lord. The spy directed them around a corner. To their surprise, a crone of a woman stood in the middle of the street. She was shorter than Corla, due more to her bent of age than actual height. She wore the black of a widow, her silver hair tucked neatly under a black scarf. She cackled, her teeth root stained. You're too late. Did what I had to. Could have used your help yesterday. But now you shows up and late's better than never. The bodyguards reacted and began to surround her, weapons ready. Leave her alone. They drew back, though still wary. Connell walked up and smiled at her. Who are you, mother? The woman's head snapped up to stare intently at him. I know you. She glanced surreptitiously around and lowered her voice. You're the cobra of prophecy. Looks like things are gonna heat up right soon. Connell looked back over his shoulder at one of the bodyguards. Fetch Corla. Turning back to the old woman he smiled kindly at her, waving a hand at the dead soldiers. So you did all this? Yup. She tapped her nose and winked at him. Knew they'd start drinking when they got here. Stupid soldiers got no discipline. Put poison in the ale. Not all of it, mind you, just the ones I knew they'd start with. Give me time to do the rest. Slow acting. Usual takes an hour or two. By then, she sliced a thumb across her throat. You've saved us a lot of trouble, mother. Name's Madeline. She grinned a root-stained smile at him. Madeline, how do you know who I am? Oh, I can tell cause you got a glow about you, like the one a dragon has. Connell frowned. Dragons have a glow about them? Of course, dearie. Every living creature has a glow, a color. Some calls it aspect. Only a few can see it, though. She chuckled. Some spends their lives trying to discover it. It is what it is. You can't change it. Corla walked up, giving the woman a polite smile. You wanted to see me, my lord? My lord is it. Madeline snickered, then awkwardly bowed. Forgot my place. Ignoring the jab, Connell spoke to Corla. This is Madeline. She is responsible for this resounding victory. Lorcan strode up with Story and Galadir in tow. There's no one left, my lord. He shook his head in amazement. Do we have a chronicler with us? Yes, my lord. Send someone to fetch him. I want Madeline here to be forever remembered as the champion of Blazingdon, for it is she who defeated our enemy. I want to make sure it is recorded correctly. Surprised and flattered, Madeline blinked at the sudden attention. We'll need to toss all the ale. Don't need to. 
Poison's already gone out of it. It don't last. Just long enough to do what I needed. Connell nodded in understanding, then noticed Corla standing to the side, waiting for instructions. Madeline, this is Corla. She's... I know what she is. I could tell at the moment she walked up. Because of her asp. Association with you, yes. Figured you'd have a mage with you. Nobody said I was a mage. Corla's brows furrowed. Madeline grinned at her. Takes one to know one. What? You're a mage? Corla cocked an eyebrow in disbelief. Madeline's smile vanished followed by an intense frown at Corla. Course I am. She flipped a hand at the surrounding dead. How'd you think I did this? A simple herbalist could have done the same thing. Madeline turned to Connell. She may be a looker, but she ain't got the brains to go with it. If her finished with me, my lord, I'll go tell the rest of them that escaped that it's safe to come back now. Will you come with us? Pardon. I'm asking you to come with us. Madeline was again flattered. Why? I'm just an old woman. You're a mage, and we can use your help. Huh? Corla curled a lip. She's no more a mage than I am a warrior. Ignoring her, Connell repeated, Will you come with us? She's an old woman. She'll only slow us down. Connell held up a hand for her to be quiet, though his attention was on the old woman. Well, will you come with us? Madeline looked at him, then at the indignant Corla, before grinning. I'd love to, my lord. Chapter 5 Treason Gwen heard the word reverberate off the walls of the tavern, as she watched the guard with the sword crash into the wall. The table bounced off him and struck the floor and broke, sending splinters flying in every direction. The other guards were momentarily surprised, but they quickly recovered their wits and drew their swords. Gwen grabbed onto Kalen's arm again and jerked him back just in time to keep him from being skewered. Blasted pigs. Kalen tried to break free of her grasp. We need to go. Gwen summoned her strength rune and pulled Kalen across the tavern. Two of the guards hurried after them, while the other one helped his fallen comrade. Gwen was considering using her fire rune next, but the patrons of the tavern blocked the soldiers and kept them at bay. She spotted Poppy behind the mob. Next to her was an older man who watched the unfolding chaos with an unamused expression. I'm sorry. Gwen hurriedly tossed a few coins onto a table and pulled Kalen outside, dragging him along behind her. Kalen laughed. I haven't had this much fun in a long time. You think almost getting stabbed is fun? I saved your life back there. Nah. Even if his blade would have hit me, it would have bounced right off. I've got the steel skin rune. The what? If you stop pulling me, I'll show you. Gwen glanced behind them. The guards hadn't gotten free of the crowd yet, but she doubted it would take much longer. Show me when we get back to Venia. She released Kalon's arm and the two sprinted until they reached the wheat field, then cut across it and plunged into the woods. Venia. We need to move. The dragon was in the clearing, her tail flicking back and forth. What is it? This fool started a fight with some of Torian's soldiers. We need to leave. Now. Venia lowered herself so they could mount her, and then she launched into the air. Gwen was angry at Kalen. What he'd done was stupid and irresponsible. She punched him in the back for good measure, then hissed in pain. Kalen wasn't lying. His skin was hard and her knuckles stung. Told you. Venia's climb through the air plateaued, and she continued flying northeast. Why did you start a fight with those guards? Why not? We have enough problems and we don't need more. And what did you say to the others? Why did they look at me and raise their drinks? I told them who you were. And that we were going to take the fight to Torian. Our attack is supposed to be a surprise. Or at the very least, have him looking one way while he gets crushed from the other. If you ever do that again, you'll need more than steel skin for what I have in store for you. Is that a threat or a promise? Gwen bit her tongue. Kalen was hot-headed and didn't care if he crossed the line, 
and arguing with him would accomplish nothing. She avoided speaking to him until they landed. Gwen assumed it was so that Venia could eat again, but as she climbed off the dragon's back and looked around, there was a feeling of familiarity that came over her. Where are we? On the border of Alaval. Venia glanced around uneasily. She sniffed the air. What's wrong? Gwen also surveyed the area, but she didn't see anything. Kirith and his army should be here, but I can't smell them. Unless they are using magic to hide their presence, I don't think they are here yet. That's impossible. Eridor sent word to Kirith before the meeting was over. Maybe the message never arrived. We're in trouble if it didn't. Gwen chewed on her lower lip, thinking. We need to find Kirith. If his army doesn't march with us to Isenthal, we don't stand a chance. I'll go. You two stay here. I can fly faster without having to worry about you falling off my back. Gwen didn't like the idea of waiting around, especially not with Kaelin, but it would take her too long on foot. That, and she didn't know where to find the forest city. Go but please hurry. Venia sped off, the treetops swaying from the force of her wings. Gwen stared off into the woods. She tried not to think about what would happen if Kirith's forces didn't come through. Without an army to attack from the east, there would be no diversion from Connell's approach. Have you heard from your sister? She tried speaking to me before we left Haddens, but I ignored her. You what? What if it was something important? I'm sure it wasn't. She probably just misses me. We don't separate very often, and when we do, she badgers me for attention. Honestly, it's exhausting. I enjoy getting away from time to time. That's fine and well, but next time she reaches out to you, answer her. I need to know what's going on with my brother. Gwen could feel her irritation rising again, and she took a deep breath. There was something about Kaelin's attitude that exasperated her to the point of rage. Gwen paced in circles while they waited for Venia to return. Her nerves eventually calmed, and she looked at Kaelin. He was sitting on a fallen tree, weaving leaves and thin vines together into a crown. He plucked a white flower and placed it in the center of the crown, then noticed she was staring at him. Here. He held out his creation. I made it for you. Is that an apology? She walking over to accept it. Hardly. I don't apologize for being myself. Gwen looked away a little embarrassed about her anger towards him. The man was infuriating, true, but maybe she had judged his character incorrectly. She took the crown and set it atop her head. How do I look? Ridiculous. Kaelin smirked. If you had pointed ears, you'd look like an elven queen. So you aren't always a complete idiot? That's a surprise. Gwen returned his smile. She felt that statement was somewhat true anyway. Kalen placed a hand over his heart, a mock look of pain on his face. You wound me, your majesty. Gwen rolled her eyes. Show me the rune you mentioned. Kalen reached down and pulled his pant leg up to reveal a rune that looked like a sword wrapped in ivy. This one has saved me many times. What other runes do you have? Why? Are you interested in trading magic? Possibly. I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Things like that made Gwen want to punch him in the mouth, but now that she knew it wouldn't even hurt him, she just glared at him instead. You're too serious. Try having everyone you love be murdered, and see how happy you are. Kaelin's smile faded. I'm sorry. I didn't know. Don't worry about it. The silence turned awkward, and Kaelin suddenly pulled off his shirt, revealing several runes in random spots across his chest and even one on his stomach. Gwen didn't have any of them, which made her wonder just how many runes were out there. This one unlocks doors. Kalen pointed to a rune shaped like a key. Of all places, it was located over his heart. Spiked ball, wind breath, shield healing, animal manipulation, telepathic communication. He named them off as he pointed. And this last one will be a real benefit when we encounter Torian's prestiges. Gwen peered closely. The rune looked like an open door. 
What does it do? It absorbs magical attacks. That will definitely help. Gwen expected Kalen's body to resemble Amel's, and she was surprised to find that he didn't have many runes. Are you searching for more? Not really. Kalen shrugged. I like what I have. His brow furrowed, and he tilted his head curiously. I don't know how I missed it. Missed what? The lines in your eyes. How did you get a dark rune? It's a long story. I'd rather not talk about it. Give me the dark rune, and you can have any of mine. His words had an eager tone to them. No. Just like that, huh? No counteroffer, or anything. No. The silence resumed, and Gwen went back to pacing. Venia should have been back by now. Had she run into trouble? Were Kirith and his people under attack? Did Torian's arm reach this far? There were too many questions and not enough answers. There. Kaelin shattered her thoughts. Gwen looked to the sky and saw Venia returning. The dragon swooped down and landed. Kirith was on her back. When he saw Gwen he leaped off and rushed to her, wrapping her in a hug. It is good to see you all well. Same here. Where's your army? We're marching on Isenthal now. Now. Kirith was surprised. Yes. Did you get Eridor's message? I didn't get anything. A heavy weight fell onto Gwen's shoulders and she sighed. I don't know what happened, but we need to go. Connell and his forces are heading for Isenthal as we speak. We were to attack from the east and provide a diversion. Now we have a problem. I can gather my people, but I will need some time. That's the one thing we don't have. We'll raise an army on the way. Gwen stared at him incredulously. What? You saw how those men responded in the tavern. In a small farming town, they gladly stood up to those guards to help us escape. People are tired of Torian. All they need is a little nudge. Gwen looked at Kirith. He's got a point. Kirith was a male, so of course he would side with Kaelin. Gwen looked at Venia questioningly. I agree with Kaelin. Kirith's army will come, but not quickly enough. You'll have to convince your people to rise up against Torian. Gwen thought they were all insane, but it did seem like their only option. Where's the nearest town? Wespin. It's a few hours from here. If I fly fast enough, we'll cut the time in half. Gwen looked at each of them. Fate or destiny or possibly death was tightening the rope around her neck, suffocating her. She had to make a decision, but she didn't want to lead innocent men and women to be slaughtered. Connell's words echoed in her mind. Anyone willing to join us is more than welcome. We'll leave our fate in the hands of the people then. Kaylin, let your sister know what's happened, and get me an update from Connell. We need to be in sync now more than ever. Kaelin nodded and stepped away. I trust you are still committed to this task? You have my oath. Gwen turned to Venia. What of the dragons? If there's eleven of you left, where are the others? They're heading to a centaur. That fact gave Gwen some solace at least. We've got another problem. Corla says that Connell and his army are attacking a city called Blazingdon, because Torian's army has crossed the border into Tyr Manic. It's one thing after another. Can you use your telepathy rune to contact other mages? It depends on how far away they are. And I need to know their name or their general location. The Great Library is where she should be. Her name is Marjorie. I'll see what I can do. Kalen sat on the ground and closed his eyes. I hate to leave you with this situation, but I must gather my people. We will meet you in Isenthal, Solara willing. I understand. Maybe we'll stay alive long enough to see you again. Kirith bowed his head and left, sprinting into the woods. Gwen watched Kaelin, occasionally glancing at Venia. The dragon remained quiet but returned her gaze. Finally Kaelin's eyes opened and he stood. Marjorie says a force of prestiges left the Great Library already and are headed to Isenthal. 
She's going to tell them to meet us in Wespen. Thank the gods. At least we have magic to battle magic. We should make haste. The faster you can spread word of the coming battle, the more people will join our cause. Gwen motioned for Kaelin to Mount Venia first, but he shook his head. Take the lead. Gwen did so, and Kaelin sat behind her. Hold on tight. Venia launched into the air. Once they were gone, Emil stepped out from the trees. She watched them fade in the distance, and then opened the letter Eridor had penned. She'd intercepted the message Hawk by accident, while magically teleporting to Alaval. Emil read over it again, then tossed the parchment aside and activated her rune. It was time to cut the head off the snake. Chapter 6 While Lorcan and Story sent scouts out to patrol the surrounding area, ensuring none of the enemy had escaped, Connell, the two mages, his battle captains and bodyguards set out to find the enemy commander. As they made their way through the streets, Madeline caught up to Corla, grinning confidently at her. Don't worry, dearie, I won't steal your man away from you. He's not my man. And even if he was, I doubt you would be a threat. Ooh, sure of ourselves, are we? She smirked at her. Corla stiffened. I don't know why he wants to bring you along. I can handle it. Like how you helped when he attacked the city. She parried with a feigned innocent grin. He didn't need my help. She chuckled. Of course he didn't. I'd already helped him. Pursing her lips, Corla picked up her pace to catch up to Connell. Connell was having second thoughts about inviting the old woman, but she was resourceful and he needed a mage, someone unafraid to do what is necessary. That she seemed to enjoy picking on Corla might be a problem. He'd wait and see. Still, having two mages with him was more than he had expected. They found the commander slouched in an imposing chair, set on a platform, in the reception room of the burgomaster's residence hall. His hands draped over the armrests, a spilled drinking horn on the floor by his feet. The eyes glazed over in death stared at the far wall. Connell was the first to notice it, a beautifully cut obsidian stone set in gold filigree on a necklace chain dangling from his neck. Reaching for it, he startled when Madeline slapped his hand away, placing her other hand between him and the stone. You don't wants to do that, young lord. If you don't wants him to know or hear. Why? Don't touch it. Madeline glanced around the room. Retrieving a cloth napkin on a bureau by the wall, she wrapped the stone inside the cloth before casting a look back at Corla. Go ahead. Tell him. Tell him what? Corla was confused. About the stone. What about the stone? Madeline frowned at her. You sure you're a mage? Of course. Enough. Why don't you tell me, Madeline? Casting a suspicious look at Corla, Madeline explained as she pulled the necklace over the dead man's head. It's a linking stone. Linking stone? Yes. She gave Corla a look of disappointment. You have much to learn, dearie. I'm not your dearie. Just stop it. What does a linking stone do? It's a connection, young lord, between two people, usual a mage or wizard is at one end. The man holds the stone like this. She held the cloth in her hand. And when he does, it tells the mage that he is ready to talk. Oh? They're too far apart. That's why it's called magic, dearie. Once the connection is made, the mage then commands the man to do his bidding. If the mage is strong enough, he can use the man's eyes to see what he sees. Story snarled. By the gods. No, dearie. She smiled with only her lips. The gods got nothing to do with this. What should we do with it? Lorcan shifted a worried look between the old woman and Connell. Connell knitted his brow and thought. Can the mage be fooled? I mean, supposed someone took the stone and pretended to be the commander. Could the mage be fooled into thinking he was still controlling the commander? Madeline's eyes widened. I know what you're thinking, young lord. Answer the question. Madeline paused. Yes, it is possible. But, it'll work only as long as the mage believes he has the right man. Pray that the mage is distracted, 
for he can plumb the depths of the pretender's mind. If the mage discovers the deceit, the pretender is as good as dead for the mage with destroy him from the inside out. Connell nodded, inhaling a deep breath. Where is the tallest building in the city? We're in it. Remember? We saw the tower above the walls. Good. Connell turned to the dwarven commander. Story, I need you to hide your army so that no dwarves can be seen. What are you gonna do? I have a plan. Lorcan, you take your army and assemble them outside the main city gates. What are you going to do, my lord? Lorcan's concern was obvious. Gonna have a little chat with a certain mage. Corla stiffened. No. You're crazy. Connell's face hardened, and he jabbed a finger at her. You and Madeline are with me. The rest of you go do what I asked. Glaring at the bodyguard, he commanded, and you all stay here. Are you sure you wants to do this, young lord? Madeline peered intently at him. No, I'm not sure, but I have an idea, and I have to try. Now please, we're wasting time. But, my lord? No buts, Lorcan. I know what I'm doing. Do you? Corla's words were spoken sharply. You go with General Story and stay out of the way. He immediately regretted his anger when he saw the hurt in her eyes. Madeline led the way through the Burgomaster's citadel. Been here often enough. Always wondered what the view was like at the top. Connell opened the door for her, letting her slowly lead the way up the spiraling stairs. Though chafing to get to the top, he calmed himself, praying that his gambit worked. Anything I should know about working the stone? She paused on the step above him to look over her shoulder at him. It is dangerous what you plan to do. If it works, fine. If not... She shrugged. Resuming the climb up, she said, Hold the stone loose in her hands, just the fingers touching it. That way, if he discovers who you are, it's easier to drop the stone. Tell him what he wants to hear. Butter him up real good, but don't overdo it. Remember who Ur is supposed to be. She pushed through the door at the top of the stairs and stepped out onto the narrow walkway around the spire. Connell stepped out behind her, immediately feeling vertigo, causing him to firmly grasp the iron railing. Are you okay? Yes. He swallowed and forced himself to relax as he gazed out over the city walls to the forest in the distance, then down at the streets littered with bodies. You sure you want to do this? She gave him a hard stare. Yes, of course. Unwrapping the stone, she slipped it over his head, careful not to touch the stone. Touch the stone with just the fingers of her left hand. The mage will know you're there. Obeying, Connell touched the stone and felt an immediate tingle up the arm, into his shoulder, and up his neck, and into his head. His vision clouded to almost black. Then a voice spoke inside his head. What? Ah, there you are. Where have you been? I'm where I'm supposed to be. Don't get smart with me. Did you do what I asked? Connell paused, trying to think of the right answer. What's wrong with you? Connell forced himself to relax, calling in the deception skills he learned as a highwayman. I'm a little drunk. He laughed. Drunk? Where are you? Blazingdon. Did you destroy the city? Of course. Let me see. Connell bent his head to stare down at the streets. The weird feeling of someone else using his eyes and a shiver up his spine. Good, good. Yes. Stop. I see uniforms. Who are they? They're the ones I've been chasing. Managed to corner them in the city here. Where are your soldiers? Outside the town. Connell lifted his eyes to stare off in the distance beyond the city walls. Why? All the ale's gone. Connell snorted a laugh. Don't be a fool. I didn't send you here to lay around getting drunk. My soldiers needed a break. Besides, the ale was free and so were the women. He snickered, conjuring up an image of woman he had met a year ago, hoping the vision would be convincing. Focus, damn you. You're wasting time. What's the rush? Are you that stupid? 
I chose you because you were useful. Don't make me regret my decision. Connell felt a flash of intense pain explode in his head. Ow. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Are you finished in Blassingdon? Yes. Then get moving. Ah. Uh, where am I going? Has the ale befuddled you that much? Connell felt the rising irritation in the voice. He needed to be cautious. I. I am a little disoriented. Disoriented? Now there's an interesting word. I'm surprised you were able to use it in a sentence. Connell silently berated himself for forgetting who he was pretending to be. I'm not stupid. Of course you aren't. The mage was not subtle with his sarcasm. Calm yourself, Firin. You still have work to do. Go north. Hafgan waits for you. You will join her and attack Gorwick. I want that city destroyed. Let me know when you have succeeded. Which one of us commands? Connell acted as though he was affronted, he was not specifically named in charge. The mage chuckled. Vanity, vanity. Does it matter? She is a proven leader. So am I. Why must I submit to a woman? I didn't need her help laying waste to Blazingdon. I will acquiesce to your request this time. Do not try my patience again. Yes, master. That's better. Say it again. Yes, master. One more time. The mage sniffed a laugh of derision. Yes, master. Connell felt an intense lethargy permeate his body. Laying the cloth over her hand, Madeline snatched the stone with one hand and slapped him across the face with the other. Ow. He put a hand to his cheek. What was that for? You were starting to lose yourself. What do you mean? The mage was beginning to exert control over you. How did you know? Madeline peered intently into his eyes, examining them, finally nodding. Are fine now. I could tell by the voice you used at the end, like someone drugged. Well, did you discover what you wanted? Yes. Connell was reasonably sure he didn't want to try that experiment again. The dead commander below is named Furin. Madeline cocked an eyebrow at him. I could have told you that. You didn't need to do this. She held up the cloth wrapped around the stone. And I also learned that Furin is on his way north to join Hafgan and attack Gorwick. Madeline grinned at him. I didn't know that. What are we gonna do? We're going to head north. He started to turn, then abruptly stopped. Who do you think was the mage at the other end? Can't be sure. Few mages got that power. My guess it was probably Grimar. You were lucky this time. Don't think you ought to try it again. Not a problem. Come on. I need to tell the others. Twenty minutes later, he stood in the middle of the armies with Madeline Lorcan's story, Galadir and Corla, whose insolent look told him she wasn't happy. Voldar and Torgrith, though not formally invited, stood at the edge of the group. Connell smiled at them and motioned them closer. The enemy here is supposed to be heading north to join forces with a woman commander named Hafgan for an attack on Gorwick. We will head north to join them. We're gonna attack Gorwick? Torgred's brow scrunched in confusion. No, my friend. We're going to destroy Hafgan and her army. I have an idea. It's going to require us making her believe we are Furin's army come to help her. Once we destroy her army, we head into Isenthal. It's about time Torian learns he is not in control like he thinks he is. Story crossed his arms. Easier said than done. What's your plan? We'll need scouts well out in front so that she doesn't know who we are. The scouts, when confronted, will need to play the part of Furin's loyal soldiers. She won't suspect anything if she believes we are who she thinks we are. Lorcan nodded. I like it. Gives us a chance to assess and deploy. We don't know how big her army is. Story pointed out. I know, but surprise is always to our advantage. Besides, we have two powerful mages with us. While Madeline preened, 
Corla's insolence vanished, replaced by a sudden feeling of overwhelming inadequacy. Chapter 7 Tell me again how this is going to work. Gwen rubbed the back of her neck, trying to work out the soreness. We'll spread the word in the streets. Anyone you see is a potential ally. Won't that draw the attention of Torian soldiers? Probably, but unless you have a better idea, I think it's worth the risk. Gwen knew Kaelin was right, but she still didn't like it. She also didn't like being forced to change their strategy at the last minute. With a city as large as Wespen, there were bound to be problems they couldn't account for. They had arrived less than an hour ago, and were waiting near a well for Venia to meet them in her elven form. From the air, Gwen had seen that Wespen was shaped like a compass, with the city divided into four smaller sections by large waterways that dispersed water from the nearby river into the city. There's only three of us. We could cover more ground if we had more bodies. And if a bard had four arms, he could play two instruments. What's your point? Focusing on the problem doesn't get us anywhere. Gwen looked at Kaelin, and he held his hands up placatingly. I'm just saying, we should find the silver lining, no matter how thin it is. I know, but it's difficult. Nothing of value is ever easy. You seem too young to have experienced many difficulties. Kaelin laughed. You haven't met my father. He forces difficulty on me constantly. I'm sorry. Don't be. Maybe once this is all over, I'll be considered a hero and can choose my own path. What do you mean? I don't want to be a mage. Word up to me, I would live by the sword, carving out glory and fame with my skill. Gwen was surprised. Kaelin was more like her in that regard. When Eridor had first told her she was a mage, she didn't want to walk that path. Yet she had been forced upon it and walked it even now, unsure of what life would be like without magic. Lyra came into view at the end of the street, and she joined them at the well. We should split up to cover more ground. I don't think we should. What if one of us gets into trouble? The others wouldn't know. Normally, I would agree with Lyra. But in this instance, I must side with Gwen. We don't have enough people, as it is. If one of us were to get caught by the guards, it would be impossible to free them. We should stick together. Lyra frowned, but she acquiesced. Very well. Gwen waited for one of them to decide where to start, but they were both staring at her. What are we waiting for, Your Majesty? Gwen huffed. Stop calling me that. It's just Gwen. She looked around at the various shops that lined the street, thinking. And then an idea came to her. We could find bards to help spread the message. Kaelin frowned. With what money? The money Eridor gave me. It should be plenty to convince those greedy minstrels to sing of our plight. And how will we eat? Do you want food or do you want to save our kingdom? I'd like both, and I don't want to be forced to choose. Too bad. They navigated the crisscrossing streets until they found a tavern that had music playing within. Gwen handed Kaelin a handful of coins. See what you can do. He shrugged and entered the tavern. Lyra and Gwen waited outside. After a few moments of uncertainty, Kaelin returned with a smile. That was easy. The man probably would have done it for free. Gwen doubted that, but she was happy regardless. Start telling everyone we need their help. When we find places like this, she pointed at the tavern, or come across bards on the street, we give them some money and keep going. The three of them spread out across the street and began stopping passerby. Initially, Gwen found some resistance. People thought she was a beggar who wanted a handout, but when she started talking, they listened with rapt attention. Kaelin had been right, people were tired of Torian. Gwen expected their task to take them most of the day, but as they spread through the city, so too did their words. By the time they crossed the bridge into the second section of the city, people were already aware of their message and were spreading it themselves. We told people who are interested to meet us outside the city, but we don't have anywhere to host them. We've no tents or bedrolls or anything. I thought about that. These people live here. 
They can sleep in their homes until we are ready to march. When will that be? Hopefully at dawn's fight light, but we can't leave until the prestiges from the Great Library arrive. They are the key to battling Torians. What if they aren't here by then? Gwen didn't even want to consider that as an outcome, but it was possible. Then we go ahead without them and leave them a message to continue to Eisenthal. Whether we have five people or five hundred doesn't matter now. We just have to get there and get Torian's attention before he focuses his might on Connell and his army. Five hundred would get his attention more than five. Kalen chuckled. Imagine five people showing up outside the castle gates, demanding he abdicate the throne. I don't think he'd even notice. Gwen couldn't help but smile. The sight would indeed be laughable. A commotion nearby caught their attention, and Gwen spotted a contingent of soldiers harassing a young boy. The boy shouted, as the guards tried to wrangle him under control. Vengeance is coming. It looks like they've heard their days are numbered. Gwen had considered the fact that she or Kaelin could get arrested, but she hadn't considered that the soldiers might target innocent people. Before she could decide what to do, Kaelin rushed to join the fray. He lowered his shoulder, and drove it into the back of one soldier, sending him crashing to the ground. Kaelin turned to the next one and grabbed onto his helmet, forcing the soldier's head down onto his knee. The armor clanged as if it had struck a shield, and the soldier cried out in pain as Kaelin tossed him aside. Gwen blinked several times before breaking out of her reverie. She sprinted to the boy. Are you all right? I am now. He gave a large smile. Pummel him, sir. Show that pig what for. You should get home. It's too dangerous for you out here. The boy looked like he was going to argue, then nodded and ran off. Gwen turned around in time to see Kalen take down another soldier. Within a matter of seconds, he had subdued three of them. The remaining two had drawn their swords, but they were keeping their distance and seemed hesitant to engage Kalen. Tell your fellows that if they harass anyone else, the wrath of Her Majesty Queen Gwen will find them. A bell started ringing a few buildings down, and Gwen realized they were near a guard outpost. She cursed under her breath. We need to hide somewhere. Before she'd finished her sentence, she spotted soldiers bolting out of the building. Someone met with the soldiers and pointed in her direction. Gwen squinted to see who it was. Why would one of the citizens rat them out? As she stared, it almost looked like, no. It can't be. What is it? More guards. And a powerful enemy. A mage. We can take him. It's a her, and I don't know about that. She's got more runes than most prostitutes' body counts. Kaelin gave her an odd look and she shrugged in response. The soldiers started running toward them. Here they come. Gwen turned to Lyra. Hide. I'm tired of hiding. I want blood. The tone of her voice sent a shiver along Gwen's spine. She nodded. The time for running was over. It was time to fight. Lyra issued a roar as she partially shifted into a dragon. Her body stretched and changed, but only until she looked like a massive lizard. She charged the two soldiers who'd been keeping their distance and whacked one with her tail. The other one she snapped up in her jaws, crunching the man's bones loudly. Gwen blanched and turned to face the approaching soldiers. She held up her right hand and inhaled a deep breath, then summoned the magic of her fire rune. Tyne. She spoke the rune's name. A wave of flames erupted from her palm and shot forth, engulfing the nearing soldier. He screamed in terror and anguish, his armor melting under the intense heat. He was the first to die. Gwen spoke the rune again, killing another soldier. She watched as more of them came out of the outpost, and she watched them as they died, writhing in the wrath of her fire. Watch this. She kept her focus on the magic, but offered a glance in Kalen's direction. He was pointing to the sky where a group of birds wheeled overhead. He spoke a word and the birds changed direction, diving down to attack the guards. That's nothing. Gwen cut off the magic and switched hands. Tintreach. Lightning flashed from her fingertips and forked apart, striking two soldiers simultaneously. They died instantly and the bolts ricocheted, killing two more soldiers. 
Despite their magical attacks, the soldiers kept coming at them. Amateur. Kalen laughed. He spun in a circle and held his right hand out, shouting another word. This time, an ethereal ball formed. He threw it at the center of a small group of soldiers. The ball grew as it sped through the air. It landed on the ground, quivered briefly, and then exploded, sending hundreds of spikes airborne. That's impressive, but not as impressive as this. She called on the magic of the might rune, and waited until a soldier was right on top of her, before she punched him in the chest plate as she yelled, Ladrioct! The armor caved in under her enhanced blow, crushing the man's chest and sending him reeling. Gwen was just as surprised as Kaelin. They continued in the sordid game, pushing each other into more insane ways of taking out their enemies, until the street was littered with dead soldiers and none remained. Lyra stalked around like a predator, her head swiveling as she looked for more enemies. The general citizenry had cleared the area already, and as Gwen surveyed their work, she started to feel ill. She had killed many people, and she had laughed doing it. Bile rose in her throat and she forced it down, gathering her saliva and swallowing it to ease the burning of her tonsils. Their fight wasn't over though. Bells were ringing all around the city. More guards would be coming, but Gwen wasn't thinking about that. She watched Emil slowly approach, their gazes fixed on one another. I see you've learned some new tricks. Emil cast a glance at the bodies. Why are you here? Gwen clenched her fists. Emil's betrayal burned in her veins like her fire rune, and Gwen wanted nothing more than to obliterate the woman from existence. I'm here to kill you. Torian tires of the rebellion, and he's about to stamp the life out of it. He can try, but his cruelty lacks our passion. We will defeat him. Enough talk. Emil spat, then she swept her arm up and a rush of air struck Gwen, pushing her back a few feet. Kalen turned her magic against her, using his wind breath rune to turn the direction of the gale back at her. She dove out of the way, rolling aside and coming back up quickly. Her body rippled, and suddenly there were five of her, each one identical to the others. Gwen couldn't tell which one was the real Amel. She spoke the name of the lightning rune, shattering one of the illusions into pieces like broken glass. The other four scattered and hurled different spells at Gwen and Kalen, putting them on the defensive. A faint blue glow appeared around Kalen, and Emil's attacks bounced off harmlessly. He threw another spiked ball and closed the distance between himself and Gwen, sharing his shield with her. The ball exploded and destroyed two of the four illusions, while also sending a wave of spikes into the surrounding buildings. Gwen was glad the area had been evacuated. The devastation the spikes caused would have killed many innocent people. Emil knelt and dug her fingers into the dirt, between the cobblestones of the street. The ground shook around Gwen and Kalen before a gaping hole opened up, threatening to swallow them. Gwen wrapped her arms around Kalen and summoned the might rune, throwing them backward and away from the hole. I think you were right. They got back on their feet. She's a worthy opponent. We might want to run. We can't. She'll find us. Emil won't stop until she's dead. Or we are. Then we need to find a way to kill her. I'm open to ideas. When Kalen didn't offer any, Gwen looked at him. He shrugged. I can shield us and we can try to get close to her. That's all I've got. Gwen considered each of her runes. The healing and life rune were obviously no good in this fight. That might work. If we can get close enough, I can use my dark rune. What does it do? It steals life, but I have to be touching her. So we have to get really close. Too close. There's no telling what other magic she's got. What if we had a diversion? Such as what? Kalen tilted his head, and Gwen looked in the direction he was hinting at. Lyra was perched atop the roof of a building near Emil, her reptilian eyes watching the woman intently. She must know Lyra's there. She's been watching the whole time. Maybe, but a diversion doesn't have to be a surprise. It just has to draw her attention. Can you communicate with Lyra and tell her what we're doing? I don't know if it works with dragons, but I can try. He closed his eyes. Gwen watched Lyra, 
but if the dragon could feel Kaelin's mind, her demeanor didn't show it. She'll pounce on her. And it was surprisingly easy to touch her mind. Even more than with Korla. Gwen didn't care about that, but she smiled anyway. Lyra leapt off the building, and Amal immediately turned to face her. Hold on. Gwen grabbed Kaelin's hand. She summoned the runes on her thighs, only a vague idea of what they did as she said. Lewis. They sped forward so quickly that everything around them blurred. Gwen barely stopped in time before they passed Amal completely. Lyra landed beside them, her jaws snapping at Amal, but the woman easily sidestepped out of Lyra's path. Gwen reached out as her speed slowed and latched onto Amal's arm, jerking her and Kaelin forward roughly before coming to a stop. With vengeance within her reach, Gwen fell into the power of the dark rune. Drain Sawil. Amal screamed in anger and pain as her life force was violently ripped away. Gwen felt the energy streaming into her own body, addictive and powerful. It revitalized her flagging strength, and she could feel Amal weakening. Despite the euphoria, Gwen knew the magic was unholy. It was magic so dark, no one should ever have discovered it. Amal dropped to her knees, and her face looked like it had aged several years within just a few seconds. Her subconscious told her it was wrong. Yet it felt so good. Amal deserved to die. She'd poisoned many elves, and some of them had died. This was the fate she deserved, to suffer and die painfully. And yet, there was a fate that could be worse for the woman. An idea struck Gwen, and she focused on the stream of life energy flowing out of Amal. She followed the trail until she found what she was looking for. A glowing sphere of golden light hovered near Amal's spine. Gwen turned the power of the dark rune on it, and with a single thought, she snuffed the light out. Amal's bunus died, and with it, her access to magic. Chapter 8 For two days Connell's army swarmed north, moving as quickly as possible, yet not so fast as to tire. He spent most of the time either with Lorcan or Story, discussing battle plans, and listening to their counsel based upon years of experience. Of his special concern, was remaining unnoticed for as long as possible. Scouts had been deployed well to their front and flanks, to provide early warning. Likewise, Connell had the two mages pay attention to the skies for messenger birds. Corla wasn't especially happy to be relegated to birdwatching, and decided to check in with Kaelin, only to have to listen to his boastful exploits of getting to ride a dragon, and some adventure in a pub where he threw a table at some of Torian's soldiers. The way he told it, he was having the time of his life. And here she was, bored, playing second fiddle to some old woman and looking for birds. Connell frustrated her. Why couldn't he see that she was far more valuable than merely birdwatching, or checking to see what Gwen was doing? She was a mage, a powerful mage, and when the time came, she would show him. But it was more than that. Ever since he told her to call him Connell, and she had politely reminded him that he was a lord and she was a mage, he became distant, almost brusque, especially when that woman showed up claiming to be a mage. As if reading her thoughts, Madeline sidled up next to her and spread her lips in a root-stained smile. Don't worry, dearie. Your secret's safe with me. What secret? That are new at this mage business. Just started, have you? Corla glared at her. I was born to be a mage. Madeline barked a laugh, shook her head, and dropped back so that Corla rode alone, stewing at the insult. Riding behind them, Connell saw the exchange, wondering why the old woman was picking in Corla. He was tempted to ride up beside her, but didn't want to have to deal with her moods. Madeline dropped back far enough to ride alongside Connell. Relax, young lord. She grinned. I know what I'm doing. Up till now all her training's been schooling. Never had to kill a man, don't know what it's like to take a man's life, and don't know what it's like to lose her family. She's unsure of herself. Just making sure when the time comes, she'll be ready. By picking on her? He looked at Corla, whose sour expression hadn't changed. It's what she needs. She shrugged. You'll see. Unconvinced, Connell was about to question her teaching methods when he noticed a rider approaching. The man circled around Connell and reined in his horse to ride beside him. Forward scouts have made contact, my lord. 
Per your instructions, two scouts have ridden into the enemy's camp to report to the enemy commander. Good work. Go back to your position. Connell's worry increased. Everything depended on Hafgan, believing they were Fern's army. Yes, my lord. Before the rider had spurred his mount forward, Connell turned to Voldar. Tell story we're stopping. I want to hear what the enemy commander has to say before we get much closer, but he needs to be prepared in case we have to attack. As Voldar sped off, Connell issued the same instructions to another courier and sent him ahead to Lorcan. Ten minutes later both Story and Lorcan came riding up. Once the scouts have returned, we'll know how to position. It's a dangerous game we play, my lord. I pray my scouts are not betrayed. I know. Connell fretted, and for the next hour, nervously waited for the two scouts to return, occasionally looking up the scattered billowy clouds in the early afternoon sky. Every now and then he thought he saw a hawk, and would shoot a glance at the two mages, whose lack of interest told him not to worry. Story and Lorcan had returned to their armies to reposition security in anticipation. It was with great relief when Lorcan returned with the two scouts. What news? Connell's eyes were bright with excitement. It was a piece of cake, my lord. The one scout was a wiry man with russet hair and beard. We rode in, like we were glad to finally be there. They took us to the commander straight away. She's a tall one, strong and demanding. She started to interrogate us a bit, asking where the rest of us were. But we acted the part. The other scout was the same height as her male counterpart, sinewy with auburn hair. I greeted her and said that Commander Firan sends his respects and asks where she wanted him to position his forces. That seemed to flatter her. My impression was that she wasn't keen on him being there. They've got the city under siege but they're spread thin. They've concentrated most of their forces at the main gates. They were halfway finished building a battering ram when we left and positioning catapults. Could you tell the size of her forces? The two scouts exchanged a look before the woman spoke. From what we could tell, my lord, they were less than half what we got. Yes. Look who I found wandering around. Story rode up with Drustin and a woman of aristocratic bearing. Drustin, where have you been? You've missed all the excitement. Good to see you too, my lord. He smiled. Since when have you been so formal? Drustin shrugged. You are who you are. My lord, this is my near, a half-druid like me. I have been absent due to discovering her whereabouts. When I explained who you are and what you were doing, she insisted on helping. Connell immediately understood, greatly pleased. You are most welcome, Miner. Thank you, my lord. Miner was a comely woman with long raven black hair that cascaded down her shoulders and contrasted sharply with her milk-white skin. She wore the raiment of a huntress, brown leather breeches tucked in darker brown boots, a forest green v-neck, short-sleeved top of finely woven cotton, and a thin gold circlet holding her hair back. Two crossbows dangled from the pommel of her saddle. So what's your plan? Minor, Madeline greeted as she rode up. By the gods, it's wonderful to see you again. And you too, Madeline. She offered a warm smile. Turning to Connell, she added, You are indeed fortunate to have a mage with her powers with you. We have another. Connell pointed to Corla as she eased her mount into the mix. So I see. Minear's words caused Corla to grimace. What is your plan? We infiltrate and attack them from the inside. Seeing the confused looks on the newcomers' faces, Connell explained, Their commander thinks we're the forces of her compatriot from down in Blazingdon, come here to help her attack Gorwick, which she presently has under siege. Lorcan and his army will move into the enemy camp and pretend to set up bivouac. Meanwhile, Story's forces will position themselves to attack from the opposite direction. Would you like our help? Absolutely. Connell noticed Drustin's lips tighten. That is, if you'd like to. I trust you to best place yourselves where needed. Thank you. Drustin nodded, giving Miner a look of irritation. What about us? The young'un and me? I'm not a young'un. We don't know if she has mages with her, 
so I'll need you both to be on the lookout for anything strange. You know best how to deal with that. Looking pointedly at Corla, he said, Listen to her, and do what she says. What? Corla stiffened, her nostrils flaring. I'll not. Yes, you will. Either that or go back and find that brother of yours with Gwen. Dismissing her from his attention, he turned to the others. Time to get ready. While Story positioned the dwarven army to the east of the city, Lorcan and his soldiers moved up the main road toward Gorwick. Connell and Lorcan placed themselves towards the rear of the army, with the plan of getting as much of his army in position before the deception was discovered. Connell searched for Drustin and Minor, but no one knew where they were. Much to Connell's surprise and advantage, Hafgan was preoccupied with placing the catapults and berating those constructing the battering ram that she didn't want to be bothered with the new arrivals, expecting Furin to come to her. It was a battle of personalities, as she expected to be the overall commander. Yet when Furin failed to show up, she sent someone to look for him. Connell was in conversation with Lorcan when Hafgan's emissary arrived, haughty as his commander. The emissary, a plump staff officer who flaunted his position, rode up and flashed a condescending glance at Connell and Lorcan. Where's Firin? The man arched his back and cast a slow regal glance at the surrounding bivouac. He's not here. Well, where is he? Scratching his head, Connell frowned at Lorcan. I'm confused. Was it my turn or yours to watch him today? Lorcan shook his head. You know I'm not sure. Tell you what, I'll flip you for it. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a coin. Heads is my turn, tails is yours. Two out of three. Two out of three it is. Lorcan had no sooner flipped the coin in the air when the emissary barked. By the gods, what is wrong with you two? Do you know who I am? As Lorcan caught the coin and smacked it on the back of his hand, Connell stared intently at the man, shook his head and turned to Lorcan. Well. Lorcan removed his hand and sighed. Heads? Advantage yours? He flipped the coin again. Did you hear what I said? Connell raised a hand at him to be quiet, though his attention was on the coin on the back of Lorcan's hand. Hold on. Tails? Connell swiveled his head to grin at the emissary. One more tells the tale. Oh the suspense is mounting. The crowd grows quiet. I don't believe this. I said the crowd grows quiet. Lorcan flipped the coin once more and happily announced, Tails? It's your turn? Ah well. Connell sighed with disappointment. As usual, I never win anything. Turning back to the emissary, he knitted his brow at him. What were you saying? The man snarled. Do you know who I am? Nope. Connell turned to Lorcan and hooked a thumb at the man. Do you know him? Lorcan shrugged. Never seen him before in my life. What are your names? You don't know who we are? Connell acted as though surprised. Of course not. I guess that makes us even. Listen, bub, tell Her Highness that if she wants to see General Furin, she needs to come here. What? General Furin? Who does he think he is? Where is he? I will not stand for this insubordination. He went to spur his horse forward when Connell grabbed the reins. I wouldn't do that if I were you, friend. The emissary's eyes blazed at him, but movement out the corners of his eyes caused him to look up to see a dozen or more soldiers with death in their eyes heading his way. Wheeling his horse around he galloped away, yelling back over his shoulder. You'll pay for this. Lorcan chuckled. Well played, my lord. Well played yourself. Now let's see if we get any reaction. It wasn't long before the emissary returned with a dozen soldiers who fanned out behind him. I demand to see Firin. Connell looked at him, then the soldiers with him, before snorting a laugh. Really? You come here with twelve soldiers to compel the general to go with you? Are you that stupid? Like I said before, tell Her Highness that she needs to come here and take your kids with you. He craned his neck to look up at the early evening sky. Besides, it's almost dinner time. Tell her to come by after dinner. But, but, Firin has to come now. She commands him to come. She commands him. 
Connell's face hardened. Listen, Junior, you and I are stuck in the middle between two stubborn commanders. You do realize that this will go on all night until one of them sucks it up and goes to see the other. Tell you what. Let's see if we can get them to meet in the middle between the two armies, sort of neutral ground. That way both their vanities can be salved, and maybe we can get on with taking the city. Do you agree? The emissary pondered a moment before nodding. What you say makes sense. I'll be back. Connell watched him ride away, the soldiers with him relieved that that they were not needed. Lorcan stepped closer to him and lowered his voice. Story should be in position by now. Good. I want to wait until it's almost dark before we attack. Ten minutes later, the emissary was back. What did she say? The man sighed in frustration. No change. She wants him to come to her. I figured as much. Tell you what. Why not stay for a bit, have something to eat with us, and when she wants to know what took you so long, you can say that you were arguing for her. We've got excellent cooks. The man grinned. That's the best offer I've had today. He dismounted and stepped closer to Connell and Lorcan. Name's Keeve, Captain Keeve of Commander Afghan Staff. Welcome, Captain. I'm Connell, and this is Lorcan, commanders in this army. Turning to a soldier close by, he said, Take Captain Keeve to the kitchen. Make sure he gets the royal treatment along with our best ale. Yes, my lord. Keeve stiffened. My lord? It's a sort of running joke. Lorcan gave the soldier an evil look and intoned. Most people only say it behind his back. He looked back at Keeve. I'll tell you the tale when we come back to join you. Keeve nodded in understanding, assuming it was some foolish act done in the ignorance of youth. Allowing himself to be led away, he was soon separated from his horse, only to discover no one was cooking anything. All too quickly he was tied and gagged. That was close. Casting another glance at the darkening sky, Connell was about to announce their attack when he saw two enormous shapes fill the sky, followed by an alarm in the enemy camp. Yet the alarm was late, for billows of fire suddenly erupted from the dragon's mouths as they descended and swept across the enemy's encampment. Chapter 9 No. Emil's horrified scream echoed off the wrecked buildings along the street. Gwen could only imagine what she must be feeling. With the Bunus destroyed, Emil would never again feel magic coursing through her. She slumped to the ground, tears streaming down her cheeks. What did you do? I took away her power. But she's still a threat. We need to keep her close. The last thing we need is her running off to report to Torian. What about the guards? Gwen looked around them and shrugged. What about them? Not these ones. Kaelin waved a hand at the surrounding city. Judging by the bell towers, I'm sure we'll be surrounded soon. Gwen was torn between staying to spread their message of need and leaving the city to wait and see who showed up in support. Lyra shifted back into her elven form and forced Emil to her feet. We should get moving away from here. Let's get closer to the noble district. There should be less chaos there. They marched up the street together, Lyra pushing Emil and keeping watch over her. Gwen glanced at her rival and saw she was listless, moving along only because Lyra forced her to. For a brief moment she felt pity for the woman, but then she reminded herself of what Emil had done in Alaval, and the pity quickly fled. Gwen turned her attention ahead, where a battle was raging. Commoners were fighting against armed soldiers. The soldiers were outnumbered, but they held the advantage with better weapons and armor. We'll go around. We have to help them. They'll be slaughtered. And we both know we started this. You two go. I'll stay here with Emil. Gwen hesitated for a moment, then sprinted toward the battle. Kalen ran beside her, a boyish grin plastered on his face. An overturned merchant wagon was in the street, its fresh fruits spewed everywhere. As the press of bodies grew, they stomped on the goods slicking the cobblestones. One person slipped and fell, and was promptly stabbed in the chest by a soldier. Kalen went for him, tackling the man to the ground and using the power of his steel skin rune to crush the soldier's helm along with his head. 
Blood sprayed through the slit in the helmet, splattering Kaelin's face. Gwen's stomach churned at the sight, but she ignored her revulsion and grabbed a hold of a soldier, ripping his helmet off and casting him aside like a rag doll with her might rune. He slammed into the wagon, his face cracking hard on one of the wheels. More soldiers joined the fray, but they were still outnumbered as Kaelin tore through their ranks. He picked up a sword from a dead soldier and became a whirlwind of death. He thrust and spun, blocked and dodged, his footwork a blur of movement. Gwen could see why Kaelin wanted to be a warrior, he was born for it. Her attention was diverted as a soldier came around the wagon. He wielded a hefty axe and swung at her, narrowly missing as she backpedaled and summoned her fire rune. A wave of heat and flames struck the soldier and sent him reeling into the cart, which caught fire. Gwen backed away as the inferno spread, and the battle momentarily lapsed as the heat forced everyone away. Kalen shielded his eyes with his free hand and drove one of the soldiers into the flames. His screams filled the air as his armor heated, melting flesh and hair, the stench fouler than anything Gwen had smelled before. The remaining soldiers retreated, turning and fleeing into the noble district. The crowd of people shouted a cheer of victory and gave chase. Kalen rushed along with them, and Gwen looked back at Lyra, concerned about their group getting split apart. Lyra waved her on and motioned to the east. I'll meet you outside the city. Do what must be done. Her voice penetrated Gwen's mind, jarring and unexpected. Her words were like a headache, pounding with each syllable. Gwen nodded and followed the mob, pushing through until she was beside Kalen. He was covered in blood, gore and sweat and was barely recognizable. He added his voice to the cheering, as one of the escaping soldiers fell and was trampled to death. Gwen thought it was all madness. There was so much blood and death. And yet she knew it was a necessary evil. Torian would not give any respite, and she was determined to do the same. If her conscience was scarred, so be it. If she had nightmares for the rest of her life, but the people were free from tyranny, so be it. It would all be worth it in the end. It had to be. The crowd continued to grow as the word spread throughout the city. Farmers came with their pitchforks and scythes, metal workers wielded hammers, and others had collected weapons from fallen soldiers. The ragtag band of common people slashed and burned their way through the noble district, killing the soldiers and rounding up the nobles. Gwen convinced the people to take them as prisoners, finding some solace knowing that not everyone would be killed. As the hours passed, more and more of the city fell under Gwen's authority. Soldiers began surrendering or fleeing the city entirely. The few who tried to fight were crushed immediately, their bodies drugged through the streets as a warning sign to those who would side with Torian. By the time Gwen's army reached the Duke's castle, the city was hers and the Duke willingly opened his doors. Gwen didn't spare him. The people wanted his head, and she gave it to them. The mages from the Great Library have arrived, Lyra informed her. With the city won, she and Kaelin cleaned themselves and washed their clothes in the Duke's chambers, then organized the people into two groups, those who would stay in Wespen and those who would march on Havengard. Gwen appointed leaders among the people, and took account of the men and women that would be marching with her. She was disappointed to find that their numbers were only 2,000, but knew it was much better than where they had started. Kaelin chose a handful of people as personal guards for Gwen, and they escorted her outside the city to meet with the mages. As Gwen approached, she spotted a mage that stood out from the others. He was tall, towering over everyone else by at least a foot. His head was bald and his arms were covered in runes. The man's most prominent feature was his hooded eyes. They captured her attention and sent a chill down her back. He wore flowing robes that were dyed a vibrant blue, and he smiled broadly when he spotted her. Quinley. He bowed low. I am Menging, your majesty. It is an honor to join your cause. My mages and I are at your service. The honor is mine. And please call me Gwen. Menging's smile grew bigger. The librarian mentioned you might say that. Very well, Gwen. What is your wish? My wish. Gwen's brows knitted with her confusion. Yes? What do you want us to do? All right. We've secured the city and have an army of 2,000 men and women who will march with us to Havengard. 
You will help me with drawing the attention of Torian's mages. We will be a diversion and keep him focused on us until Connell and his forces can strike from the west. Very good. How will we serve as a diversion? Will we attack the walls to enter the city? That would be the ideal situation. Though I don't want to assume it will be as easy as it sounds. Many of my mages are offensive casters. We will overcome the walls of Havenguard like the waves overcome the ship. Gwen found his description poetic, but she doubted Torian and his forces would be so easily defeated. What kind of runes do they have? Our runes range widely. We can call fire and lightning, run like the wind, and shatter stone like glass. Those are only a few of our talents. Are they battle-tested? It's one thing to say you can kill a man, and another to do it. Trust me, I know firsthand. There are a few who have seen battle, but most of their hands have not seen blood. Menjing saw Gwen's frown and added, But do not worry. They are capable, and want to see Eisenthal change for the better. Gwen was worried he might not know his mages as well as he thought, but they were the only spellcasters she had. We will leave in the morning. You'll find lodging and food in the city, but try not to let them overindulge. A sour stomach and a headache will make the trip worse than it already is. As you command. Menjing bowed again. As the darkness of night covered the city in shadows, Gwen met with her army's leaders one more time to go over the many details she had no experience with. Supply lines, materials for their camp, and a weapon shortage were talked about the most. By the time the details had been finalized and Gwen was able to get some rest, she fell asleep immediately. Morning came, and Gwen opened her bleary eyes to see Kaelin standing over her. For a moment she forgot where she was and sat up quickly. A glance around the room reminded her and she breathed slower, trying to calm her racing heart. What news? She yawned and rose out of bed. She had been so tired she'd slept with her boots on. Corla says Connell and his forces reached Gorwick. That's good, right? Yes. Kaelin smiled. Would you like me to fill you in after you're fully awake? Gwen scowled at him. No. Tell me now. They've passed themselves off as one of Torian's companies and have made contact with someone named Hafgan, apparently one of Torian's commanders. Corla seemed distracted, so I didn't get much out of her besides that. And I kept seeing images of an old woman. Kalen shrugged. We need to get moving. It'll take Connell at least two days to reach Havenguard, and we need to be there before him. I've already met with the others, and everything is in order. All we need is your word. You have it. When Gwen had heard that their forces only numbered at 2,000, she knew that wasn't enough, but also that it didn't seem like much. As the procession began the march north, Gwen realized that 2,000 people was more than she thought. The line of people stretched on and on, making her wonder how they would reach Havenguard with any element of surprise. They marched all day, stopping just before dusk to set up camp and rest. The next day started slowly, as most of the people were sluggish and exhausted. Gwen tried to be patient, and had to remind herself several times that these people weren't disciplined soldiers. She wasn't a soldier either, but she also wasn't the same ignorant girl who had left Dosbury. After another day of travel, the walls of Havenguard were within view. The fortress jutted up from the ground, an unnatural structure amidst a wild, untamed landscape. Her motley army set up camp safely away from the place, out of range of arrows and hopefully, magical attacks. Kaelin forged ahead to scout the area near the castle, and ensure there were no hidden surprises. Night fell, and Gwen sat in her tent, unable to sleep. There was so much uncertainty, and Kaelin couldn't get a hold of Corla, which made her worry that something was wrong. She absently traced the lightning rune on her hand as she stared at the wall of the tent, her mind roaming endlessly. A sound outside broke her reverie, and she looked up as a hooded figure stepped into her tent. She thought it was Menjing, but then she saw the body of one of her guards on the ground outside. Her heart skipped a beat, and before she could summon the magic of one of her runes, the figure drew a sword. My master Grimar sends his regards. Chapter 10 Get ready. Connell raised his voice above the tumult in front of the city. 
Raging fire consumed catapults and battering rams while soldiers staggered and fell, flames engulfing their bodies. A few archers launched feeble attempts to bring down a dragon, but mostly dodged the spewing flames. Connell turned an excited eye to Beto who stood next to him, a ram's horn in his hand. Now Beto. Beto raised the horn to his lips and blew three loud blasts. As Lorcan's army surged forward and Story's dwarves emerged from the forest, Beto stepped in front of Connell. General Lorcan told me to remind you that your command, my lord. The runes tingled on Connell and he paced like a caged animal, the urge to join the battle tormenting him, but he forced himself to take deep breaths and remember who he was. Yet one part of his brain argued how could his soldiers respect him if he wasn't in the middle of the fray, while the other part argued that he was in charge and responsible for every soldier in his army. His army, the thought startled him for up to now they had been Lorcan soldiers or Story's dwarves. But combined, they were his army. Sure, once he gained control of the kingdom, he would have his own dedicated soldiers and Lorcan and Story would return to their own kingdoms, but for now he was in command. A pulse of vanity flashed through him, until he remembered he was responsible for the lives of thousands of soldiers, that thousands of soldiers looked to him to make wise decisions, especially when it came time for battle. The thought sobered him, and the raging torment to fight lessened. I need to get to a vantage point. He shifted a glance around to find a high point somewhere. Besides the city walls, my lord, I don't see anything around. Madeline walked up, nodding thoughtfully at him. Can't feel a thing. Which means? No mages around. That's good, isn't it? If times was normal, I'd say yes. But times ain't normal. If you was attacking a city, wouldn't you use mages? Yes, I would. Where's Corla? Madeline rolled her eyes. She's looking for a secret entrance to the city. What? Why? Connell redirected his attention to the battle which was no longer much of a battle, as the dragons had wiped out over half of Hofgen's army giving Connell's forces a lopsided victory. Madeline shrugged. His mind already dismissing Corla, Connell urged his horse forward, his bodyguard moving in sync with him along with Madeline, Beto and Torgrith. They were met halfway by Lorcan comfortably seated on his horse, leading a defiant and chained Hafgan shuffling behind him. You have won another battle, my lord. Giving her a brief glance, Connell smiled at him. Status? Don't have a final status yet, but the severest injury we have so far is a sprained ankle. He shook his head with admiration, then held up the chain. This is their commander, the dreaded Hufgan. Connell stared down at her. She was a tall, muscular woman who was not unattractive. She wore the battle dress of a commander, padded leather pants, tall boots, and a thick leather vest. Why are you here attacking innocent people? When she didn't answer, Lorcan yanked her chain causing her to stumble. Our commander Lord Connul asked you a question. She sneered. Commander, this young pup knows as much about battle as I do about cooking. Lorcan grinned. Yet here you stand, brutally defeated I might add. She said nothing, but her scowl remained. Why did Torian want you here? What was your mission? When she didn't answer, he leaned forward. Do you who I am? Of course not. I am Connell, King Cameron's son. You know who he was? Afghan suspiciously eyed him. Cameron in dead, so are his children. Wrong, dearie. Cameron had two children. But you know that. That's why you're here. You were supposed to draw him out and kill him. She suddenly turned to Connell. That's why there are no mages here. Torian knew you'd have some with you, and mages here would have alerted you. That was your mission? Connell huffed in feigned disbelief. To draw me out? To kill me? You. You and your puny army were never any match for my armies. Bravely spoken, sitting there high on your horse. You think you're a match for me? You really think you can defeat me? She sniffed. I'd carve you like a cold chunk of ham. Connell slid down from his horse. Unchain her and give her a sword. Lorcan startled. My lord? No. Do it. Lorcan hesitated, yet saw the fire in Connell's eyes. 
Flipping the chain to one of the bodyguards, he said, Unchain her. Find her a sword. Afghan rubbed her wrists, shaking her head at Connell, as she smiled at his stupidity. Now at least, she had the opportunity to fulfill her mission. Another bodyguard found a sword, tossing it to her before stepping back to form a circle. Noting the circle of a one-on-one -on -one match, others of Lorcan's forces joined in watching, surprised though admiring Connell's bravery. Seeing the battle-proven enemy commander, many thought his decision foolish. Connell reached into his saddlebag and pulled out two sets of iron bars connected by a short length of metal chain. Beto looked at Madeline. What are those? Don't know. Never seen them before. Lorcan frowned at the strange contraptions. Do you not want a sword, my lord? No. I'll use these. Afghan snorted a derisive laugh. You will fight me with those? You make it too easy for me. We shall see. Connell smiled, silently praying his nunchuck runes didn't fail him. Moving to the center of the circle, he began spinning his nunchucks by his sides. Gauging the spinning bars, Afghan sniffed in scorn and took the first step to press the attack, only to find the bars spinning at Connell's side were now crisscrossing in front of him like a windmill. Brought up short in her attack, she fainted left, then attacked to his right. With his left hand, Connell flicked a nunchuck at her head causing her to overreact and lean backwards out of the way. In that instant, Connell attacked his blur of speed, leaping and spinning midair as the other nunchuck whirled in a wide powerful sweep and embedded with a crack on her ribcage, resulting in an audible grunt of pain. Afghan reeled backwards, her breathing suddenly exploding pain and her strength compromised. She lifted her sword too late as the metal bar smashed into her head, and the world turned black as she crumpled to the ground. Connell stood over the prostrate body, staring at the indentation in the woman's skull. She was still alive though unresponsive, blood seeping from her nose and ear. You really think you could defeat me? He pulled up his sleeve and revealed the tattoo on his shoulder. I'm the Cobra of Prophecy. I can't be defeated. The revelation was electric, and word spread amongst the armies faster than any messenger could ever deliver. The Cobra of Prophecy was their commander. What do we do with her, my lord? Lorcan stared at the woman crumpled on the ground. We finished the job. She was sent here to find me and kill me. She was willing to destroy an entire city just to get to me. Dropping the nunchucks on the ground, he grabbed her head by her hair while reaching for the stiletto in his boot. In one quick motion, he sliced her across the throat, wiping his blade across the fabric of her pants to clean it. He glanced up to see Lorcan's look a mixture of stoic understanding and disappointment. What would you have me do? I nearly killed her with these alone. He picked up the nunchucks. I crushed her skull. There is no survival. Oh sure, she might live for a couple of days, weeks even. I have seen people injured like this, stonemasons who failed to pay attention when a stone dislodged and hurtled down to destroy their lives. The lucky ones die immediately. The unlucky ones lingered, the pain worse than dying. He dipped his head to look at her. I did her a favor. I know, my lord. Lorcan nodded. It was necessary. What's truly sad is that under different circumstances, she could have been one of my commanders. Torian's poison must be cleansed away. Madeline pointed at the dead woman, then narrowed her gaze at Lorcan. She had a choice just like you. You chose to fight. She chose to stay. Not everyone's tainted by Torian. Those who chose to yield to him are just as evil as he is. Story strode up, looking pleased and disappointed at the same time. While I'll take a win any day, it wasn't much of an effort. He glanced down at Hafgan. What happened to her? That's Commander Hafgan. She decided to fight Konul. Story blinked as his gaze switched between Connell and Hafgan. He noticed the nunchucks in Connell's hands. You use those? Yes. I've seen those used once before. Very dangerous weapons when used by someone who knows what they're doing. You're just full of surprises. Connell grinned and shrugged. What's your status? We're all fine. Story chuckled. Like I said, easiest battle I've ever been in. The dragons were a nice touch, 
especially since no one has seen a dragon for hundreds of years. Almost terrified us as much as the enemy. How'd you manage it? Connell thought about Drustin and Minor, deciding they would reveal their dual status when they were ready. Pure luck. I'll explain later. Let's go see how the city fared. The city gates were still closed when they approached. In fact, the city was much too quiet. One would expect jubilation, especially anyone witnessing the crushing victory of the army that just rescued the city. The peephole slide in the smaller door within the left gate door scraped open then closed, and the small door pulled open, and a plump man stepped out with an ingratiating smile as he pulled the door closed behind him. Thank you so much for rescuing this city. He spoke as though repeating lines he had memorized for the occasion. We were in such dire circumstances before your timely arrival. Yes, you came in the nick of time. Thank you. He started to turn away when Connell stopped him. Whoa there, mister. Who are you? The man turned back, offering the same ingratiating smile. I am the burgomaster of the city. Are you all okay? Yes. Everything is fine. Do you have enough to feed your city? Connell wondered why the man seemed so anxious to get back inside. Yes. Everything is fine. Connell frowned at him then said, We will need supplies. The man's eyes widened. Supplies? Yes. Supplies, flour, water, meats, things like that. The burgomaster's ingratiating smile vanished as he wrung his hands and started talking to himself. Supplies. They never said anything about supplies. That wasn't part of the plan. They said it would be easy. He'd show up and she would kill him. Then everything would be fine. Never said anything about supplies. This is madness. Story stepped towards the door causing the burgomaster to yelp and rush in first, vainly attempting to close the door behind him, before Connell kicked it with such force that it sent the man sprawling on the ground. Connell stepped inside followed by the others. However once inside they abruptly stopped. For there in the open space between the city gates and the interior walls were several sets of gallows, a body dangling beneath each rope. One set of gallows contained what looked to be a family, father, mother, and three children all under the age of ten. Looking to his left, more gallows filled with limp bodies lined the street as it curved its way into the city. What happened here? The burgomaster's eyes filled with tears. They killed a dent of the city, then herded the rest east towards Havengard, my own family among them. We could do nothing to stop them. They said that if anyone said anything about what happened here, they would all die. Why? You are the son of Cameron? The burgomaster gazed at him, his shoulders settling in resignation. Yes. Exhaling a long-suffering sigh, he wiped a tear away. With bitterness in his voice, he clenched his jaw. Then it no longer matters, for my family is condemned. She was supposed to kill you. He promised that once you were dead, everyone would return. Lorcan scoffed. And you honestly believe that? Wake up man. Your family was doomed before they set foot out of this blighted city. He pointed at Connell. This man is your only hope. He's more than a king's son. He reached up to touch the sleeve covering Connell's tattoo. With your permission, my lord. None needed. Connell pulled up the sleeve to display the snake's head that shimmered with a crimson sheen. He's the cobra who will defeat Torian. The reaction was what Lorcan had hoped, for the burgomaster dropped to his knees. By the gods. It's true. Save my family, my lord. I'll do my best. Bending down to grasp him by the elbow, Connell lifted him to standing. Now tell me what happened. Twenty minutes later, he had heard enough. So there's no army close by. That's what I overheard, my lord. Furin was supposed to join Hafgan here and wait for you. Once you were eliminated, they were to proceed west. At least that's what I could make out. And the families they moved out of Gorwick left several days ago. Yes, my lord, headed for Havengard. They should be closing in on the city by now. Connell frowned at Lorcan and Story. Why would Torian want the distraction of civilians in Havengard, 
civilians who don't even live there. Dragons and hostages. Drustin walked up, Miner beside him. By now, Torian is fully aware that dragons do exist and that they are on your side. I imagine is betting that you won't use them when you attack Havenguard, for fear of killing innocent women and children. Which would negate the advantage of having dragons. Exactly. Where have you two been? Connell gazed knowingly at them. Scouting. By the way, there's an army to the south headed this way. Chapter 11 The figure exploded into motion. He lifted the sword in an overhead chop, bringing the blade down toward Gwen. She rolled aside at the last second and scrambled to her feet, rushing to the other side of the tent. The assassin came after her, wildly swinging his blade, the sword smashing into everything around him. Gwen turned to face him and summoned the magic of her speed runes. She spoke its name, then charged ahead, slamming into the assassin. They both went flying, crashing into the center poles of the tent. They splintered under the force, and the canvas collapsed on top of them. A cry of alarm echoed through the camp, followed by shouts and the sound of steel ringing upon steel. Gwen crawled under the material, trying to navigate her way to freedom. She heard the material rip, and then something heavy landed on her. It was the assassin. He pummeled her with his fists, striking her over and over. She stifled her groans of pain, and blindly tried to grab onto him through the material. It was soft and she couldn't get a strong grip. Latriot. She pushed against him with everything she had. The weight was gone. She clawed at the canvas and finally pulled it off, emerging to a sight of chaos. Over a dozen tents were burning. Robed figures, more of Grimar's lackeys, were cutting their way through her army, heading for Lyra. She transformed into her dragon form and roared as she stomped the ground in anger. Gwen spotted Kaelin. He was gathering a group of people, stopping those who tried to flee and bringing them together. The assassin who'd attacked her was back. She had no idea how far she'd flung him, but he approached calmly. Clearly she hadn't injured him. He spun his sword around with skillful comfort and threw his hood back. He was much older than her, and atop his head where hair should have been, the skin was covered with runes. You made a grave mistake in coming here. Gwen didn't bother with a reply. She lifted her left hand and spoke the name of the lightning rune. A lance of blinding white energy left her palm, forking through the air. In the blink of an eye, the assassin twirled his blade and deflected the bolt into the sky. Gwen watched in amazement as the lightning flew high and disappeared. Is that the best you've got? He stalked around her in a circle, continuously spinning his blade, alternating from hand to hand. Your master was too frightened to come himself? The man laughed. Hardly. Dealing with someone as pathetic as you would be overkill, so why would Grimar trouble himself? Gwen launched another lightning bolt at him as a distraction, then used her speed runes to close the distance between them. Her might rune invigorated her, and she punched him hard in the chest. She felt his bones crack under the blow, but she didn't stop. As the assassin fell backward to the ground, Gwen followed through with a wave of fire. His robes were incinerated instantly, trails of smoke wafting up from his charred remains. Gwen stood there heaving in deep breaths. She was getting better at cohesively using the runes, but it drained her strength considerably. A look around the camp revealed that more tents were burning now. Kalen's small group had doubled in size, and they were working to put out the fires. Lyra roared again, but the tone was different. It sounded pained. Gwen scanned the darkness and spotted the dragon. She was surrounded. A host of robed figures were encircled around her, but there were other people there too. They were oddly clothed with glowing runes on their arms, and one of them jabbed a spear at Lyra. Gwen expected it to shatter as it struck her scales, but instead, the tip of the weapon pierced her chest. Gwen cursed and ran for her. Kaelin called out to her, but she ignored him. As she neared Lyra, she saw a pile of dead bodies on the ground. One was holding a sword and she snatched it up, then drove it into the nearest mage. It was a woman. She crumbled to the ground with a bloody gurgle. The others turned to face her and drew their swords. Gwen jerked the blade free of the dead mage and held it up before her, having no idea how to wield it. 
blood dripped down the blade and onto her hands. She'd rushed to aid Lyra, but now she was second-guessing her decision. She was outnumbered, one mage against a dozen or more. There. Gwen looked over her shoulder to see Kaelin. He pointed, and his group of fighters swarmed toward the enemy. The mages turned their attention away from her, and she rushed toward the people attacking Lyra. She targeted the one with the spear first, swinging her sword at him in an awkward motion. The man brought his spear up to block her strike, and the sword collided with the thick wood, sending powerful vibrations into Gwen's arms. Somehow the blade hadn't carved through the spear. Gwen's hands trembled violently, and she dropped the sword. What was she doing? She wasn't a warrior. She grabbed onto the spear. Tyne. The spear caught fire. The man howled as the flames licked at his fingers, and he tossed the spear aside. Gwen grabbed him by the throat and looked him in the eyes. Drayan Sawil. The man's eyes bulged as his life was sucked away. Gwen drained him quickly and dropped his lifeless husk to the ground. The rune wanted more, demanded more. Gwen turned to meet the charge of another man. This one had no weapon, but he came at her anyway, his eyes filled with madness. She used her might rune to snap his neck, ignoring the yearning that the drain life rune pulsed through her. The ground rumbled ominously beneath Gwen's feet. One of the mages had cast a spell similar to the one Amel had in Wespen, and the ground heaved upward as it split open, swallowing several of Kaelin's men. Gwen struck the mage with a lightning bolt. He was too focused on his own spell to defend himself, and his sizzling corpse sailed through the air before tumbling along the ground and skidding to a stop. Gwen spun around looking for the next enemy, but Kalen's men had subdued or killed those that remained. Lyra was on the ground, a pool of blood soaking the dirt around her. Gwen rushed over and knelt beside her head. Venia! Can you hear me? The dragon's eyes were half open. Her chest rose and fell as she breathed, but the blood continued to seep from the wound caused by the spear. I'm fading. The dragon hunters have poisoned my blood. I feel it burning through me even now. Can you heal yourself? Gwen felt anxiety rising within her. It had been a while since she'd experienced the feeling. Just as when Tobias had died, she felt helpless. I tried. You can't die. We need you. And we're so close. We're here at his gates. Gwen pleaded with her, but Venia's eyes started to lose focus and her wounds stopped bleeding. Oh no. Gwen stroked her hand along the scales on Venia's face. The magic was tugging at her, but she tried to ignore it. She knew the dark rune wanted to steal more life, but she refused to answer its call. The magic grew more insistent, to the point that it was starting to give her a headache. Gwen closed her eyes, intending to focus on the magic long enough to shut it out of her mind. And then she realized it wasn't the dark rune calling to her. It was the life rune she'd received from the elf in Alaval. She remembered what the elf had done, restoring the vitality of a vine, and she opened her eyes. Perhaps she wasn't too late. She laid her hands on Venia's face. Sayol. Energy flowed forth from Gwen and into Venia. The dragon was like a dark well, and the energy vanished as it reached her. Gwen refused to give up, sending more and more energy into the darkness. She was already drained, and the river flowing out of her was exhausting what she had left. Gwen could feel her eyes closing. She fought to keep them open, to stay alert, but the darkness was so inviting. She startled, one of her hands slipping off Venia. Several blinks seemed to help at first, and she replaced her hand on Venia's snout. There was no air coming in or out. Instead of feeling panicked, Gwen was content. As her vision faded, the last thing she saw was a faint light beginning to glow at the bottom of the well. When Gwen regained consciousness, it was dawn. She was lying on the ground under the open sky, a thin blanket draped over her. Sitting up, she saw Lyra was gone. A few guards were keeping watch, but the rest of the camp was silent. Nearby, Kalen lay sprawled out on his stomach, snoring loudly. The events of the previous night were a blur in her mind, but she remembered enough to piece together the fact that Grimar had sent assassins after her and Lyra. Gwen rolled her head around, stretching her neck. She'd slept on a rock, and now her neck was sore. 
She flung the blanket off and stood up, rubbing the sleep from her eyes. Kalen. He continued snoring, so she walked over and kicked his foot. His eyes snapped open and his body tensed, but when he saw it was her, he relaxed and offered a tired smile. I wondered if you'd ever wake up. He rolled over onto his back and lifted his hand to shield his face against the morning glare. You stayed out here the whole time? Someone had to keep an eye on you. You were asleep. I literally just closed my eyes. Kalen stifled a yawn and got up, brushing his clothes off. You expect me to believe that? You were snoring like a hog. Fine, fine. Maybe my eyes were closed for a little while, but the camp was in good hands. Besides, we both needed the rest. The gods only know what Torian's going to throw at us today. What? You didn't like his welcome party. Gwen rolled her eyes. They almost killed Venia. Kaelin grew somber. I know. She left a few hours ago. She said she was hungry enough to eat an entire field of cows. I'm just glad she's all right. That's thanks to you. You healed her. Fragmented memories floated above the haze, and Gwen nodded slowly. I remember. Sort of. They tried to kill you, but they also tried to scare off our army. It didn't work. Nobody fled. Well, I wouldn't say that. There were a handful of deserters. I can't fault them. These people aren't ready for what they will see today. A runner arrived and bowed low to Gwen, then looked at Kalen. Sir, this just arrived. He handed over a folded parchment. Kalen opened it and read over the contents. Torian is demanding we hand you over. He looked up at her. He'll grant a pardon for everyone who marched here if we do. Gwen made a noise in her throat. He's a fool if he thinks it will be that easy. Gwen stared at the castle, eyeing the walls and trying to determine the best plan of attack. Wake the mages. Tell them to report to me as soon as they've had breakfast. Kaelin looked at the runner. Do as she says. Yes, sir. The runner sprinted away. What's the plan? To bring hell to Torian's doorstep. Chapter 12 To Connell's good fortune, the army approaching from the south was two regiments from Clagmoran's home guard, commanded by a thick-necked bulldog of a man named Austin, who barged in to where Connell and the others stood outside the gates of the city, demanding, Which one of you is Connell? That would be Lord Connell. Lorcan pointed, politely correcting him. Oh, I uh, never said anything about that. My apologies, my lord. Austin glanced around to see which one was the lord. Apology accepted. Connell offered a tired smile. Expecting to see an older man, Austin cocked an eyebrow in surprise. Ah. Lord Kilmarin sends his respects, wishing he could send more, but the security of the kingdom is equally important. I am thankful Lord Kilmarin was able to spare so many. He curved a hand at Story and Lorcan. General Lorcan and General Story are my primary commanders along with Commander Sorka. You will command your soldiers as the fourth division of this army. Coordinate as you see fit. We leave in the morning. Yes, my lord. He smiled with contented excitement. War Council in twenty minutes. Be there. Yes, my lord. Where are we meeting? Connell glanced up at the too close city, the ghosts of the innocent dead seeming to hover at the open gates. Looking back over his shoulder at the charred remains of the battlefield, he smelled the acrid stench of burned bodies, then turned to Story. How about we meet at your tent? As you wish, my lord. Story was pleased with the specific attention. I'll meet you there then, but first I need to talk to Drustin and Minor. Madeline and Corla, I also want you two to stay. Recognizing the tone of dismissal, the commander slipped away to coordinate boundaries and liaison officers. Connell turned a sharp eye to Corla. Don't ever go off on your own again. What you did was stupid. I told you to stay with Madeline, and that is where you will stay from now on. Understood? I was only trying to help. She flushed with embarrassment at being chastised in front of the others, especially Madeline. 
You can help by being where you're supposed to be. Had I needed mage support, no one knew where you were. Connell then turned his attention to the two druids. I hope you know what you're doing. While I appreciated the attack on Hofgen's army, you put yourselves in danger. Was that smart? It was expedient. Taking the battle to Hafgan on your own would have taken too much time. Yes, you would have won, but at what cost? You now have your army intact and ready to go. Suppose some errant arrow found you like it did Bryak. We have greater protection as dragons than humans. Wait, what? Corla startled, her embarrassment forgotten. Your dragons? Madeline shook her head with maternal patience. Yes, dearie. They are shapeshifters. You're a mage. You should know about that. I do. I mean, I've read about them, but I've never seen one in real life. She stared at them with fascination. Let's save it for later. Connell turned back to the two druids. While I'm not happy about you two in the battle, I can still use your talents, specifically in scouting ahead. You can range farther and faster than any of my scouts. We can do that. Drustin nodded. Connell regarded them a moment longer. Are there any more coming? They're on their way. Hopefully, they should be here in the next couple of days. Nodding thoughtfully, Connell said, Would you mind doing a sweep once more before you turn in for the night? No problem. We'll wake you if we need to. As the two druids drifted away into the night, Connell turned to the two mages, shifting a pointed finger at them. I have a feeling that once we get into Isenthal proper, you two will be very busy. He narrowed his gaze on Corla. When was the last time you talked to your brother? Just a little bit ago. Gwen has taken Wespen. She has about 2,000 followers with her, mostly civilians. They're on the move to Havenguard. Connell sputtered. 2,000? How is she going to attack Havenguard with 2,000? He began pacing. This is madness. She'll be destroyed. We've got to hurry. He says she has some more mages from the library with her. I don't know what that means. We've got to move. Madeline placed a hand on his arm. It means she has some very powerful magic with her to make up for the lack of a real army. In this instance, their magic will more than offset the weakness of her army. Unconvinced, Connell shook his head. That may be all well and good, but we've got to get to Havenguard before Torian can throw all his effort at her. We need to make some noise to draw off as much of his part attention and forces as possible. He abruptly spun around and headed off to Story's tent. Corla huffed. Well, that was rude. Madeline glanced up at her with a look of pity. Now's not the time to sugarcoat things, dearie. You got your underthings all twisted and can't figure out why he's not goo goo eyes over you. All you have to worry about it yourself. She swept a hand at the vast array of campfires and activity. He's responsible for all of this. He's a future king. You. Like you said, are just a mage. Connell burst into Story's makeshift tent, a tarp raised up with a couple of poles. We got to move. Gwen's attacking Havenguard with 2,000 civilians probably armed with pitchforks and brooms. Is she crazy? I know, but we're gonna have to get going, march through the night. You dwarves, while you can't match strides with a man, you can march farther without rest. You can go days on end. That's one of the many things I admire about dwarves. You're strong. That we are, my lord. Story was flattered. A word of advice. Please. Let everyone rest for now. Give them a couple of hours to sleep, and they'll be stronger later. We forced March to get here. A few hours rest now will save us time later. Torn between rushing off or listening to the wisdom of a soldier, he opted for wisdom. Besides, he was tired himself. What good would it do to exhaust everyone? A few hours' nap would rejuvenate them all. I defer to your wisdom, my friend. Cancel the planning meeting tonight. We can do it in the morning while we're traveling. Smart move. Story grinned. We can move out a couple of hours before dawn. That'll give us plenty of time. 
spread the word. Connell sent several of his bodyguards to deliver the message, and he headed back to his own tent. As he strode through the camp, soldiers seeing him pass by called out greetings, and he felt their confidence in him. He prayed he didn't let them down. Beto had a small pup tent set up for him, with a bedroll unfurled inside. He yawned. Get some sleep, Beto. We'll be getting up early. Yes, my lord. Beto waited for Connell to stretch out on the bedroll, before wrapping a thick woolen blanket around his shoulders. Settling onto the ground in front of Connell's tent, he curled an arm under his head and closed his eyes. Though tired, Connell's mind wouldn't settle and he tossed. He was sure that he had just fallen asleep when he felt a nudge and heard Beto's voice. Time to rise, my lord. Connell sat up and rubbed his eyes. Crawling out of the tent, he heard the rustle of activity as fires were doused, bedrolls tied up, tents dismantled. Yawning, he shivered in the morning briskness, silently wishing for something hot to drink. Numbly standing there watching Beto tear down his tent, he felt someone behind him and turned to see Drustin and Miner approaching. Anything? It's quiet all the way to Sinbriar. How far is that? About halfway to Havenguard. Connell frowned. Seems too quiet. Shouldn't there be some sort of military presence between here and Havenguard? You forget that you've destroyed two of Torian's armies. Unless he knows his back door is open, he'll assume everything is fine. Connell's frown remained. He has to have some sort of communications with his military in the West. How is he doing it? That's something you need to ask your mages. Miner shifted a look at Drustin. Let's find a place to rest. Drustin nodded, then told Connell, We'll catch up with you. I doubt we'll have a difficult time finding you. Be careful. Connell was suddenly feeling protective. Drustin replied with a warm but tired smile. We will. Lorcan passed the two druids, giving them a nod of friendship, and came up to Connell. With your permission, I'd like to send out scouts well in advance of our forces. Do what you think best, my friend. By the way, Drustin and Miner say it's quiet all the way to Sinbriar. Lorcan's initial reaction was to ask how they knew. Choosing to keep his own counsel, he said, That should help us move quicker. I've chosen several scouts who know the area and can walk into towns along the way without drawing suspicion. I like it. Connell nodded, immediately understanding. I want to place the mages farther forward. It's been too easy so far and I don't like it. Something's not right. Connell shook his head in misgiving. I have this feeling like we're being watched from afar. I can place them with my forward elements if you wish. That way they'll be far enough forward and still have protection. Connell mused for a moment. What's the chance of us gaining more bodies as we march through Eisenthal? There has to be more people like you, willing to take a stand. We'll see as we get closer to Haven Guard, my lord. Connell nodded. I guess we will. Are we ready? Yes, my lord. Let's move. We'll do a war council wherever you are. Once I track down the mages, I'll send them to you. Momentarily left alone, Connell glanced around in the darkness, hearing the muted commands and movements of bodies to places in the order of march. The fact that he was in charge sobered him, and he was mindful of all the wisdom his father, his real father, the one in Hervé who had chosen to love him like a real son, had preached at him. In this moment he wished he had his father by his side, for the man always seemed to have the right answer, and he would know what to do and how to do it. Connell chuckled, remembering a dictum his father would often say, when working toward a solution to a problem, it always helps if you know the answer. His musings were interrupted when Madeline walked up with a still half-asleep Corla in tow. It's too quiet, my young lord. When I was in Blazingdon, I could feel Torian's presence. Not his exactly, but his wizard's work if you know what I mean. It was like a thick foggy morning, where the mist is so heavy it clings to you. I felt it here for a bit but now it's gone. It's like his eye is turned elsewhere. Connell immediately thought of Gwen, and locked a gaze on Corla. Have you heard from your brother? Not since the last message I gave you. Be careful, young lord. Madeline placed a hand on Connell's arm. 
Mind messages can be intercepted, especially by them that knows it's happening. I'm not saying you don't need to know what's going on. I'm just saying it might be best to leave well enough alone. If he's occupied somewhere else, all the better for you. Sound wisdom, Madeline. He nodded, suddenly worried that all the previous chats the twins had might have been compromised, which might mean that he was being lured into a false sense of confidence. I want you two up with Lorcan's forces. He'll position you where I want. I need all the advanced warning we can get. Madeline smiled in understanding and turned to Corla. Come along, dearie. Let's see what mischief I can keep you out of. What are you talking about? Corla grumbled as they walked away. Despite Connell's misgivings, the combined armies made excellent time, arriving at Sinbriar in the late afternoon. All the stress of scout reports, overhead searches for messenger birds, and frequent checks with Madeline revealed nothing out of the ordinary. The several towns they passed through, alarmed at the soldiers, were hesitant about providing either supplies or information. Connell was angry at first until Story pointed out, They don't expect us to win. You can't blame them. They've been living under Torian's thumb for so long that they no longer have hope, and they're not about to get their hopes up because some stranger shows up claiming he's going to defeat Torian. Nothing will change until Torian is truly gone. Connell sighed. You are right, as usual. We rest here. War Council at your tent in an hour. Before Story I had a chance to reply, Corla came racing up. Torian knows we're here. What? How? Corla leveled an I-knew-it-all-along look at him. Madeline. She's been working for Torian since the beginning. Chapter 13 the mages from the Great Library stood in a line facing Havenguard. Gwen glanced at them, then turned her attention to the stone walls that protected the castle. She shifted her stance impatiently, as she waited for Kaelin to contact his sister. Despite her initial aggravations with the man, he had quickly proven his worth and had become her trusted right hand. She looked over her should. Lyra still hadn't returned. She told Kaelin she was going to find food but that had been a few hours ago. The dragon should have been back by now. Gwen was worried something had happened to her, and offered a silent prayer on her behalf, hoping that she hadn't been caught by dragon hunters. Good news. Kaelin smiled as he approached. I hope so. Corla says Connell and half of his forces will be in position outside of a tunnel that leads into the city. They're waiting for us to draw attention to ourselves. You mean we haven't already? Gwen smirked. Where's the other half of his army? They're heading for the West Gate, led by someone named Lorcan. Gwen vaguely remembered him from the meeting in Haddens. Good. Torian will be hard-pressed to defend his castle. What's wrong? Nothing. You look uneasy. What is it? Lyra still hasn't returned. I'm worried about her. She's a dragon. She can protect herself. You should be worried about us. His words made Gwen realize she was thinking foolishly. He was right, Lyra was fine. Probably. I guess we'll have to attack without her. How many archers do we have? Not enough. Two dozen maybe. Do you think they can hit anything from here? No. Kalen didn't even hesitate with his answer. Then we need to get closer. How far can your shield stretch? I've never tried covering more than two people. But I like to push boundaries. Try to shield the archers. I'll have Menjing and the others get closer. If the archers can take down some of the soldiers on the wall, we're better off. Once we blast a hole in the wall, it's going to get bloody. I'll do my best. Kalen jogged off to collect the archers. Gwen called for Menjing. The tall man looked at her as she strode over to him. We need to get closer to the wall. Is that going to be a problem? That is no problem. How much closer do you want us? Gwen eyed the distance. A hundred feet or so. That'll put us within the range of their archers, but ours can't reach them from here. Do not worry for us. We are ready. 
Menjing told the woman next to him, who passed the word down the line. They began walking together, moving ahead as an organized unit. Gwen waited for Kaelin and the others, then marched with them. You should be at the camp, to direct your army. You shouldn't tell me what to do. Besides, I'm not a leader. The people we chose are better equipped than I am. Kaelin opened his mouth to argue, but Gwen gave him a hard stare and he kept quiet. As soon as the mages were within range, a volley of arrows came hurtling at them. One of the mages raised her arms and the arrows flashed brightly, the wooden shafts incinerated. The steel tips showered to the ground, their pattering reminding Gwen of a hailstorm. The archers grouped behind the mages, and Kaelin motioned to them. They readied their arrows. Our turn. Fire. The return volley was pitiful in comparison, and a third of the arrows didn't make it halfway to the wall. Those that did struck an invisible barrier, and simply fell from the sky. Gwen looked at Kaelin and shook her head. We can try again. Let's alternate. Magic, then arrows. Gwen whistled. Menjing and the others raised their hands toward the castle. There was a moment of silence, and then a chorus of runes was spoken. The ferocity of the magic made Gwen wince and back up a few steps. Lightning bolts, balls of flame and spikes, glowing orbs of energy, and many other magical bombardments lit up the sky. Gwen held her breath as the barrage struck the wall. Except, none of the spells landed against the wall. Like the arrows, they hit the unseen barrier and fizzled out. Menjing glanced back at her, his uncertainty evident. Gwen nodded at him, and they fired off their spells a second time. Again, the magical attacks were thwarted by the barrier. Gwen rushed ahead to join Menjing. What is that thing? Anti-magic. It's the work of a sorcerer, maybe a wizard. Anti-magic stops arrows too. It would seem so. Should we retreat? No. We need the focus on us, until Connell is ready. Keep attacking, but not all at once. And reserve your strength. The real battle won't start until we're inside. Gwen turned to leave, then paused. Can you tell if the person casting the anti-magic is on the wall? Mila might be able to. She has a rune that gives her farsight. More arrows filled the sky. The mage who'd stopped the first volley raised her arms and incinerated them again. Menjing summoned the woman he'd mentioned, and she hurried to the front of the line. Can you see the one who shields the castle? Mila looked toward the castle and spoke the name of Arun. Her eyes went completely black. A few seconds later, she blinked lazily and her eyes returned to normal. Yes. The magic flows from a prestige near the middle. He's surrounded by soldiers and two mages. We need to get rid of him. Let me talk with. A roar drowned out her words and she whirled around, looking to the sky. Lyra had returned, along with three other dragons. Two were blue and the third was jet black. They flew overhead and continued toward the castle. The blue dragons opened their mouths and blasts of lightning flew forth. Lyra breathed fire, and the black dragon spewed a sizzling wave of acid. A cheer rose from among Gwen's camp. Magic arced over the walls, followed by a barrage of arrows. The projectiles bounced harmlessly off the dragons, but a few of the spells struck the blue dragons and they screeched in anger. Lyra bellowed loudly, and the dragons turned away from the castle and landed at the camp. Gwen looked at Menjing. Continue assaulting the walls, but remember what I said. Reserve your strength. She ran back to the camp, leaving Kaelin with the archers. Lyra was conversing with the other dragons as she approached. You're back. Gwen looked at the dragon's chest for signs of the wound. Lyra's scales were flawless. Gwen's eyes widened in surprise. I went to find food and found allies. Lyra lifted a claw and ran it over her scales where she'd been wounded. Your magic is powerful. There's no scarring at all. I wasn't even sure if it would work. You have done a great service to me but also for my kind. I am still able to bear eggs, and once we have the city back, I will help restore our numbers. Gwen wasn't sure what Lyra meant about having the city back. She was just glad to see the dragon was healed and hadn't been captured. Menjing says there's a sorcerer on the walls that's keeping us at bay. 
We need to make some noise so that Connell can enter the city unnoticed, but we need to find a way to get past that barrier. Lyra looked toward the castle and hummed lowly. The barrier cannot be removed unless the sorcerer breaks the spell or dies. I vote death. As do I. We can drop a few people on the wall. The rest will be up to them. Won't the barrier keep you from getting close enough? The barrier blocks magic but not living things. As long as you humans don't mind free falling a short distance, you'll be fine. Gwen smiled, knowing just the person to lead such a risky endeavor. I'll get a team ready. She returned to where Kalen was and told him the plan. His face lit up like a young child on Yuletide. Please let me go. The job is yours. Pick a few people to go with you. Once you land, do whatever it takes to get rid of that sorcerer. If you can at least break the spell and make him retreat, that's better than our current predicament. I'll do that and more. Be ready for my signal. What's the signal? You'll know when you see it. Gwen wasn't sure she liked that answer, but she decided to trust him. She just hoped he didn't let her down or die as Tobias had. Kaelin pulled the archers back to the camp since they were useless, and handpicked seven people to go with him. Lyra was confident that each dragon could hold two people while flying near the walls. The small team armed themselves and climbed onto the dragons, all but Kaelin exuding a strange mix of excitement and fear. He was enjoying himself immensely. The dragons leaped into the air, their powerful wings pushing them higher and higher. Gwen rejoined Menjing and his group, deciding to add her magic to the diversion. As one mage finished throwing a spell at the wall, the one beside them would go next. It kept a continuous barrage hitting the barrier, while also preventing the enemy from shooting any more arrows. Tintreach! Gwen shouted, sending a bolt of lightning from her palm. Shadows passed overhead as Lyra and the other dragons sped toward the walls, diving down sharply at the last moment. Gwen couldn't see much, but she did spot the small forms leaping from the backs of the dragons and landing thankfully atop the walls. The mages continued their assault, changing the aim of their attacks toward the lower portion of the wall in case Kaelin was successful. The minutes ticked by and Gwen tried not to worry. Kaelin was a capable mage and an exceptional fighter from what she'd seen, but his stone skin rune didn't make him invincible. The sorcerer is gone. Dead. Gwen looked at Mila, who shrugged. He's no longer at the wall, but I can't say if he's dead. The barrier should be down now. All together. This time, Gwen summoned the lightning and the fire runes, back to back, adding her magic to the chaotic mix of the other mages. Every spell struck the wall. The camp behind them cheered again, and Gwen allowed herself to be optimistic. Now that Kaelin and the others had dealt with the sorcerer, where were they? He was smart enough to stay out of the way of their magical attacks, but where would he go? The entire city was crawling with Torian's men. She gritted her teeth and pushed the growing doubt aside, throwing herself into the magic. They needed to blow a hole in the wall to allow the army through. Despite the combined power of their runes, the walls merely blackened under the assault. They weren't making any progress. One of the mages pointed and shouted something unintelligible. Gwen looked seeing nothing at first. Then movement caught her eye. The portcullis over the gate was rising. Gwen's eyes widened. Kaelin was opening the gates. Gwen sprinted back to the camp. Two arms. She wasn't sure if that was the correct thing to say. We march on the city. The army was small and untrained, but they drew their weapons and shouted war cries. They were ready, Gwen knew. Ready to deliver vengeance for all the years of tyranny at the hands of Torian and his evil followers. Gwen grabbed a sword and was about to lead the charge when a sound from behind their camp stopped her in her tracks. Her heart felt like it dropped into her stomach. The ground began to tremble, and another sound overtook the first. Someone turned and pointed. Oh, Holmes. Chapter 14 Madeline? Connell cocked an eyebrow in doubt. I don't believe it. Where is she? Gone. Last anyone saw her, she was heading for Havengard. I bet if you ask the scouts, they'll tell you the same thing. 
Are you sure? She didn't say anything? Yes. She said it was time to get back to where she belonged, and then started walking up the road to Havengard, walking at a good pace I might add. You didn't try to stop her. I... I couldn't. Why not? He frowned. Because she's more powerful than I am, okay? Satisfied? She crossed her arms and glared at him. Story's frown deepened, and he turned to Connell, hooking a thumb at Corla. What's her problem? Still processing Madeline's departure, Connell shook his head. This doesn't make sense. She destroyed Furin's army. Why would she do that? Just to make me believe she was on our side. It wouldn't surprise me. Those poor fools. All those years of training, weeks and months spent away from family, only to be used as toys for someone's blind ambition. He turned a hard eye on Connell. When the time comes, and I pray it comes soon, that Torian comes to you in chains and begs for mercy, remember his crimes. He gave no mercy and deserves none. The same applies to those who willingly chose to serve him. Just like a dead tree cannot grow again, they must be ripped out at the roots. Connell shifted a glance at them. This goes no further. I want no one else to know, except Lorcan. The woman's a traitor. She had you hoodwinked. He's right. Story pointed a finger at her. Now be quiet, woman. You know nothing of military matters. What good would it do to tell soldiers who are about to fight and possibly die that the mage they trusted was a traitor? Is that how you inspire people to follow you? And speaking of you, what makes you think they won't believe the same thing about you? Corla's eyes popped wide. But I'm not a traitor. So you say. Story swept a hand at the assembled armies of men and dwarves. Tell that to them. Corla swallowed and blinked in understanding. Connell looked directly at Corla. If anyone asks, Madeline's gone on a mission per my orders. No elaboration, just that she's gone because I have her doing something for me. You don't know what then change the subject. Understood? She sighed in frustration. Yes? That's yes, my lord. Corla glanced away so she wouldn't have to look in his eyes as she said, Yes, my lord. Story stroked his beard as he mused aloud. She knows our strength and our position. And about the dragons. Them too. Our element of surprise is gone. Not entirely. Anyone seen Drustin and Minor yet? I haven't. Connell curled a hand at them. Come on. Let's go find Lorcan and the others. After explaining Madeline's disappearance, Lorcan and Story increased perimeter security in addition to sending out patrols. Drustin and Miner arrived while they were issuing orders. Connell explained their situation. Madeline's gone and our presence here is compromised. Gwen's committed to battle in the east. We have to attack to take pressure off her. You two know the area. What's the best avenue of approach to Havengard? The fastest way is straight up the main road. Not exactly what I had in mind. If Torian knows you're here, what does it matter where you attack from? It would be nice to have at least one surprise. Drustin gave a slight smile. You do. We brought some friends with us. Out of the darkness five figures emerged, three women and two men, all dressed in the garb of huntsmen. Drustin began introducing the women. Lord Connell, this is Derith, Tesney, Amzir. These two are Ailes and Gowan. As each was introduced, they gave Connell a respectful bow. Derith was a striking svelte woman with crisp facial features and long black hair. Tesney was a buxom brunette, a handspan shorter than Derith. Amshir was the same height as Tesney, with blonde hair tinged with emerald highlights that seemed to shimmer in the night. Ellis was tall and muscular with a thick neck and close-cropped hair. Though a head shorter than Ellis, Gon's broad shoulders and brooding face gave him an imposing presence. Two things were unique to them all. Their eyes, coal-black with pupils like the occasional flicker of simmering coals, and the numerous runes imprinted on their skin. There are seven of us here. Four more are standing by to employ where needed. Miner glanced quickly around to see who was in earshot. 
Motioning Connell and the others to close in, she lowered her voice and said, One more thing that ought to be mentioned. Dareth says there is a way into the city, and then into the castle. She motioned Dareth to join the group. There is an entrance. As far as I know, it hasn't been used for many decades. The last time I was there was before Cameron's grandfather was born. How old are you? Corla's words earned her glares from the others. Sorry. How do you know about this entrance? Story was suspicious. Dareth is Princess Dareth. Her parents ruled in Havengard before the hunting. She will rightfully rule again when the time comes. How long will it take to get to the entrance and then into the city? Connell's hopes were rising. I will lead them. It should not take long provided your soldiers are strong. It is through the mountains. Sounds like dwarf territory. Story grinned. It is for dwarves carved it for us an age ago. The hallways and caves are large so an entire army of dwarves can easily pass through. Though it has been a long time since I walked those hallways, I have never forgotten my home. That means splitting our forces. Connell pensively nodded. I know, but it also means getting someone into the city and castle without them knowing. He peered intently at Dareth. How far is it to Havengard? You can be there well before dawn if you left now. How long from here to Havengard for those not going through the mountains? Six hours. Connell thought quickly. We attack at dawn. Story and his army will go with Princess Dareth through the mountains. Lorcan and the remaining combined forces will continue this avenue of approach. He shifted his attention to Druston. I'd like to split your group between the two. Agreed. Mynir and I will remain with Lorcan, along with Tesni and Elis. Amzir and Gowan will go with Story. What about you, Milord? Lorcan already knew the answer. I'm going with Story. Both Lorcan and Story were about to argue when Drustin spoke. An excellent idea. That will get the king's son inside the city before Torian realizes it. I have no doubts that there are enough in the city who are ready to rebel. What about me? You go with Lorcan. He'll need mage help as soon as Torian sees the army. Though disappointed she wasn't going with Connell, she was also keenly aware that Torian's mages were far more powerful than she was. Even Madeline was more powerful. Suddenly feeling inadequate, she meekly nodded and tried to blend in with the others. If we leave now, Story and his army will have a few hours to rest before the battle. Connell turned to Lorcan. You know better what to do than whatever counsel I could offer. As soon as the sun's rays rim the mountains, attack. He stretched out a hand, grasping Lorcan's hand. We'll meet up in the city. Hopefully we'll have the gates open by the time you get there. If not, improvise. Watch yourself, my lord. Lorcan gave Connell a firm handshake. Once Torian discovers you're inside the city, he won't stop until he finds you. And your sister. Torian is just a man. He needs to worry that I don't find him first. Turning to Story, he said, Don't worry. I'll stay out of your way. We serve you, my lord. Story hoped Connell would be true to his word. Then we better get going. While Lorcan gave his soldiers an hour's rest, Dareth led Story's dwarven army along the road to the northeast, a road that would eventually connect with a main road out of Havengard that went due north to the human kingdom of Tool Cragbeorn. Amshur and Gaan lagged behind towards the end of the dwarven army, scanning the area and occasionally drifting off then reappearing. Walking beside Dareth, Connell noted she moved with a fluid grace even at the pace they marched. Why are you so intent on helping us? He said it without thinking. There are so few dragons left. It's dangerous. She cast a sharp look at him. Havengard was my home long before humans took it over. Will you return it to use or will we have to fight you too? Startled at the brusqueness, Connell replied, Hadn't really thought about it. I've been a little busy of late, and to tell the truth, I hadn't even thought about what happens after Torian's gone. But I do know threatening me isn't exactly endearing your cause to me. The way I see it, there are eleven of you left. 
humans and others eliminated the rest. Seems to me that your threat of continuing the battle only ensures your complete elimination. That caused her to stutter step, but she quickly recovered. They walked in silence for a bit before she spoke, though it seemed an effort to be polite. You are right, of course. I was wrong to imply any such violence, for it is true that we are at your mercy, hoping that you will do what is right and honorable and restore Haven Guard to its rightful owners. So a kingdom within a kingdom. And what else will you demand? How much of Isenthal will you claim belongs to you? Now see here. Isenthal was ours long before you humans took it over. And who did you take it from? Are you saying there was no one here when dragons decided, hey, this looks like a good spot? Why don't we build a city here? So you admit Haven Guard is a dragon city? I'm not arguing that dragons had dwarves build Haven Guard. I won't even ask if they were threatened or volunteered, though it does cause me to wonder what treasures dragons had that they hadn't taken from someone else and used as payment, if that's what happened. Darith's nostrils flared. How dare you impugn? Come down off your high horse, princess. Or did you forget that I am a king's son, and when I regain my throne, a king? My family has reigned in Havengard for over a hundred years, a hundred years when no one believed dragons still existed. We can talk claims to the city and the kingdom all we want, but the truth is that I have more resources at my disposal than you do. Darith's mouth clenched and she stared straight ahead. For the next hour, as the evening's light slipped away to darkness, neither spoke, and Connell wondered if he hadn't stepped over the line, that perhaps Dareth was leading them into a trap. But then, logically, she'd still have to have his and Gwen's support to defeat Torian. It was when Dareth abruptly stopped, that an idea he had germinating, began to blossom. A half-moon's light gave shape to the forest on both sides of the road. We're here. Dareth pointed into the forest on their right. Follow me. Connell continued to contemplate his idea, so much so that he blindly followed Dareth dodging trees, crossing small streams, and clambering over rock formations as the trail she blazed continued to climb. Another hour later she crested on a wide rock shelf covered in vines. Hands on her hips she sighed and shook her head. I can't count the number of times I came out here. She tugged at several vines and pried them apart. Connell and others pulling and prying to give them space to get an army through. When enough space was created, Dareth plunged into the darkness followed by a flash that lit a torch on the wall. How'd you do that? Connell was impressed. I'm a half-druid, remember? She lifted the torch out of the wall holder and handed it to a nearby soldier. Torches line the entire hallway. Light only enough to find our way. Soon, Enough torches provided dim light showing the ceiling of the hallway was a good fifty feet above them. Connell immediately wondered how long it took to carve this from the stone of the mountain. This tunnel will get us into the city. I will get us close to the entrance so that we may rest before the attack. Lead the way. Story grinned. Standing inside the mountain and seeing the work of his ancestors filled him with a comfort only a dwarf would understand. Connell caught up to Dareth. I have an idea. Yes? I will return Havengard to you in return for your help. You already have my help. Not this time. What I mean is, how much of Isenthal was yours? About half of it. Dareth's hopes were beginning to rise. Which half? Does it matter? Human towns now occupy all parts of the kingdom. True. However my thought is this, to start off you reclaim Havengard. Obviously, you don't have enough dragons to enforce your presence. However, over time, that will remedy. But until then, you will need help, so we enlist anyone who wants to stay. However, it will be dragon law that rules. Okay. As dragon numbers continue to increase, you expand over a specified area that has been demarcated as the Dragon Kingdom. In the meantime, since the seat of my kingdom is no longer in Havengard, it will need to move elsewhere. Likewise, I am losing a good chunk of my kingdom. So, I need to make up for that loss. How? She looked at him and cocked an eyebrow. Tiermanic. What about Tiermanic? 
You will help me take Tyr Manic. You're going to conquer another kingdom? Her frown deepened. Tyr Manic has been under Torian's spell for years. My other family was murdered, and Tyr Manic did nothing to prevent it or complain about it. The present king is still under Torian's thumb. This will be justifiable reward for betrayal. Dareth tilted her head to the side as she led them past side corridors, through large vaulted rooms, and up and down wide sets of stairs before slowly nodding. I agree to your proposal. Though frankly the affairs of men are of little concern to dragons, as long as we are left alone. Good. We can hammer out the details later. For now, where does this come out? It comes out on the southwest side of the city. The city is built against the mountains. She went on to describe the layout of the city. One street ran along the length of the city walls, stopping well before the citadel. There were seven main thoroughfares that fanned out from the citadel all the way to the walls. With the citadel as the focal point, descending concentric rings of streets connected the main thoroughfares. The castle is much like the city with wide hallways, doors, archways, stairways, and anything else you would imagine for a dragon to move comfortably in the castle. The castle sits higher above the city and there are many levels within the citadel, arranged in concentric circles with hallways connecting each circle, just like the city streets. The throne room is in the center, a grand affair with a raised dais where the dragon king used to hold court. It is the throne room your father and your grandfathers used. I do not know how Torian has it arranged, but it will be hard to catch him unawares because he will see you before you can get close. Not for the last time. Connell wished his highwayman days had brought him here. It would have made things a lot easier now. Wonder how Lorcan's doing. When we begin our attack, I will have Gowan find out where Lorcan is. Thank you. To Connell's surprise, Torgrith came running up. Story asks how much farther? We are almost there. Dareth led them up a flight of wide stairs that thirty humans could have walked up, side by side. True to her words, she stopped on a broad platform before a set of grand double doors almost as high as the cavernous ceiling, and not quite as wide as the set of stairs. The city lies on the other side of these doors. We can rest now. A few moments later, Story came up and gave the doors a doubtful look, especially at the door handles well above the reach of any dwarf or human. Who's going to open the doors? Don't worry. I'll make sure the doors open when needed. Connell glanced around as the dwarves settled in groups and quietly chatted or stretched out where they were. How do we know what time it is? Story shot him a smug look. A dwarf always knows what time it is, especially inside the mountains. We made good time. We got another hour and a half before we launch our attack. I've got a regiment ready to open the gates for Lorcan. Amshur and Gaian came up and drew Dareth aside to chat quietly. Amzir says that Lorcan's army arrives unnoticed. How does she know that? There is more than one secret way into the city. The attention is all to the east where your sister and her mages have engaged Torian's magical forces. Let's pray his attention stays there. For the next hour and a half, Connell tried to relax, but his pent-up nerves wouldn't let him, and he was actually relieved when Story said, It's time. I'm sure Gaan and Dareth joined to stand before the doors. Give us room. Lots of room. Connell's story and the dwarves scooted back off the platform to fill the stairs up to the edge. Connell saw the reddish glow of the runes on their forearms begin to shimmer, brighter and brighter, until the forearm was a swath of color. And then the transformations occurred as the human forms bumped and bulged and twisted, as three dragons expanded to their original forms. Dareth was a large coal-black dragon, with cobalt-blue eyes and wings the color of shimmering onyx. Amshur evolved to just a little smaller than Dareth, an emerald-green dragon with eyes the color of liquid gold. Stout Gaan was the surprise for he was almost twice the size of the other two, all muscle and power, his scales the color of dazzling amethyst, and eyes that blazed bright orange. A hush of wonder rippled through those who watched the metamorphoses. Dareth stood on her hind legs and reached for the door handle, then turned to Connell and Story. Ready. Then let's do it. With a yank the doors silently swung wide. Chapter 15 
Turn around. We're being attacked from the rear. Gwen rushed through the camp to the other end, hoping the approaching army didn't outnumber hers. How would they pose a distraction now? She tightened her grip on the hilt of her sword and stared at the impending mass. Something wasn't right. The army was too uniform, too perfect. A mounted rider broke away from the group and thundered ahead, coming straight toward Gwen's position. She lifted her hand, prepared to blast the rider from his saddle with lightning. The rider drew closer and closer. Gwen held back her spell until she was sure she wouldn't miss. And then she saw it. The finely crafted armor and the unique helm. That was elvish armor. Gwen lowered her hand and sprinted forward. The rider wheeled the horse around in a circle, coming to a stop as Gwen reached him. Kirith. A smile spread across her lips. I'm not too late then. Kirith slid off his mount. He removed his helm and tucked it under his arm. Just in time actually. We're about to march into Havenguard. Kaelin managed to get the gates open. Excellent news. Kirith looked past her to the gathered men and women and raised a slender brow. This is your army. It's small but it was all we could muster. That's not a problem, I just don't think they are outfitted for an assault. I'll have my forces take the lead. He looked back at Gwen. If that's all right with you. That's fine with me. We need to hurry though. Connell is about to enter through the western side of the city. Kirith retrieved a horn from his saddle and put it to his lips, then blew three short notes. His army split down the middle, each side going around the camp, and they converged back as one force on the other end of the camp. Let us go and take Havenguard back. Kirith climbed back onto his horse and offered Gwen his hand. She grabbed onto him and he pulled as she jumped, landing in the saddle behind him. He snapped the reins and the horse sped toward the castle. Gwen shouted as they rode through the camp, giving the order to attack. Fall in line behind the elves. Kirith's army was mounted and therefore faster, and Gwen's forces ran along behind them. The two of them rode past the line of mages and took the lead in front of the elven army, continuing to the open gate. As they crossed the threshold, Gwen spotted Kaelin and two others. They were covered in blood and running toward the gate. There's too many. Kaelin was breathless. Gwen pushed herself out of the saddle as Kirith slowed, landing awkwardly on her feet. She hurried over to Kaelin. What about the gate? Are the others guarding the lowering mechanism? No. The others are dead, slaughtered after we lifted the portcullis. I used my key rune to lock the door behind us, so that should keep them busy trying to get inside to room, but not for long. Reinforcements have arrived. Gwen pointed behind her toward the mounted elves. Kaelin looked, and the fear that he had seemed to melt away. He turned around and Gwen saw a line of soldiers coming toward them, all holding long shields in front of them, forming a wall of steel. You couldn't take them out on your own? Gwen cracked a grin. If it was only them that I had to worry about, then I would have already dealt with them. The sound of marching steps echoed off the buildings that lined the street signaling more soldiers were coming. The street was wide enough for two dragons the size of Lyra to walk side by side, and Gwen realized that everything in the city was built bigger than necessary. Kirith's mounted soldiers clopped onto the cobblestone street and began lining up beside one another, stretching across the entire width of the thoroughfare. Gwen and Kaelin moved out of the way, stepping into one of the buildings. It was a small shop, and the place was empty. Tools and other items were left strewn about, and Gwen guessed whoever had been there had left in a hurry to escape the attack. More mounted riders filed in behind their fellows until the line was six rows deep, then they began moving further into the city. Gwen glanced out at the gates and saw there were plenty more elves, but they were dismounting and entering the city on foot. We need to get to the castle. Gwen turned to Kaelin. I'm sure Torian is holed up there letting his soldiers do the dirty work. This place is crawling with them. I don't think we'll be able to reach the castle without having to fight our way there. Gwen figured that would be the case, but she'd been hoping to have some luck otherwise. The sound of battle outside replaced the echo of marching hooves and feet. Cries of both agony and victory mingled with the clash of steel. 
The real fighting has begun. Kalen's tone was grim. The elven soldiers on foot began passing by, rushing into the fray further down. Gwen watched as their numbers continued to pour down the street, surprised that Kirith had gathered so many men so quickly. She spotted Menjing among the crowd and stepped out of the building. Menjing. Over here. The mage glanced around and spotted her, then pushed his way across the street. His mages followed after him, and they converged inside the building. We need to reach the castle, but Torian's men are everywhere. Can you help us clear the way? Yes, we can escort you there. What of the sorcerer from the wall? He got away. We killed his mage bodyguards, though. He's probably gone to the castle. I'm sure Grimar will be waiting there for us. Torian will likely have his best soldiers and prestiges there. We're going to have one hell of a time getting inside. Gwen considered Kalen's words and wondered what kind of prestige Grimar was. If he was a wizard, they would certainly be outmatched despite their numbers. She looked around the room. Each person looked back at her expectantly, waiting for her orders. She didn't want this responsibility, but there was no one else to take the mantle. They had come too far to worry about death now. Does anyone know the layout of the city? Gwen's question was met with silence. Very well. We'll just have to figure out the best route as we go. If we follow the wall around to the castle, that should mitigate how many soldiers we encounter. Now that the gate is open, there's no need for the soldiers to man the walls. They've probably all been withdrawn into the city. Anybody opposed to that? Again, there was only silence. Let's go. Gwen and Kaelin took the lead, turning back toward the gate until they reached the wall, then they ran along the wall's perimeter. Gwen continuously glanced left, right, up, wanting no surprises and taking no chances. Overhead, the dragons circled over the city. Gwen wondered why there weren't down in the streets helping fight. There was certainly enough room for their bulk to land. Gwen looked over her shoulder. Menjing and his mages were keeping pace. The buildings to their left provided cover from the side streets, and Gwen didn't see any soldiers on the wall. It seemed Kalen's assumption had been correct. The castle was still a fair distance away. Gwen slowed to a brisk walk and tried to catch her breath, then asked Kalen, Has Connell entered the city yet? There was a pause, then Kalen nodded. Yes. Corla says they're inside the city. Connell's also headed for the castle. Is Corla as strong as you with her runes? No. She has potential, but she's too fearful. Then we'd better hurry. If they reach the castle before us, Grimar will slaughter them all. They returned to a jog, but Gwen didn't feel they were moving fast enough. Her impatience was itching under her skin. I'm going ahead. I'll make sure we're not entering a trap. Before Kaelin could argue, Gwen used her speed runes and left him and the others behind in a rush of wind. Her surroundings blurred around her, but as long as she kept her gaze straight ahead, she was able to see where she was going. The closer to the castle she got, the more she felt something heavy weighing on her. She tried to ignore it, but whatever it was would not be disregarded. It assaulted her mind with images, dark scenes of murdered dragons and large glittering eggs that had been destroyed. Her breaths were coming in short gasps, and her head began to ache. The pain pounded against her entire skull, and she saw tiny flecks of light shooting across her vision. She shook her head to clear them, which was a mistake. Her balance was thrown off, and she had the sudden feeling that she was going to vomit. Restore us, a multitude of voices spoke within her mind. Bring us back to glory. Who are you? Gwen gasped. She tried to slow down, but the magic was in full control. The voices in her mind were clouding her ability to cut the magic off. We are the dead, dragons who were murdered by men in this very place. Restore us, princess. Restore us and make amends. Murdered dragons. She didn't know what the voices were talking about. Their presence in her mind faded, and she had control over her body again. She skidded to a halt. Ahead the castle towered high into the sky. A group of soldiers guarded the entrance, and other groups were scattered around the courtyard. She was trying to count their numbers when something caught her attention to her left. 
She looked just as it slammed into her, knocking her into the wall. Gwen's body exploded with pain, and she collapsed to the ground. She looked up to see a tall figure dressed in black robes standing over her. The man smiled, but there was no joy in his expression, only gleeful madness. A jagged scar ran down the left side of his face, from his forehead down over his eye, ending at his jawline. His hair was dark auburn and cut short. He had no facial hair, and his eyes were green and bloodshot. Gwen had never seen the man before, but she knew who he was. Grimar the Mage Breaker Grimar held out his hand and the air rippled briefly before a massive battle axe appeared. Gwen realized that she wasn't up against another mage. No, she had the unfortunate privilege of facing off against a wizard. She risked a glance back the way she'd come, but there was no sign of Kaelin or the others. She cursed herself a fool, knowing she shouldn't have gone ahead without them. Gwen slowly pushed herself up and stood. Grimar made no move to stop her, and she didn't find that comforting at all. Her sword was on the ground at her feet, but she didn't dare make a move for it. Pick it up. It took Gwen a moment to decipher what he'd said. Why? So you can cut my head off while I'm not looking. Grimar laughed heartily, then shook his head. I wouldn't do that, little mage. It wouldn't be fair. And contrary to what you may think about me, I am a fair man. Gwen snorted. Right. Is that why your namesake is Mage Breaker? You are a prestige who murders other prestiges. There is no justifying that. Murder is the wrong word. Grimar tilted his axe. He ran a finger over the blade, cutting the flesh. A few drops of blood slid across the blade, and it began to glow with an eerie light. He grinned, a smile full of dark secrets and lies. I'm an executioner. Chapter 16 In the hour before dawn, three dragons led the dwarven army through the doors into what appeared to be a vast empty room carved out of the mountain. Glowstones lining the center of the ceiling gave dim light to the enormous room. At the far end was another set of doors made of stone. Where are we? Connell expected to be immediately in the streets and heading to the west gate. We are halfway between the west gate and the citadel. Dareth purposely slowed her pace so the dwarves could keep up. What is this place? It is a secret place, a refuge when Havenguard was still dragon home. We knew even then that man would not let us live in peace. Dareth stopped and glanced around the empty space. I remember coming here when Havenguard was falling. There were 75 of us then. We escaped the way we came in. Now there are 11. She turned a harsh stare on him. I have compromised our future because I trust you. We've already talked about this, remember? Connell bristled but then relaxed. Besides, I like living near the coast. Dareth frowned and resumed leading the way. Pausing at the doors, she said, These doors have not been opened in over 150 years. Reaching up, she pressed a stone in the wall. May this room never be used again. Twisting her head to look back at Story, she said, Go to the right when you exit here. This is the outer wall. Follow it all the way to the west gate. The stone doors silently swung open and the morning air swept into the room. The dragons burst through, unfurled their wings and leaped into the air. The dwarf army spilled out behind them, flowing onto the wide streets and fanning out, some heading towards the gate, others ascending the stairs to take control of the ramparts. Connell stood to the side, momentarily getting his bearings. The doors behind him were cleverly concealed, as part of the city walls that blended into the steep sides of the mountain. Tall buildings across the street blocked any view of the city, and he suddenly felt clueless as to where anything was. Deciding to get a better view, he followed those clambering up the stairs, then suddenly realized the sky was brighter than it should be at this time in the morning but the brightness seemed to pulse like someone shooting off fireworks. He also found it odd that it was far too quiet here. That lasted until he was halfway up the flight of stone steps when horns blared, and the clamor of gongs filled the air along with shouts of warning. Racing up the rest of the steps, he paused only a moment to see three dragons spewing fire onto the streets below. Kicking in his speed rune, Connell raced along the ramparts leaving his dwarven compatriots far behind, 
bowling over unsuspecting guards whose attention diverted to the dwarves swarming in the streets below. Halfway to the gatehouse, Connell saw a mage hurling down fist-sized fireballs that exploded and spread on the dwarves below. Unaware of Connell's rapid approach, he lifted an arm to toss another fireball, when pain exploded as Connell sliced through his arm at the shoulder, the limb flopping onto the stone paving. Blood spurted out as the mage wheeled around and fell to the street below, only to be trampled by the dwarves heading for the gate. Pressing on another fifty paces, Connell suddenly stopped, confronted by a mage standing in the middle of the rampart, waiting for him. Without a word, the mage flicked a lightning bolt at him. Connell easily dodged the bolt and closed the gap, raising his sword to strike. Yet the mage was equally fast, and Connell swung into empty air, only to find the mage behind him. Spinning around, Connell jerked his head just in time as a fireball flew by him. At the same instant, he flung his sword at the mage whose shocked face morphed to impending doom as the sword's point penetrated through his ribs and pierced his heart. Wasting no time, Connell yanked the sword free from the crumbled body and resumed his race to the west gate. Thankfully no more mages appeared, and leaving a path of destruction, he reached the gatehouse well ahead of the dwarves below. Bounding down the stone steps attached to the walls, he hustled around to open the gate, surprised by the dozen soldiers standing watchful guard. He brandished his sword. Yield. The city is about to fall. The sergeant of the guard, a well-built muscular man, pointed at him and smirked, waving his hands in pretend fright. One against twelve. We're so scared. His mocking jeer abruptly vanished when the streets behind Connell suddenly filled with charging dwarves. Yield. You don't have to die. Death before dishonor. The sergeant leapt for Connell as the swarm of dwarves crashed upon them. In mere seconds the sergeant and the other soldiers were cut to pieces, not one soldier yielding. Frowning at the willingness to die in the face of overwhelming odds, Connell wondered why such men would choose to do so. Did Torian command that much respect? A dwarf called out, snapping Connell out of his reverie. We need help, my lord. The support bars holding the crossbeams were just high enough to prevent dwarves from pushing the crossbeams out. Connell strode through the mass and using his strength rune, effortlessly lifted the two crossbeams out of the way. The dwarves watched in shocked silence for each crossbeam required at least two men to lift. Connell was oblivious to their stares. Come on, let's get these doors open. Pulling the doors open, Connell grabbed a torch from the wall sconce and waved it side to side, immediately pleased to see Lorcan's army surging forward, Lorcan in front. Lorcan came running up. We saw the dragons and knew you had gotten in. Story appeared by Connell's side with a smile for Lorcan. Good to see you, my friend. And you too. Lorcan grinned. Ready? Ready and willing. Then let's deliver a kingdom. Connell looked around. Where's Korla? She's coming? Lorcan chuckled as Corla worked her way through the soldiers. What of Drustin and Minor? Haven't seen them along with the others. Don't worry, they'll show up in time. Corla arrived with Austin right behind her. Directing his attention to Austin, Connell pointed to the east. Austin will connect with Gwen's force. Stories and Lorcan's armies will sweep this half of the city. I'm headed to the citadel with Corla. Me? Yes, in case I need your magic. Story growled. We're wasting time. Connell nodded. Right. Let's move out. Dawn's light rimmed the mountains. Expecting to see dragons overhead, Connell frowned at the absence of the massive beasts, wondering where they disappeared to. Dismissing them from his thoughts, he headed to the closest main thoroughfare, Corla racing to keep up. Lorcan's and Story's army moved in sync fanning out and pushing up through three of the main roads to the citadel. Connell felt like he was in a tunnel with no roof. Though the street was broad, the buildings that lined both sides rose four and five stories high. The original dragon doors had much smaller doors cut into them, adapting to the size of humans. He wondered why humans would want to live in a city better suited to dragons. At first, resistance was light, with Torian soldiers retreating in the face of the larger enemy. But with the citadel in sight, resistance stiffened, and archers rained down arrows from upper-story windows, causing the armies to slow down for house-to-house -house fighting. 
Connell's armies pressed forward, the enemy choosing to fight and die than surrender. Connell's speed, endurance and strength caused him to slice through the enemy, the gaps behind him filled with dwarves wielding broad axes, widening the swath of hacked bodies in the dying. Corla did her best to contribute, flinging small fireballs or lightning bolts. Though effective, her insecurity with her own powers caused her to second-guess her abilities. By the time they reached the wide piazza where the seven streets joined just before the steps to the citadel, the fighting intensified, with more of Torian's soldiers pouring out of the multi-storied edifice to join their comrades. Yet the combined strength of Connell's armies overpowered the defenders, and they slowly fell back in a retrograde defense, taking the battle inside the citadel. Once inside, Connell hacked his way through the melee, dragging Corla behind him, up flights of stairs and down hallways. Do you know where you're going? Corla panted, running to keep up with Connell. No. He kept his sword at the ready, as he led her down another hallway, that abruptly intersected with a series of adjoining hallways. Oh my god. Corla startled, as Madeline stepped into the hallway. Hello, dearie. She grinned. About time you got here. Connell swung his blade to meet her. No need for that. Madeline said, shaking her head then flicking her hand to the right and sending a fireball the size of a large watermelon down the hall to her right. Connell and Corla turned their heads in unison to watch the fireball explode upon a dozen of Torian soldiers. Whose side are you on? Yours, of course. She frowned at him, the answer obvious. Corla sneered. You expect us to believe that when you ran off to your master here? Madeline rolled her eyes. First, I have no master. She flicked a fireball down the hallway to her left. Instead of exploding, it spread like a sheet across the hall, locking the hallway. Second, of course I've been working for Torian. How else you think I could discover his plans? You're telling me you're a double agent? Connell cocked an eyebrow in doubt. Ain't it obvious? She frowned at them and shook her head in exasperation. Think. What happened in Blazingdon? Do you really think Torian would allow that to happen? She gave Connell a hard stare. You were supposed to be dead long before now. Ain't dead, are ya? Then why did you leave? Figured you'd get here. She tapped a finger to her nose. Also figured you'd get lost unless you had someone to guide ya. You know where Torian is? Connell blinked wide as he lowered the tip of his sword. Of course, dearie. She grinned and winked. Follow me. She curled a hand at him. I don't trust you. You're too smooth, too slick. You have an answer for everything. Madeline leveled a gaze at her. It's easy to have the answers when you knows the questions. You see? Corla turned to Connell. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Madeline narrowed her gaze at Connell. Or lost in time, dearie. You want this kingdom or not? Connell's lips pursed for an indecisive moment. Lead on. Madeline turned and headed down a wide hallway. This way. You're going to trust her. Corla caught up to them. Might as well. He scanned the hallway suspiciously. Madeline set a quick pace, flinging lightning darts of fireballs as they progressed. Connell noted that the numbers of enemy soldiers increased at each junction. At one intersection well lit with ornate sideboards against the walls, Connell battled five soldiers while Madeline and Corla dispatched twenty more. The next intersection proved even more troubling as fifty soldiers poured into the gap. Yet with Connell's rune might and Madeline's and Corla's mage strength, they managed to overwhelm the enemy. But cuts on all three of them caused Connell to warn, We can't take much more of this. Madeline cast a disdainful glance at the cut on her arm. Posh. These are mere scratches. She paused and focused her concentration on her cuts, which closed and healed. She grinned at Connell, about to offer healing, when her jaw slacked open. Your cuts, they're gone. He shrugged. I'm a quick healer. Not that quick. Has it always been so? Yes. They looked in unison at Corla who was struggling to perform self-healing, her frustration evident. You're trying too hard, dearie. Relax. 
Let your energy flow into yourself. Corla tried relaxing but to no avail. I still can't do it. Madeline gave her a quick once over. You're not that hurt. I'll teach you how to do it when we finish here. Come on. Arriving at the next intersection, Connell was surprised that no one was there. We're almost there. Focusing ahead, Connell saw that the hallway ended and he picked up the pace. Slow down, dearie. We'll get there in time. Connell slid a glance at the mage, puzzled at her casual demeanor. They stopped at the edge of the hall, peering into the vast piazza where the seven hallways met. Except for the numerous sideboards, tapestries, wall sconces, display tables, statues and other artwork, it was empty. Madeline pointed across the expanse to the set of towering doors tall enough for a dragon to pass through. He's in there. Connell stepped into the piazza, expecting to see soldiers suddenly swarming out from the other hallways, but nothing happened. Looking over his shoulder at Madeline, he smiled. Lowering his voice, he asked, Who else is in there? Madeline shrugged. Don't know. Usual, he has Grimar with him. But there'd be other mages hanging about here. Guess I'll find out. He turned and strode across the floor. Corla fussed at Madeline. Aren't you going to help? Can't do no more. You and me need to protect out here. But suppose he has mages in there? He might. She ticked her head at Connell. But if he's the one of prophecy, it don't matter. Corla's frantic stare followed Connell as he approached the smaller set of doors cut into the thick wood of the grand set of doors. Her voice a whisper, she muttered. What if he's not the promised one? Then you and me better find a place to hide. Connell stood before the doors and inhaled a deep breath. Reaching for the handle, he twisted it and pulled the door open and stepped inside the throne room, a vast cavern of impossible height and scintillating walls. At the far end and in the middle of an otherwise empty room, a throne perched on a platform with seven steps leading up to the single throne. A sturdy muscular man with a full dark beard sat on the throne, a drawn sword across his lap. He looked up when Connell entered. The man's voice carried across the room as though he were standing right next to Connell. So you're the brat who's come to take my throne. I should have killed you when I had the chance. Chapter 17 Grimar lifted the axe above his head, and his body began to glow with the same light as his weapon. Heat and power radiated from him, so powerful that Gwen had to use her might rune just to stay on her feet. Even then, it was almost too much. When he spoke, the words rolled over her like a thunderclap. Gwen covered her ears against the sound, tears streaking down her cheeks. He took a step toward her, and the ground trembled with his power. The buildings shook around them, and Gwen knew that she would not survive against him. In a blur of movement she dropped down and retrieved her blade, then tried to stab Grimar in the stomach as she came back up. There was a clang of metal as Grimar's axe blocked her sword. He rotated his wrist, locking her blade between the axe head and the handle, then jerked back. Gwen's sword was ripped from her grasp and it went sailing away, clattering to the ground somewhere behind Grimar. Before she could react, Grimar backhanded her. She flew backward, striking the wall again with a crunch, then bounced off to the ground. She didn't know for sure but she thought some of her ribs were broken. Gwen whispered the word, Laius. The magic began healing her, but it was a slow process. Gwen lurched to her feet, pushing the pain into the back of her mind. She matched Grimar's intense stare. I'm going to die, she thought. And then she rushed him, lifting her left hand. She got close enough to touch his chest before letting off a blast of lightning. Grimar grunted as he was thrown backward from the concussive force. Thin trails of smoke rose from his robes but otherwise he seemed unfazed. You've got nerve, I'll give you that. Most of the mages I killed cowered and begged for their life. I don't beg. We'll see. Grimar stomped his right foot down. The cobblestones of the street heaved upward, forcing Gwen's balance off. She staggered and tried to keep from rolling her ankle, quickly diving aside. She tumbled a few times, then got back up. Grimar was there in the blink of an eye, his glowing axe coming straight at her head. Gwen used her speed rune and stepped out of the way just in time, the air from his swing brushing the side of her face. 
She dropped to one knee and used her other leg to spin herself around. Using the might rune, she drove her fist into the back of Grimar's leg just behind his knee. To her surprise, it worked. The blow forced his leg to bend and he fell forward onto the ground. She stood and leaped into the air, intending to land on him and use her drain life rune. She crashed to the ground, the air knocked from her lungs. Grimar was already gone. She rolled onto her back and saw him standing over her, the axe poised inches away from her neck. This has been fun, but I've got a rebellion to crush. The madness in his eyes had intensified, and Gwen pondered for the briefest moment whether or not he was possessed by some foul spirit. The axe rose and fell, and Gwen snapped her eyes shut, not wanting to see her death coming. Something heavy landed on her, and there was a clang. Gwen opened her eyes to see Kalen's face right above hers, his excited grin plastered across his lips. If you wanted me on top of you, all you had to do is ask. He chuckled. And then he was pulled off of her, as Grimar grabbed him by the back of his shirt, flinging Kalen across the courtyard. Gwen didn't worry about him. His stone skin rune could take the beating. Gwen rolled out of Grimar's range and got up, her ribcage burning with fire. Menjing and the others were there too. They quickly encircled Grimar, closing off any escape. You're outnumbered. Give up or die. Grimar turned a slow circle, looking at each mage. And then he laughed. Fools. This battle is already won. Grimar tossed his axe aside but instead of falling to the ground, it spun end over end through the air and cut down three of the mages. Their forms crumpled, puddles of blood rapidly growing around them. The axe landed in one of the puddles, and the glowing intensified. Gwen stared in horror. With barely any effort, he'd slain three people. He was a monster, and he was unstoppable. Lyra's voice echoed in her mind. No one is unstoppable. Even dragons can be killed. And apparently, they could read minds without permission. Gwen looked at the axe as it began to shake, then it flew through the air of its own accord, striking down another two mages. Those who remained used their runes to erect barriers around themselves. Gwen wished she'd taken a rune like that, and as if an answer, Kaelin appeared at her side and used his barrier rune to protect them both. Grimar held his hand out and the axe returned, then he gripped the hilt and it vanished. Enough games. Grimar lifted his arms into the air and clenched his hands into fists. The ground rumbled, and the sky began to darken with unnatural black clouds. A myriad of lightning bolts dropped from the heavens, striking everyone and everything within the circle of mages. Cries of anguish and surprise rang out as the blasts cracked and shattered some of the barriers, killing those within. Dust and smoke blotted out everything. Gwen coughed and covered her face with her arm, peering vainly into the swirling chaos. A dark shape came toward her, swift and silent. Grimar's face appeared in front of the barrier, and Gwen screamed involuntarily, scrambling back. He cackled in response, every laugh laced with his insanity. Kalen's shield was still intact, but Grimar tapped it with his finger and it flickered and died. Kalen stepped in front of him, blocking Gwen. He started to summon his spiked ball of energy but Grimar grabbed him by the throat and lifted him off the ground. Kalen clawed at Grimar's hand, his feet kicking wildly in the air as he was strangled. Gwen used her might rune and quickly placed one hand on Grimar's wrist and the other on his elbow. She pulled back on his wrist and pushed his elbow in the opposite direction. There was an audible crack as Grimar's bones broke. Gwen felt bile rising into her throat and swallowed, forcing it back down. Grimar's grasp on Kalen's neck was released, and he staggered to the side, gasping. Grimar hadn't flinched. He pulled his broken arm close to his body, and lifted his other arm toward Gwen. His palm glimmered briefly, and then a blast of cold air sent Gwen reeling. She shivered uncontrollably, and her teeth chattered. She felt as if she'd suddenly been thrown into winter. Her lips barely moved for her to call on her fire rune, and the word came out as nothing more than a whisper. Flames roared from her right hand, striking the ground around her feet. The heat warmed her and pushed the cold away, enabling her to direct the flames at Grimar. He came at her anyway, the flames casting themselves aside from his presence. Gwen cut the magic off and hit him with another lightning bolt as he reached her, his hand going for her throat. The blast knocked him back a few steps, but he recovered quickly, 
and came right back at her. Grimar snatched her up by the neck as he had with Kaelin. She gasped as her vision exploded with lights. Grimar squeezed hard, but Gwen managed to wheeze the name of her might rune. A wave of strength flooded her body, strengthening her enough to keep him from crushing her windpipe. She kicked at him vainly, the blows accomplishing nothing. Behind Grimar, the smoke had cleared to reveal the massacre. Many of the mages were dead, their bodies nothing more than smoldering lumps of charred flesh. Darkness was creeping around the edges of Gwen's vision, but she forced herself to look at the destruction, to burn the sight into her memory. The gruesomeness fueled her somehow, giving strength to the dark rune. Gwen clutched Grimar's hand. Drain Sawil. Grimar's eyes widened. The madness was still there, but Gwen spotted something else. Fear. He tried to release her, but the dark rune would not be refused. It kept him rooted in place, siphoning the life and vitality from him. The energy filled Gwen, renewing her. The healing rune flared within her mind, and her ribs healed instantly. Grimar's strength was fading, and he dropped to his knees. Gwen pulled his hand away from her throat, but she didn't let him go. She would not show him mercy as she had with Emil. Grimar tried to speak, but all that came out of his mouth was garbled noise. Blood flecked his lips as he gagged, and more trailed from his nostrils. His eyes shrank into his head and his skin became loose. He aged rapidly before her eyes, but she didn't feel revulsion this time. She felt pleasure. You will never again cause torment. She watched as the look in his eyes became pleading. Gwen clenched her jaw, and forced the rest of the energy from his body. The life in his eyes faded, and only then did she let go of him. She stood over his lifeless form for a long while in silence. She expected to feel guilt or shame for taking his life with the dark rune. Instead, she felt nothing at all. Her emotions were completely absent, her heart hollow and empty. There was movement beside her, and she slowly became aware of Kaelin's voice. She looked at him blankly. We're not finished yet. Gwen looked past him and saw a group of robed figures coming toward them, and they didn't look like allies. She nodded at Kaelin and pushed past him. She took a few steps and stopped, waiting calmly. What are you doing? Get inside my shield. She ignored him. Torian's followers would never stop. Whether they were under the influence of magic or some distorted sense of loyalty, she didn't know, nor did she care. All she knew was that death was never satisfied. And neither was the dark rune. It was pulsing across every inch of her body, begging to release the energy it had consumed. Gwen didn't think, she just reacted, letting the rune guide her. The nearest mage was torn to pieces by a swarm of shadows. Another was sucked into a dark hole that had no end. Gwen tore through their ranks methodically and sadistically. She forced a man to pick up a sword and impale himself. Somewhere in the back of her mind, she knew she was no longer in control of anything. The dark rune dictated her moves, her thoughts. She touched a woman and gave her a disease that ate her alive as Gwen watched. If she was to become a monster, then this was how she wanted it. A tool of justice, dealing out death to those who deserved it. The remaining mage fell to the last of the dark rune's energy, her skin flayed from her body while she was alive. As the power of the rune faded, Gwen slowly started to feel like herself again. She surveyed the carnage wordlessly. Had she really killed Grimar and his mages by herself? She turned around and saw Kaelin. He was staring at her, as if she were a creature he'd never seen before. Where's Connell? She looked at the castle. Is he inside? Kaelin didn't answer. He just continued to stare at her. Gwen walked toward him. She thought he was going to run away from her, but he stayed where he was. She reached him and wrapped her arms around him, then broke into tears. Kaelin hesitantly hugged her back. Chapter 18 Sword in hand, Torian slowly rose from the throne. That you made it this far speaks persistence. He snorted a derisive laugh. Though do you really think your presence here is because you're some great warrior? Does it matter? Connell took measure of the man. I'm here. Torian descended the stairs in slow casual steps. Expecting to see him in royal garb, Connell frowned in surprise to see him dressed for combat, 
but then figured it was logical since Havengard was under attack. And then he remembered this man was his father's brother. Was there a resemblance? You're here because I wanted to see you for myself. Torian's voice was firm and strong. Come closer and let me see you. Connell strode half the distance to Torian, studying him as he approached. The dark beard and hair were flecked with gray. He wore a thin circlet of gold, with an emerald in the shape of an eagle in the center. For all Torian's bravura, Connell noticed the occasional shimmer of chainmail beneath the sleeveless tunic of thick leather. Connell smirked to himself. The man was taking no chances. Still, the muscular arm said he had not been idle these past twenty-plus years. Well, uncle, here I am. It was then he noticed that Torian's arms were covered in runes. Come closer. Why don't you come here? As you wish. Torian touched his speed rune and in an instant was upon Connell, who stepped aside just as Torian's downstroke swung at him. On instinct, Connell raised the sword above his head and felt the heavy clang of Torian's second stroke. He bent down and swirled, his sword outstretched hoping to catch Torian's legs, but all he felt was empty air. Instinct had him leap and roll as Torian's sword banged against the floor. Torian came at him with a flurry of thrusts and jabs, forcing him backwards. Yet with each parry, Connell noticed the force of Torian's strikes seemed to lessen. Abruptly, Torian stopped his attack and gave Connell a haughty stare. You fight well. I'm impressed. In a surprise move, he turned his back on Connell and walked back towards the center of the room, then turned to face him. He shook his head at his nephew and sneered. You don't have the heart to command. I gave you opportunity to attack me from behind, and you simply let me walk away. Only cowards attack from behind. Cowardice has nothing to do with it. It's called opportunity. You take advantage whenever it appears. That's what kings do. No, that's what you do. A true king doesn't have to rule by fear and intimidation. A true king is loved by his subjects. No one loves you. Torian's arrogant smile vanished. Bold words from a whelp with no experience. Experience has nothing to do with it. Truth is truth. It's a fool who won't accept truth. Torian's nostrils flared and he composed himself. Did you come here to bore me to death? No. I came here for restitution. Death is merely the end state. Then you have greatly erred, for it is you who will die. I guess we'll see, won't we? You've forgotten one very important point. Oh. What's that? Pointing to his crown, he said, You see the stone of the eagle. I'm sure you've been told the prophecy. I have. The eagle will bear the vipers in its claws. You know that I am the eagle. You and your pathetic sister are vipers, though that is stretching the imagination a bit. But the result is that you two lose. Connell sniffed in derision. You've conveniently left out the most important part. From the west a cobra will rise and strike down the eagle. Connell jerked up his sleeve, revealing the cobra brand on his shoulder, the brand now a dazzling tattoo of shimmering greens and gold. Torian stiffened. Impossible. Energized, Connell closed the gap between them, attacking a surprised Torian who found himself pressed backwards before parrying and delivering counter blows. The two opponents traded strikes and jabs, circling around the throne room floor as the battle progressed. I'm surprised you haven't called in reinforcements. They exchanged blows. Or would that be admitting your weakness? Weakness? Torian arced down a powerful hit that Connell easily blocked. I should have killed you when I had the chance. You said that before? But then I suppose that's what you're good at, killing babies and women. With an angry growl, Torian increased his attack his frustration growing that Connell simply blocked or deflected each strike yet didn't attack himself, as though he was toying with him. At the same time he felt his strength giving way, and silently cursed Grimar for convincing him he didn't need the strength rune, that he was strong enough and besides he had others to do his bidding. But what about all the other runes he had marked on his body? An image flashed of the excruciating pain he endured accepting the speed rune. Truth was, he had nearly died. Only Grimar's ministrations saved him. But these other runes? 
Grimar convinced him he didn't need fighting runes, that he was powerful enough as he was. What he needed was mystical and magic runes, runes about insight and knowledge. None of the magic runes had worked. In that instant, facing his nemesis, the epiphany burst, and he realized that all the runes he had on his body were nothing more than sugar pills meant to placate him. He had seen what happened to others who demanded rune marks only to horribly suffer and die, for they were not mage marked. But surely he was mage marked. He had to be. He was the king. Doubt creeped in and Torian knew he needed time to regroup, to come up with a plan to destroy his brother's kids. Where was Grimar? He was supposed to be here. What was taking him so long? Sensing indecision, Connell pressed a furious attack, his strength rune dominating the weakening Torian. Suddenly, Torian delivered a series of strikes that momentarily caught Connell on the defense. He was about to step back when Torian spun around and fled towards the rear of the room behind the throne podium. Surprised at the retreat, Connell reached into his pocket and retrieved a throwing star. He had never used one before, but now seemed like a good time. Praying that the rune mark worked, he flung it at Torian just as he opened a secret door in the wall. Torian let out a startled grunt of pain as the star tore into his thigh, causing him to stumble and drop to his knees. By the time Connell had raced across the room, Torian had managed to stand and stagger through the opening. Connell stuck a foot in the doorway to prevent its closing. Yanking it open, he stepped onto a broad landing with five sets of spiral stairs, three ascending and two descending. Torian was nowhere in sight. Thankful for the embedded glowstones, Connell rapidly scanned the landing, thinking that with Torian wounded, it would be easier to descend than climb. Glancing down at the floor he hoped for a telltale sign of blood, but there was none. It wasn't until he checked the second descending staircase that he saw the throwing star on the ground, and the bloodied handprint on the railing. Descending the stairs brought him to long hallway lit with glow stones. Torian was halfway down, hand on the wall for support, dragging his left leg. Blood continued seeping from the deep gash in the back of his thigh. Connell was on him in an instant, bypassing him, then spinning around to confront him. We haven't finished. Torian looked up at him, a mixture of anger and fear in his eyes. Inhaling a deep breath, he leveled a paternal stare at Connell. You just don't understand. Your father was tearing apart everything our family had spent hundreds of years building. You think I wanted his death. He just wouldn't listen. I had to do something. Murder my entire family. That wasn't my fault. Some individuals I called friends thought they were doing me a favor. I found out too late. Surely you believe me. Doubt slipped into Connell's determination as Torian's voice had a calming effect. What about my family in Hervé? I knew nothing about that. Torian's voice was soothing and melodious. As soon as I found out, I had the perpetrators executed. Really? Connell lowered his sword. Yes. I know you believe me. Now come. Help me get to a physician. Connell took a step forward when a voice rang out. Liar. Torian turned as Connell looked past his shoulder to see Madeline storming up the hallway, Corla on her heels. Liar. Madeline stared at Connell. Can't you see he's using his voice to sway you? She snapped her head to glare at Torian. You're just like Havard's smooth tongue, all mouth and no brains. Shut up, woman. Why are you here? You're supposed to be helping, Grimar. Grimar doesn't need my help. She pointed a finger at Connell. Besides, he needs to hear the truth from you, the man who killed his family. Torian flipped his sword up to stab her, only to have it deflected by Connell's blade. Torian twisted his head to look at him, pitiful eyes pleading for understanding. I'm your uncle, your own flesh and blood. Connell felt a surge of guilt and stepped back. Stop it. He's using an emotions voice rune. Don't listen to her. She's a traitor. You can't trust her. Listen to me. You need to help me. You shouldn't have hurt me like you did. I'm... I'm sorry. Frowning, Connell gazed down at his sword as though he couldn't understand how it came to be in his hands. His first inclination was to toss it on the floor, 
but that didn't seem right. Does it hurt? Madeline smacked Torian's wound. The gods damn you, woman. Torian cringed in pain as he awkwardly stepped away. In that instant, Torian's voice spell broke, and Connell woke to his surroundings. At the same time, Corla stepped around Madeline and placed a hand on Torian's shoulder. Here. Let me help. Gloric and Bass. Expecting the pain to subside and the wound to heal, Torian waited but a few moments before excoriating her. That didn't do anything, you stupid woman. Corla shrugged. Oh well. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Torian felt he point of Connell's sword at his side. Turning his head to face him, he used his most persuasive voice. These two are thorns in our sides. You need to get me to a physician. Then we need to talk about co-ruling. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Connell barked a laugh. Co-ruling? Are you serious? You're not ruling anything anymore. Torian's eyes blinked wide and he refocused his voice. But you want to rule with me. I'm your uncle. You'd never want to harm me. What gave you that idea? I've come to end this, remember? Madeline shifted a glance at Corla, dipping her head in respect. You two need to step away. Connell turned his full attention on Torian. Like I said, it's time to end this. Dumbfounded, Torian stared at them before tossing his sword on the floor. Glaring defiantly at Connell, he said, I won't fight you. You'll have to kill an unarmed man. Just like you killed my unarmed family in Hervé. Connell swung his blade. Torian dodged the attack, grabbing his sword in the process, before limping back several steps, then turning to force his legs to carry him down the hallway. Connell let him go, until Torian was almost at the far door at the end. Withdrawing another throwing star, he whipped it down the hall with such intensity that it completely sliced through the chainmail and embedded itself in Torian's back, propelling him forward to crash onto the floor. Stay here. An instant later, he stood over the prostrate body of his uncle, who was struggling to push himself to his knees. Connell patiently waited until Torian sat on his haunches, blood gushing out the wound in his back. Any last words? Go to hell. He spat blood. Not very original, but they'll do. Remember this? He pulled back the sleeve to show the Cobra brand. It will be the last thing you remember. In a powerful stroke, he sliced though Torian's neck. Torian's head momentarily wavered, before rolling forward and down to the floor. His body sat back then slowly flopped to the side. The watching Connell stare down at his uncle, Madeline spoke to Corla. That was very clever of you, dearie. Corla smiled. Thank you. It was all I could think of at the moment. Where'd you learn the spell to counter a voice rune? It was one of the things I was taught. Never thought I'd ever use it. Madeline turned to her and placed a gentle hand on her arm. You're gonna be a great mage, dearie. Corla studied the older mage. Were you really working for us all along? How else ya think he and all the others knew what was going on here? She turned back to gaze at Connell. He's gonna need our help. He'll have to undo all of Torian's wickedness. That'll take time. And of course, there's the dragons to consider. Chapter 19 Torian is dead. Corla saw Connell strike the killing blow. Gwen pulled back from Kaelin and wiped her tears. Then it is over. We did it. We've taken back the throne. There are still many things to do, but the worst has passed. Come on, let's go find Connell. They walked across the piazza where seven streets conjoined and headed up the stairs into the castle. Bodies littered the area, and Gwen was forced to tread carefully to keep from slipping in the blood that soaked the cobblestones. The inside of the castle was just as bad, if not worse. The bodies of both groups littered the halls. Gwen navigated through the carnage and reached the throne room as Connell and two women stepped out from behind the throne. Corla. Gwen looked at the woman who rushed forward and embraced Kaelin. Although they were twins, Gwen had come to know they were more different than alike. The other woman stayed at Connell's side. There was something odd about her, but Gwen dismissed the thought and looked at Connell. 
He seemed different somehow, but she wasn't sure what it was. You killed him. Gwen's words were a statement more than a question. Yes. Gwen nodded, remaining silent for a moment. Was it difficult? A little. These bone runes gave me an advantage though. I meant, emotionally. Knowing that he was your, our uncle, did that change anything? Connell was quiet a moment. Not really. It's not like there was any sort of bond. And then all I had to do was remind myself that he killed my family, our family. Gwen listened to his words, but her mind kept replaying the slaughter she'd committed. Grimmar's mages were evil, she knew, but it didn't change the fact that what she'd done had been overkill. There was something wrong with her, and she knew the Dark Rune was responsible. She needed to find a way to get rid of it. Connell stopped talking and looked behind her, and she turned to see Venia and several other dragons had entered the throne room. There were a few she didn't recognize. One of them stepped forward and turned its gaze on Connell. We summon you to fulfill your oath. The dragon's deep voice echoed off the walls. Gwen didn't understand what that meant, and she turned back to look at her brother. What oath? What are they talking about? Are you in trouble? Gwen glanced over her shoulder at the dragons. They didn't look menacing, but there was something about their demeanors that told Gwen there could potentially be an issue. The dark rune thrummed in her veins, urging her to do insidious things. There's something I need to tell you. This is Dareth. Princess Dareth. She's the leader of the dragons that are left. I'm not sure how much you know about Isenthal, but it was originally the home of dragons, and it's the only place where they can breed. I've agreed to hand the kingdom over to them, and we will head west to take over Tyrmanic. Gwen felt a wave of anger wash over her at the fact that Connell had agreed to give the kingdom to the dragons after all their hard work and sacrifice, but she quickly calmed herself. She didn't want to lead a kingdom, and with Torian dead, that left Connell as the only option. It made sense that he would make that decision without her, but she still felt a slight sting to her pride. And what of our people here? Will they be forced from their homes? No. The dragons will need our help, food and things like that. We'll also need people who will stand up for them, here. As things were being decided, Gwen wondered what her purpose was. If Connell was going to lead, then what would she do? Perhaps she could attempt to find a way to rid herself of the Dark Rune. Without anyone needing her to lead them, she would be free to do as she pleased. The idea was tempting. Venia came to stand beside Gwen. I was hoping that you might consider staying here with some of your mages. Staying here with you? Me and my kind. We will need help and protection. Protection? From what? You are the most powerful creatures I've ever seen. What could possibly hurt you? It surprises me how quickly humans forget. Do you not remember how I was almost killed? As long as my kind exists, there will always be those who seek to hunt us down. Gwen shook her head, realizing her words probably made her sound foolish. She thought back to the previous night when the dragon hunters had mortally injured Venia with a magical weapon. Venia was right, dragons could be killed like any other species. Yet, was it her responsibility to offer that protection? I will consider it. There's something that I need to do, before I can trust myself around others. The Dark Rune. How did you know? And then Gwen felt it. The subtle probing of her mind. Stop doing that. You need to learn to close your mind from outside presences. If you stay here and help us, there are many things we can teach you. And maybe we can find a way to help you with the Dark Rune. Dareth chimed in. Yes, we will help each other in beneficial ways. I will consider that the first step on the journey to building trust with humans again. Taking Havenguard back wasn't enough to prove that? Gwen snorted. And where were you at? Once we entered the city, I didn't see you helping clear the way to the castle. I didn't see you fighting. You were flying safely high overhead. Many of my people lost their lives to bring Torian down. And it turns out they bled for you, so I think that's worth more than a few steps. Calm down. She could have phrased that better, 
but imagine having everyone you know hunted down and killed. I know exactly what that's like. Perhaps we should talk about this elsewhere. Connell looked at Dareth. Gwen didn't care what they did. She stormed out of the throne room, fuming as she passed through the halls. By the time she exited the castle and breathed in some fresh air, she was barely holding back her tears. What was happening to her? She slumped onto the stairs and laid her head on her knees. It's the dark room. Venia was beside her. It's infecting you from the inside. How do I stop it? Gwen lifted her head. The dragon had taken her elven form. I don't know. At least not yet. But if we work together, I'm sure we will find a way. Dark magic is volatile and those who use it have short lives. You've done well to control it so far, but you will need more self-control, especially if there isn't a way to rid yourself of it. Gwen didn't want to consider that she might be forced to live with the rune for the rest of her life, but that was a possibility. She also had a decision to make. Should she live among dragons or with her own kind? And then there was Connell. She'd lost so much time with her brother, but he was also a stranger to her. Should she go to Tyr Manic with him? Could she? Your thoughts and emotions are at war with one another. They always seem to be. Stay here with us. Take some time to rest and learn who you are. Rest? What is that? Gwen laughed. I don't think I would even know how to rest at this point. She heaved a sigh and looked out at the courtyard. But it would be nice to do so. To have the choice. You do have the choice. And the decision is up to you. For the first time in a long while, Gwen felt as if that were true, as if she weren't being forced into some destiny that she had no control over. It felt freeing. She stood up and looked at Venia. I'll do it. I'll stay. Chapter 20 In the mid-morning daylight, Connell stood on the crest of the road where the forest ended, and empty farm fields surrounding the city of Blazingdon began. The armies of Story and Lorcan spread behind him. Above him, vultures circled the skies, waiting opportunity to descend to continue their feast on the dead. It felt odd to be here. Well, maybe odd wasn't the right word. Gwen his sister, he'd have to get used to saying that, had remained in Havenguard, at home with the dragons and mages. Was he disappointed? Part of him had expected her to be here with him, conquering Tyr Manic, then ruling as king and queen. Another part said, she had her own destiny to follow. The parting had been more than amiable, though still awkward. Sort of like being forced to give a hug to an aunt you've never seen before. Yet there was a connection, a bond that they both knew and felt, and a desire to know each other better, to form the real bond of a brother and sister. Gwen had wanted him to stick around a little longer, but he knew if he didn't strike now, opportunity would slip through his fingers. Besides, once he had conquered Tyr Manic, he could come back to Havenguard any time he wanted. There'd be time to discover who his sister really was. For now, he had another kingdom to claim. Story came up to stand beside him. Doesn't look like anyone's come back. Would you? Probably not. They stood in silence a moment, watching the macabre display. Connell glanced at the scouts in the distance as they emerged from the forest. I appreciate Rorkin lending me your help. The dwarf grinned. I do too. Haven't had this much fun in a long time. Lorcan strode up to join them. It seems strange to come back here at the head of an army set to conquer my own kingdom. Your kingdom? Story looked at him teasingly. You know what I mean. Change is upon us. Connell gave a thoughtful nod. The dragons have returned. Time for new beginnings. He twisted his head to gaze at Lorcan. You still okay with this? Why shouldn't he be? He's going to be the kingdom's army commander. Lorcan shot him a look of irritation. That's not why I'm doing it. Story shook his head and chuckled. You two need to lighten up. Torian's evil didn't die with him. There is still work to be done. My only disappointment is that Galadir isn't here. And Voldar and Torgrith. Rorkin's support only goes so far. 
Story offered a wry grin. Besides, those two are carvers, not fighters. Connell stepped forward. Still, I'm more than thankful that you two are here. Let's see what the scouts have to tell us. The lead scout, a short wiry man, came bustling up, dropping to his knee before Connell. Don't do that. Connell frowned, reaching down to touch him on the shoulder. Just give me your report. Besides, we're at war and kneeling before the king lets the enemy's spies know who he is. The man's eyes bolted wide at the obvious mistake, and he gushed. I'm so sorry, my lord. Connell replied with a kind smile. I know. But from now on, let's just all stand and pretend like we're friends. What do you have? The man composed himself. There's nothing at least two to three miles around. Seems too quiet, my lord. I don't like it. Why? There should be some sort of activity, even if it was just scavengers in the city. Connell nodded in agreement. I know. Go ahead and push on out to Pencord. Yes, my lord. He started to bow, then caught himself, unsure what to do. Just go? Yes, commander. As the man ran off, Connell turned to a runner nearby. Find Madeline and bring her here. Yes, my lord. We can't sit here all day. I know. Just a couple more minutes. He thought about his aged mage and the young Korla who decided to remain in Havenguard to gain more knowledge and power. Was he disappointed she chose to stay? Truthfully, not really. Yes, she was exceedingly attractive, but she was too. What was the word? High maintenance. Campaigning and battle were not her strong points. Yet he was destined to be a king and a king needed a queen. Would Korla be a suitable candidate? Or should he look to align himself with another kingdom, by marrying a princess? He slid a glance at Story. Maybe he should head north to the Elven Kingdom, or east to what remains of Isenthal. When Madeline arrived, Connell directed her attention to the empty city. Not surprised. Place is cursed. Don't see anyone living there, unless they can chase away the ghosts. What ghosts? Story eyes went wide. Not them kind, dearie. She then tapped her chest. The ones in here. Them that lost the ones they loved won't come back. She again looked at the city. It'll be some time before this is a city again. Connell's attention diverted to a scout on horseback racing towards them. A large group on horseback approaches, my lord. How large? Couldn't tell exactly, commander but probably no more than a hundred. At that moment, the newcomers emerged on the main road to Pencord. Connell grinned as they came closer. Saren. Morning, boss. She grinned, reining in her steed and dismounting. Good morning, Saren. Good to see you. She took a measure of his greeting. You're not mad at us for not going along with you to Havenguard? No. He smiled kindly at her. Your skills are not in combat. Besides, I have other things in mind for you. Which way did you come from? Came from Rexfeard through Pencord. Thought you might could use a little intel. Story nodded. Now we're talking. What's happening? Saren looked quizzically at him, then back to Connell. It's okay. Connell chuckled, shooting a bemused glance at Story, oblivious to the breach of etiquette. You've a clear road through Pencord. Words already spread that a new king arrives. A lot of folks are unhappy with Calder's rule and ready to join you. What about Rexfeard? Calder still controls Rexfeard. Folks are afraid to speak out against him. He has at least a thousand soldiers in the city, with more coming from Malvin and Farrell. Farrell? Connell curled a lip. Yes, boss. She smiled a knowing grin. He sent a cohort under the command of Captain Cadfin. Cadfin? Connell smirked. Yeah. All told, I'd figure Calder's total between 2,000 and 2,500. We still outnumber him more than two to one. And with more joining us, we will vastly outnumber him. Let's move out then. Connell looked at Saren. Ride next to me. As the armies moved forward, Saren's small force moved in behind Connell and their leader. 
You know you can't continue as highwayman anymore. Connell scanned the positioning of his soldiers. She smiled. We sort of figured that. You said you had other things in mind, boss? Yes. He turned to gaze directly at her. I want you to be the eyes and ears within my kingdom. Like spies. He nodded. Exactly, with you as my spy chief. Saren grinned pleased. Sounds like fun, boss. You know you can depend on me. I know. He returned the smile. Maldwick spoke highly of you, and from what I've seen, I can trust you, and you know what you're doing. Oh, one more thing. Yes, boss? Only you and your group may call me boss. Thus, I will know any messenger who calls me that is from you. Saren's grin spread wider. Thank you, boss. This'll be fun. Connell laughed. I hope so. Just as Saren had reported, the road through Pencord was uneventful, except for the addition of growing numbers of citizens who wanted to join Connell's army. Connell rejected most of them on the basis that they had livelihoods to pursue, and he didn't know how long the campaign would last. Besides, he didn't want to be responsible for feeding them. Still, by the time they encamped outside the walls of Rexfeard, Connell's army had added 500 more battle-worthy men and women. To no one's surprise, the gates to the city were firmly shut. Two days later, one gate door yawned open and two men and a woman slipped out. Carrying a white flag on a guidon pole, they guided their mounts to the middle of the gap separating Connell's army and the city. Alerted at the request for parley, Connell's story and Lorcan rode out to meet them. King Caldea demands you disband your army and leave this place. The man in the center was shorter than the other two, with close-cropped hair and beard, in the manner of one used to being obeyed. And who are you? Story glared at the speaker. The man sat up straight in the saddle and sneered at the dwarf. I am General Finber, the commander of His Majesty's army. Story cast an amused glance at Lorcan and stage whispered, Not anymore. Bristling, Finbear glared at them. King Caldea demands to know by what right you invade his kingdom. This is a peaceful realm, wishing only to be left alone. Lorcan crossed his arms. He should have thought about that when he threw in his lot with Torian. Finbear narrowed his gaze at Lorcan. I know you. You were once a loyal and true man. I still am, though not to that traitor Caldea. I suggest you think hard about your next move. Caldea is finished. This kingdom has a new king. Him? Finbear scoffed, ticking his head at Connell. He is to be your king? Yes. Just as he defeated Thorian, he will defeat Caldea. Then you... Finbear abruptly stopped, as giant shadows flitted across the ground at the same time that cries of fear bellowed from the walls. Looking up he cowered as two dragons circled above them then swooped down to land next to them, frightening the horses. Good day, my lord Connell. A dragon the color of dazzling amethyst and eyes that blazed bright orange lowered her head. Always a pleasure to see you, Gon, and you too, Ellis. Ellis was a dragon of equal size to Gon, with a shimmering hue of topaz and eyes of glowing amber. Greetings, my lord. Ellis dipped his massive head. You two arrived just in time. I was about to explain to these individuals that it would be in their best interest to surrender the city and prevent needless death. Gon turned a scaled head to the emissaries. Tell your master that he has until the sun sets to surrender the city or we will burn it down. Finbear wheeled around and raced back to the gates, the other two in hot pursuit. How'd you know? Connell watched as the three riders slipped back through the gates. Just a hunch. Thought you could use a little muscle. Think I'll take a little flight to remind them. Gaon launched into the sky to circle ominously over the city, occasionally buzzing the guard towers. Ellis chuckled. He's such a kid. Think I'll join him. Less than half an hour later, the dragon's threat had spread throughout the city. Not long after the news of impending conflagration had coursed its way, the gates opened wide and a prison wagon emerged, driven by a single wagoner. Crowds on foot followed behind. They stopped a short distance away. The wagoner descended and approached. As he approached, 
Connell knew immediately he was no ordinary merchant, for he carried himself with a confident regal bearing. I am Prince Brody. Behind me in the wagon sits Caldea. Do with him as you deem fit. Though I am related to him, I am not like him. I have heard of you. Connell remembered the attempts on Farrell's life. You have no love for your brother-in-law Farrell. Brody curled a lip. He was Calder's man, Torian's man. Fortunately, I finally gained a measure of success. The city is yours to command. He bowed and stepped to the side. If you are not like him, why are you here? I came in one last effort to make him change his mind. Instead, I was tossed in prison. Only your arrival and threat to destroy the city make my freedom possible. Connell pondered the response. It would be easy enough to verify. And your son Blaine? Is he here with you? Brody's lips pursed. He is dead, my lord, a casualty of Farrell's treachery. I am sorry. Dismounting, Connell walked up to the wagon and stared at the man inside the cage whose look of fury told him he was unrepentant. Confine him to the dungeon. As you wish, your majesty. Brody again bowed. He flicked a hand at a man close by who leapt aboard and wheeled the wagon around. Let me introduce you to some of the leadership of the city. He escorted Connell along with Story and Lorcan to a group of men and women who had positioned themselves in a line. They stopped at the first person, a middle-aged woman with darting eyes and permanent smile. This is Lady Eilis, the burgomaster of Rexford. Your Majesty. Eilis curtsied. Lady Eilis. Connell forced a smile, then glanced down the row, already wondering if ruling a kingdom was what he really wanted to do. He noticed a man five people down in line whose look of disapproval seemed to land on story. Skipping those in between, he marched down to stand in front of him. The man was dressed as a wealthy merchant with expensive ermine and silk fitted on a portly frame. His black hair was perfectly cut and greased back. I couldn't help but notice your look of concern. Connell smiled. The man bent forward. It's the dwarves, your majesty. Nothing good ever comes from dwarves. Connell's smile vanished, and his hand shot out, gripping the man by the throat and effortlessly lifting him off the ground, much to the stunned shock of the other city representatives. You don't like dwarves? The feeling is mutual. They don't like idiots. Still holding the man aloft, he glared at the rest of them while the man's face turned redder. Effective immediately, dwarves are to be given privileged status. If I hear of anyone disrespecting or mistreating any dwarf in my kingdom, there will be hell to pay. Understand? Everyone quickly nodded. Connell felt a gentle hand on his arm. You may want to let him go, dearie. Don't want to scare the neighbors. Smiling despite himself, he lowered the man to the ground. As the man gasped for air, Connell addressed the group. This is Madeline. She is the kingdom's mage. You will obey her just as you would me. To my left is Lorcan, now General Lorcan, the commander of my army. The other fine individual is General Story, my friend and brother. Any questions? When none came, he curtly nodded, then addressed Brody. You may escort me to my residence. And while you're doing that, I want every one of Torian's followers rounded up. I'll deal with them on a case-by-case -case basis. Yes, your majesty. He motioned for Connell to follow. Come on, you three. Let's see how the other half lives. Connell settled on the throne and wondered if he was going to like being a king, or was it going to be all headache? People were going to go out of their way to please him their fawning motivation being something in return. He would have to tread carefully, no changes in the beginning until he understood what was going on and how things worked. Gazing around the throne room, he smiled at Story and Lorcan chatting away like close friends do. Madeline had disappeared to inspect her new home, as well as call a council of mages to purge them of any residual Torian allies. The rest of the room was filled with the city's leadership, chatting amiably, all the while casting not-so-surreptitious glances at Connell. Peering over the crowd, he recognized two men who stood off to the side. With a grin, he motioned them to come. 
Gon and Ellis weaved their way through the crowd and stopped at the bottom step. Connell stood and raised his hands, immediately silencing the crowd. You all know that the myth that dragons do not exist is not true. You have seen that for yourselves. Henceforth, anyone harming or seeking to harm a dragon will be punished by death. The crowd audibly sucked in a breath. Make no mistake, dragon hunters are hereby banished from this kingdom upon pain of death. Any dragon hunter found within the borders of this kingdom by the time the morrow's sun sets has forfeited his or her life. No exceptions. He sat back down and the thick silence gave way to quiet chatter which grew as the people relaxed. Tell Dareth this is a start. And thank her for letting you two help. You know you always have a place here. Thank you, my lord. Gan said and bowed. Blessings on this kingdom, and may all your rulings be equally as wise. With another bow, the two excused themselves to find a spot to shape change and head home to Havenguard. Brody approached and said, Calder's confidants are in the jail. Do you wish to question them now or at another time? Now sounds good. Brody led the way through the crowd down hallways and stairways, Beto by Connell's side. I was wondering where you were. I am sorry my lord. They wouldn't let me through. Said you already had servants. Thank the gods General Locan saw me. I do already have servants, which is why I need you here. You are now in charge of them all. Beto stumbled a step. My lord. You are in charge of my servants. Do you not want the job? Of course I do. His eyes brimming with a mixture of excitement and thanks. Good. We'll get things settled once I finish here. Yes, my lord. Brody stopped at the jailer's door and knocked. A burly bald-headed man opened it. His Majesty wishes to assign the prisoners. Yes, your Majesty. The man lowered into a reverent bow. Are we still branding people these days? Yes, your Majesty. Connell slowly nodded, hating the arbitrary exile of people to a life they did not choose nor want, yet balancing that the fact that some people needed such punishment. Hoping to find some who were repentant, he said, Fine. As we proceed, I will tell you what brand to use or if they are to be set free. Can you write? The jailer hung his head and mumbled, No, my lord. That's fine. Lord Brody will assist us, but I bet you've a good memory. The man brightened. The best, your majesty. Good. Let's get started. Connell followed the jailer down the stone corridor, to the main containment cell, where more than twenty of Calder's loyal followers were chained to the walls. Connell paused to gaze in through the peephole. Who's in here? Calder's Chamberlain, the army commander. I met him already. Connell smiled. What's your recommendation? Are there any in here who you would consider trustworthy? Brody thought a moment. Honestly, your majesty, no. Good enough for me. Let's get started. Oh, by the way, we have a new category of brand. Your Majesty? My guess is that there are few here who are worthy of the normal brands like Vipers or a Rose. Brody snorted a laugh. Hardly, Your Majesty. From now on, we will now have a worker brand, a mark in the shape of a sheaf of wheat. As you wish, Your Majesty. Connell was about to tell Brody to ease up on the Your Majesty crap but decided to wait until he could learn more about the man. The jailer opened the door and commanded, Listen up. His Majesty is entering. Connell entered and the first man he encountered was the Chamberlain, a pudgy toad of a man who bounced up. You Majesty. He fawned with a bow before receiving a cuff on the head from the jailer. Shut your yap. If His Majesty wants you to speak, he'll ask for it. Connell briefly studied the man before saying, Wait. The Chamberlain frowned, puzzled. Sit down. Connell continued down the line, announcing Wheat with each individual, until he came to a well-dressed middle-aged man who stared back up at him with the eyes of recognition and hope. You. Connell pointed. What's your name? The man sputtered in anger. What? You know my name, damn you. Whereupon the jailer landed a heavy kick to the man's ribs. That's the king you're talking to. 
He's not more a king than I am. The man sneered, clutching his side. I should know. Then you should know to respect your betters. What is your wish, your majesty? Connell folded his arms, pretending to study the man. Rose. Then immediately sell him to the farmers to work the fields and tend the cows and goats. Spinning around, Connell headed to the door, the jailer and Brody in step. What was his name? Connell looked at the jailer. That one calls himself Lord Parrell, Your Majesty. Connell smirked and nodded. Being a king did have its benefits. This has been Empire of Serpents, Dragons of Isenthal, Book 3. Written by Richard Fierce and P.D. Mack.